Okay, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, my name is Theodore Sparopoulos. I direct the DRL with a lot of uh, hardworking colleagues and students. And uh, what uh, we're going to be seeing over the next two days is basically uh, research that's taken form over the last 16 months of students working in self-organized teams, researching advanced kind of forms of fabrication, robotics, challenging kind of new sort of strategies of what architecture could be, and sort of problematizing, I think, a role of how architecture can engage new technologies in particular, and how that sort of opens a kind of deeper understanding of our contemporary condition. To do that, we organize the studio in four parallel strands. Uh, we've been looking at the subject matter that we've titled Behavioral Complexity, which is really looking at scenario-based design. Things that are beyond form, are exploring formation, time-based ideas, simulation, active forms of real-time kind of response and design. We've been exploring kind of attitudes and approaches of robotics and kind of problematizing how we can explore that in a much more open and expanded field. And as part of, I think, the ethos of the DRL, which will be celebrating its 20th anniversary this coming year, uh, it's about a kind of unapologetic approach towards experimentation and innovation and really trying to understand what architecture can actually facilitate and participate in I think a much larger and expanded kind of field of design, discourse, cultural kind of institutional kind of explorations and challenges. The four studios that you'll be seeing are basically working on this problem of behavioral complexity. Uh, you will have from Sajay Studio, uh, who's working with Alicia, challenges in terms of looking at industrial robotics and how that can actually challenge a way of thinking about prefabrication and housing and try to explore kind of new innovative solutions of using and designing custom tools to basically explore kind of advanced ways of fabricating. Uh, you have Rob Stewart-Smith who's working with Tyson, exploring ideas of swarm printing, looking at how deployable systems and generative methodologies can be deployed in things that are on-site and specific that are using kind of multi-agent systems that could be explored in a way that could kind of collaboratively build structures for us. Uh, we have Patrick Schumacher working with Pierre Andrea, uh, exploring multi-authorship in terms of design of high-density urbanism. They're working in London on a series of tower projects, looking at kind of genetic variations of towers, and they're going to be exploring that at a multitude of different scales and explore the kind of correlations of all of these subsystems. And uh, myself, Theodore Sparopoulos, with Mustafa, uh, who have been exploring ideas of self-awareness and self-structuring, uh, looking at high population robotics, no blueprints, no master plans, continuously evolving, kind of self-forming human machine ecologies. We are uh, very fortunate that we're going to have a very distinguished group of critics that are going to be coming in and out over the next two days. And uh, this event, honestly, is really a conversational event, which is really about discussing, problematizing, and opening up, I think, a whole host of different issues that some of the work is actually putting on the table and helps us, I think, very much in forming the next generation of research that we're going to be putting forward. Um, I'm going to name the critics that are here and the other ones that are not here. We're live streaming this stuff to our community that uh, sometimes is not able to be here. Um, and at the same time, we have critics that are going to be coming in all throughout the day. So for lack of formality on my side, but with the accountability of actually trying to express exactly what all of these distinguished people are doing, you're going to allow me, hopefully, uh, entertain me to just read off a little bit of their bios, uh, especially for the people that are not here. Um, just for the people that are here and for the people that are coming in, we've put together this pamphlet, which is basically a program for the full two days. It basically has our agenda. It basically speculates what our three years research project has been about. It gives you briefs of each of the four studios and each kind of abstract or statement of purpose of each of the projects. So the schedule for today is that we're going to see three teams in the morning, we're going to break for an hour lunch, and then we're going to see three teams afterwards. 
and then we'll have a keynote of our very own Rob Stewart-Smith. So, back to the critics. Uh, we are joined by Marcus Cruz, who's right in front of me, who is an architect and a professor of innovative environments at the Bartlett School of Architecture. He's director of BioA Lab, Biota Lab, and co-founder of Sin de Bio. Lots of bios in this. And uh, Marcus is a very dear friend and obviously a very important uh, character in the London scene. Uh, has also a practice with Marcus and Marian and uh, is working a lot in biotech. So we're very pleased to have him here. We have Ciro, who's joining us from Buenos Aires, who's an architect, a researcher, and an educator. He's dean of the School of Architecture and Urban Studies in the Universitat Torquato de Tela. He's also a visiting professor at Harvard's uh, Graduate School of Design and co-founder and the former director of the Landscape Urbanism course here at DAA. So we're very happy to have Ciro back in this building. We have Monia Demarche, who uh, is head of our first year at the Architectural Association. She's part of uh, a lot of aspects in the school, longtime colleagues together, and actually a former DRL student at one point in time, if I can sort of put that out there. Which we're very happy that Monia is joining us, uh, a very important member of our AA community. We're going to be joined. Uh, Tom Wiscombe is on his way from the airport at the moment, so he should be here in the next like 20, 30 minutes. He's founder and principal of Tom Wiscombe Architecture. He's a longtime uh, professor at Syarc University and a distinguished designer in his own right. We're going to have Luciana Parisi, who's joining us from Goldsmiths. Uh, she's chair of the PhD program at Goldsmiths at the Center for Cultural Studies and co-director of digital culture at the university there. We're also being joined by Philippe Morel, who's also on his way from Paris, who uh, is an architect, he's an educator, and he's also a founder of a 3D printing company uh, that's printing uh, fiber-based concrete uh, deposition. Outside of that, we're going to have Brett Steele, who's our director of the AA, and Mark Cousins, and we'll be joined by other characters as it is, and I'll try to name them as those sort of things happen. Uh, with that, I'm not going to keep any more time for this uh, introduction. Uh, we're going to start with our students. Generally speaking, we're going to do 20 minutes presentation of the students. It gives us about 20, 25 minutes conversation. And then we're going to switch over. And so I'm going to ask that the aisles here are kind of free because all of this material needs to go out and we're going to set up with the next project after that. So we're going to need a little bit of assistance as the room kind of fills in today. Okay. So with that, thank you everybody for joining us, and uh, we look forward to a very active and uh, positive two days of conversation. Thanks. Hello everyone, uh, we're from Sajay Studio, and we are Shimu, Atri, and Frank. Uh, so our project is about rethinking of a Mason Domino on the current stage. Uh, we're proposing a, a co-living lifestyle in the high density uh, cities, uh, and uh, using a, a method of robotic fabrication and construction. So, uh, now, uh, what we can see in the all cities, uh, in big cities, the population is very high, and followed by this, a lot of problems occurred. So, and I will show you some maps here. The first map is the population in London, the distribution of it, and the next is see, uh, as shown here, as a uh, basic service provided by the government. 
So this, this map can show us what the government are focused on and where people might will go to. And this one is the workplace population density in London. Uh, this map shows people where the jobs are and uh, where they need to move every day. So I believe no people want to live very far uh, from the workplace because this uh, will lead a lot of wasted time on the road. But the re reality is the house price. This map shows we cannot live where, wherever we want. So people might to move out from the city, but in our view, we're, dis uh, we're discovering if we can uh, find a way to make people live more closer to the city center rather than just move out and uh, get uh, far away from all the facilities provided by uh, main business and government. So as you can see here, this diagram shows you uh, average requirements for apartment for maybe one or two people to live in. And in this one, the, the biggest proportion of, of this apartment is the uh, less private, pro private places. As what we want to say is if we can take this less private space out and make this into bedrooms, we can create actually a lot of uh, place for people to live in. Imagine if we can put this kind of Kolimi style in the city center, then people can save a lot of money that they can live there uh, for those people who think uh, to live in a, a Kolimi space is not a problem. Like something, some people like a, a young profession and students. So uh, while we are proposing a co-living uh, housing design, we want to revisit the Mason Domino diagram and the uh, reinforced concrete and prefabrication method uh, allows uh, Mason Domino to uh, propose an open plan diagram. And this is uh, quite an innovation at that time and uh, still people are benefited from that. Uh, but uh, facing the new technology in the current stage, uh, we want to, um, as a researcher, we want to question that if that diagram is still fit for the current stage. So uh, critiques are presented in two aspects. The first one is the uh, relative rigid uh, frame of Mason Domino, block the vertical uh, space arrangement, which means in some spaces, different spaces, people require different heights of the ceiling and floor height. So uh, in Mason Domino, we cannot change this. Uh, so this is one of our critiques. Then uh, what we can see here is the run plan from Adolf Luz. And this project actually tells us how we can achieve that by differentiate the floor, uh, the height of the floor. Uh, actually, this kind of residential uh, architecture has been used in current projects, at, like more, more current projects as well. This one, as you can see, is in India, uh, done by Charles Carrier. And the other building I'm going to show is the Tokyo apartment by uh, So Fujimoto. All this uh, buildings just tell us us spells need to be where it needs. This is a, one of our attempts to, to try uh, if we can uh, manage to do this to reduce the uh, redundant, redundant spaces. Then the second critique is uh, the box space for us is not that humor friendly. So we want to uh, increase the relation between the structure and the people. So we, we try to uh, use a surface method to uh, uh, design our uh, structure. This is one of our references, the project ideal house from Zaha Hadid. 
uh, in this project, it actually present uh, 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 the, pre uh, the relation between the user and the, the structure and how light coming through and the, the partition of the, of the structure itself. So uh, following by this, we want to achieve this kind of uh, aesthetically right and uh, structurally performance uh, well. So as a starting point, uh, we obsess by this kind of minimal surface. Then we generate a bunch of them, then try to model them uh, into low poly so we can uh, later utilize them. Uh, in this one, when we model and try to combine them, we want to evaluate the spaces which are um, maybe suit for for uh, for the functions, and later we try to put the functions into it. But this way is kind of intuitive, and we find it's very hard to put the functions in. So later we revise the process. Uh, we start from the functions to the surface. So at the beginning we just define how many uh, users we need, like the occupation or something like this. Then. We try to arrange them into a good way, then see if we can mod them into a, a, a continuous surface. In this way, we can get more control of the structure itself. So we took this method as later use. And when we come to the shell construction, we see a lot of uh, amazing uh, shell, uh, concrete shell in the history. And but it reminds us it's very complex to build because of the ma massive formwork. So we go back to look at the brick construction. This actually gives a lot of flexibility of the, uh, of the structure construction, but the limitation is very obvious of this brick construction. This video shows you how uh, like people can build with bricks very fast. This, it. <laughs> okay, the next video I will show is compare the brick concrete. Uh, the brick is very weak because of the structure is uh, discontinuous. And the weak point in this structure is the mo mostly the cement. So what if we can combine these two features together? Uh, namely the flexibility of the brick, cons brick construction and the strength of the uh, concrete. So by looking at some reference from natural uh, hi history, we can see a lot of like intelligence from this, how to build by unit, un united elements, then the structure will perform as a, a continuous entity. So keep this in mind. We discovered the material system for us. Uh, here, we try to combine two different melting point material together. Uh, while the uh, lower melting point material melt, it will perform as the adhesive. And the uh, higher melting point, uh, it's not melt, so it can provide stiffness. So when we make these two together, uh, the structure can stand by its own. So the problem is uh, only the ratio, how we mix them. So later, uh, we, we develop this into a, a new method. We uh, use the higher melting point material as the core, then the lower melting point material as the coat. So when we uh, just hit the, hit the, uh, yeah, hit the, 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 the unit, uh, to the low melting point, so we can stick these materials together, rather uh, uh, damage the, the, sh the shape of the core. So later we uh, were able to reduce the weight of, of this material uh, by putting some uh, EPS inside, and we did test some, uh, get some uh, data from it, and, and also in the structure, uh, if the uh, where it requires more loads, so it, it has low modes, 
more loads, we can use uh, lower, uh, lower uh, proportion of the EPS, where it's uh, structurally very stable, then we can use a lot of EPS to reduce the weight of the structure. So uh, while we reduce the weight, we use our method to hit to the low melting point, then combine them together, and we test the structure is very stable. And in this one, we can see our material can uh, both take can take both tension and uh, compression, uh, not like the masonry before. And the, in our project, we want to use light, utilize a more smart brick rather than the uh, traditional brick. This brick can give us a lot, much more free degrees of freedom uh, to uh, build in uh, uh, much more directions. So in the robotic fabrication part, we have two methods. One is the pick and place, and the other one is the truncation method. So back to the uh, our co-living design, we grab all the share space from the house from uh, and and then remain the bedroom necessary bedroom. But uh, based on the uh, when, when we study on the bedroom space, we find that there there's a big hollow space on the top of the bedroom and. This place we can remove it, and in this way we can press two uh, bedroom together. And in limited space, we can put more bedrooms. Uh, so when we uh, thinking about arrange the uh, spaces in the house, we put the uh, pressed bedroom space on the up floor and put the uh, share space uh, like bathroom. Uh, which has uh, which doesn't need too height in uh, in the inner space in the middle floor and then put the noisy uh, share space like living room and dining room and kitchen in the ground floor and then we uh, lead to this house. Uh, from this, uh, from the vertical wall house, we uh, remove some of the roof and wall and, and re remain some of them, then uh, connect th them together. And in this way, we create a continuous shell structure uh, to uh, create our uh, space. And we also do some uh, other uh, scenarios. In this, in uh, and sorry, uh, in this way, uh, in this project, we put uh, both single, uh, per, uh, single bedroom and also double bedroom uh, to provide uh, provide different space for a different type of person living in this house. And also, this is the process uh, how we. Uh, create the surface and our house. Uh, this one is the result after we, uh, we connect the walls and roof. And we also do another for, uh, for a plan to, uh, to make it look good. And we also put our furniture in person. And as you can see, uh, in the vertical uh, wall system, uh, everything's uh, really crowded. But uh, when we put them into the uh, surface system, uh, we can use the surface. We can reduce some unnecessary, non necessary space. So the, uh, these are the result, and uh, finally, uh, b because uh, we find during our uh, in our study, we find that uh, for young people, uh, both for a single person and couple, 
uh, not all of them has the chance to be a, uh, to continue to be a student to live in a student dormitory uh, where uh, apply the space for co-living co so we uh, design a, a design a house to uh, apply uh, the co-living uh, co-living environment for single person and also couples For finding how to build a structure, we tried two methods at the beginning. The first one uh, is from one point. We, we give a lot of points to fill up uh, uh, bubbles to fill up the space. And the second one is we try to uh, uh, give a lot, uh, a lot of particles, then uh, give attraction to the surface, then make them evenly distributed on the surface. Then in this way, because uh, we are only dealing with uh, spheres, and actually uh, what our unit at the beginning is cubes, so there will be a lot of overlap, so we use this method to push them out. As you can see, the, uh, the cube as a, as a unit uh, does not give us desirable results because of, uh, it is not completely face-to-face -face connections. So this led us to a, to a more uh, process of tessellation process. Uh, uh, traditionally, the traditional, traditionally, the tessellation process is that you, you take a bounding box and then take the intersection of the surface in the bounding box. But what we have tried to optimize it uh, by using a uh, dividing the boxes into smaller ones, and then only tessellating the, the boxes which intersect with the surface. And then we uh, investigate the different polyhedrons that can be used for giving us more degrees of freedom. Uh, through this, we, we discover that uh, the best way to fill spaces are just, just a certain amount of, certain amount of uh, polyhedrons, uh, which can actually fill the space completely. Uh, then we tessellate the, sp uh, tessellate the space and the surface uh, to understand which uh, tessellation process would be more uh, advantageous to building a surface like this. We realize that multiple units will not be advantageous to us, uh, wh by while VLAN and uh, the truncated octahedron are advantageous, but uh, we go ahead with truncated octahedron because it gives us a much more smoother and uh, uh, f complete face-to-face -face connections. So the uh, truncated octahedron is basically a four, I mean, fourteen-sided figure, with, which is, can be um, derived from a cube with uh, a, a single uh, quadra um, hexagonal uh, truncation. Uh, this gives us high degrees of freedom with fourteen faces. This can also be uh, very advantageous for our material system, where we believe in the face-to-face uh, -face connections. So we have multiple face connections, and that helps us in the faster construction. So we take the tessellation process and uh, to our designed surfaces and apply those, uh, the tessellation process through the six steps uh, to achieve the, the tessellated surface. Then we apply this to the other uh, options uh, to achieve the same results. Uh, coming to the prototype, uh, so taking the materiality and uh, our uh, truncated octahedron as the advantages. Uh, we design a, a shell uh, which starts off with a wall, which slowly transforms into a shell, and then becomes uh, a slab at the end. Uh, as you can see, the the results are uh, the resolution of the results are extremely high, and uh, this is our uh, model, which is there on the right corner, uh, which is made up of 776 units, and it's. Uh, completely built with the mimicking the robot of a pick and a pick, pick and a place. Uh, but with this, uh, we know that uh, we, can only, we can only do the mass structural construction, and our aim is to build a fully functional house. So uh, to go ahead with this, we, uh, we start study the edge conditions of each of the unit, and uh, through the next fabrication process, that is the, the truncation, uh, we derive the primary, two primary units, that further, tr through further truncation, uh, give us the other secondary uh, special units. So th these special units uh, define the edge conditions and therefore have a specific utility to each. Uh, this is the other special unit with the filler. 
Uh, this uh, unit um, has a half truncated octahedron. The speciality of this is that all our uh, special units are derived from one single truncated octahedron. So we are not using any other uh, geometrical principle other than the, the truncated octahedron. So uh, coming into the specificity of a, of a house, uh, we use these special units and the understanding of the edge conditions to uh, construct uh, the first one we go with the, the, the slab and then we go with the, the ceiling. Uh, so, yeah, this is the same filler unit can be used in different ways. Uh, then we study the edge conditions and uh, openings uh, to understand if we can modify uh, or cap these edge conditions for, um, yeah. And in, uh, in case of the openings, if it's a wider opening with a combination of uh, a single and a crown kind of, uh, unit, uh, we can actually modify the whole um, opening size. Then the most important part of our design is the vertical transportation. So therefore, our uh, scale of one unit is based on the, on the, on the size of a riser of a stair. So we build uh, one kind of uh, traditional steps, but also we can build with the corner of the unit. Uh, something like a spiral staircase is also can be built with another, tradition, another special unit. Uh, we, can, uh, we also study the edge conditions of the walls. Um, so that there are spaces where we require it to be smooth, and uh, this can be achieved with uh, the special unit one and special unit two in two different exterior and interior conditions. Uh, also, uh, one important thing about us is that it's uh, all the units are closely packed and uh, light and ventilation is, plays an important factor. So what we, uh, we thought that we have light wells and through that if we can uh, vary the, trans uh, the transparency of each of the unit, we can the light conditions can be varied accordingly. Also, these units can be used as connection points between massive uh, openings to create structural support. Uh, this is our, uh, based on the understanding of the units, we built the, uh, a 550 unit uh, model completely based on paper. Um, uh, we applied all the special units on this to understand the whole system. So we take these special units and then we apply it to our house. And uh, as you can see, this is based on the density of the units that we use. Uh, we get varied results of the unit. So there are two levels of design. One is the, the tessellation and the other one is the, the truncated, I mean the special units. This is the result of, a, of the house. Okay, when it comes to robotic parts, we did uh, three kinds of uh, end effector through the time. The first one uh, it's a heat, a heating a metal with the heat gun aside it. So according to the reachability of our robots, we divide the structure into parts, then uh, prefabricate each part for later assembly. This video shows you uh, how we did with the first end effector and the build uh, six units. As we see in the video, the units cannot stand very well. It was sliding and rotating. So in the next uh, end effector, we increased the uh, metal piece into three. And we tried this as well, but it's very hard to control the, uh, the, the heating. So we turned to an easier one, which is the gripper. And then we use this gripper to pick place for some units. Then this is our prototype of that. And this is the house we designed with all the techniques we used. Thank you.
explaining the models. Uh, initially, we started off with uh, mathematical surfaces, and then we tried to um, unitize them. And as our first approach was a cube, uh, we started off with that, and then uh, we slowly switched from uh, from the mathematical surfaces to a more uh, controlled uh, surfaces, and then tested them and try that. And still, we had the problem of the control on the units. Uh, this is the uh, our material, material properties. So this shows the uh, this yeah, this shows the. Uh, it shows the strength of both compression and tension. That's one, that was the one discovery we made, that we can actually have both tension and compression with, with unitized structure. And once we, we, we had that as an advantage, we moved on to uh, how to um, enhance this. So because we started off with a heavy unit, and then we could actually make it much lighter using the proportion. And when you actually feel it, you realize that it's, it's a considerable amount of uh, difference that we could achieve. Uh, then we we had the tests with the with the truncated octahedron. So the truncated octahedron gives us the freedom to actually build a surface uh, continuously, uh, unlike the cube or any other unit. Uh, this is our prototype. As I said, 550 units, and it's extremely strong, only made of paper. And uh, we tried the special units on them to see if yeah if it can work. And these are our eight special units, uh, color coded for uh, each of them. Um, these are our two uh, end factors. Uh, one is the pick and place with the heating inside. And uh, this is our, uh, our final model. Uh, it's made of 776 units and built by one person with just pick and place. And we actually, actually mimic, mimic, mimic the robot of doing the same. So we had a heat source, pick the, pick the unit, heat, place. That's it. We did not do anything other than that. And we just follow the simple rule to build this. Thank you. I mean, it's, um, it's, a, it's a presentation. It's a very broad research, which I think um, is a, is a broad research, which is really interesting. There are many, many layers to this, to this project. Uh, I mean, from the material to the fabrication, to the geometric, uh, the functional, the aesthetic. I think there, I mean, there's really a lot going on here, which is, which is fascinating. And at the beginning, I, I, I sort of had a few thoughts about issues of flexibility, densification in cities, um, really the comparison of how much in a volume you can pack in terms of people and possible multifunctional aspects. But then I thought while you were progressing, well, this is actually about other things as well. This is about you know, the fabrication process, um, the materiality. But I, nonetheless, when I look back, I think there is something about the multi-scale condition of how your building blocks create possibly um, a resolution of space that is different from what we are used to. And that means that there is both a construction aspect, but also there's a perspectival one. Um, but there's also an odd one, which is when you look at some of your images and you look at the sofas and the furniture and you look at the components and you think, gosh, they seem to be really out of different times and different resolutions. Um, but it, 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 it's fascinating to think that maybe more density of activity can be related to a higher density, but also more flexible system of construction to some extent. And they, they might coexist rather than the domino one, which is a construction system that could be applied to anything. I, I, I like to think that this construction system really is for high dense environments. Therefore, the, one of the parts that I like most actually is, these, is this refinement of the edge condition. This means that you don't need a finishing. It seems that there's, a, there's an intelligence to the geometry that if you, if you fabricate it well, you can create an, a very, very multifunctional, multiprogrammatic, diverse environment. And I think that's, that's very fascinating. There's a real amazing starting point for something that could be applied. 
um, which changes the finishing of, of the architecture massively. So, I, I don't know, I, I think, the, the, I, maybe I'll just go back to a last comment, which is the question about flexibility of the space. And it's funny that you, you, you end up with something that has a level of rigidity, um, but then on a material level, you have a possible flexibility. And I wonder whether there are aspects here that in the, in the future development of these ideas could be explored further. Um, that there is more flexibility to the geometries that you can, or the spaces that you can achieve with this. Um, but, I mean, really interesting, uh, multi-layered, I mean, f fascinating. Uh, yeah, I would echo that. It's a very uh, complete piece of work in what, in what it's uh, achieved. Uh, very good. But uh, it always opens up the uh, idea of bigger questions and the application, whether it could be taken beyond just the home and whether it could be taken to civic functions and larger spaces and how it could respond to specific environments. It's uh, a piece of work which really um, <coughs> ignites ideas and, uh, when, you, when you look at it. The resolution within itself is, is very complete. As you say, you've studied basically all the aspects from construction right I was wondering uh, what's the, what defines the scale, the size of the block, uh, because to me the, the, what is, uh, what could be the size of the project is that it doesn't exploit uh, roughness, it rather assumes that the paradigm of smoothness is there to remain and to be reconstructed. Somehow the project assumes that the paradigm of smoothness is the one to, to, be, uh, to be taken for granted and, and um, reconstructed after the process of uh, roughening the, the surface. Uh, so instead... as having potentials of uh, how to think of programming the surfaces or or thinking of about about uh, i don't know transparency in the surface or uh, the question of cornering or the question of uh, angles uh, and how that in a way can be used for the purpose of for example furnishing the space um, so in that sense i think that the project is kind of takes a cert, sort of streamline of um, solving problems rather than exploiting properties, formal properties. Actually, for the size of the unit, we did think about it. And uh, the size you see here is uh, what we're thinking, maybe two layers for one staircase, for one step of the stair. And this size is also suit for, for our little notchy there. So, yeah. These two things are just we think about for, for now. And also we thought about this uh, unit size. If it's larger, then it won't be smooth, but maybe it can create some useful space for the storage, something like this. And uh, the, the factor of smoothness being exploited, uh, as you can see in our houses, we've used the smoothness only for function. So we we just put, put it across that it can be smooth, smooth but we want to exploit the, uh, the roughness and the edge conditions wherever possible. Thank you.
just want to congratulate you. Very impressive. I think it's a very smart, mature project. Very down to earth while being innovative. I think it becomes very tangible very quickly. I think the way you picked uh, the problematic, very topical, it's great. And I think the, the technology seems to me, is for me very compelling and convincing because this is um, cell, it's an insulated, rigid material, so it's also waterproofed potentially. So yeah, it's really one of those uh, new technologies where we could maybe avoid uh, uh, multiple layers and so on. I think it also lends itself to pre-construction pre off-site and coming in segments. Uh, that 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 heating up that very very clever uh, two kind of temperatures by which these things respond to is very very smart I think so on that level I like it I also find it uh, I'm happy that you we picked up on an ideal house condition and let's say the attempt to apply the a priori let's say of shell and curvilinear formations in the very very compact. Uh, domestic realm is challenging and of course uh, uh, that's where you would, would tend to move towards the cubing and the minimalist but I think you showed some nice moments uh, particularly when when we're really packing it in and and we're getting close the body and furniture and, and wall surfaces when you have that lying person and you show the L shape and then you smooth it out and also a little table. And then you realize when you really get compact uh, that, that at least the filleting and softening and of the surface makes sense. And we've tried it with, uh, with some hotel rooms we've done. And, and it is very comforting and, and, and nice. And you feel more easy and intuitive moving. And the other thing one could do with the curvature is in a complex nestling, nestling of multiple units to track unity through convexity and, and, and let's say smooth continuation to, to see where things belong together. And I just looked at uh, recently the MoMA show from, the, from 1972, uh, Italy, New Domestic Landscape, where you have a lot of these compact, flexible units, and they work a lot with curvature. I mean, they work with cubic, but they're, they're filleting everything and softening, smoothing everything, which is an interesting, although it's not as... As, as rich in terms of curvature. So I, thought, I think that is an interesting uh, reflection and challenge. And I think you, you meet that challenge. And I think there's a lot of cleverness, as was discussed, with, with, with completing the, the project and product. Um, and I think the furniture at the moment is a little bit underdeveloped. You, you, um, um, you, and, but I think it's also useful to show that this isn't uh, necessarily a total gesamtkunstwerk. This, this architecture can tolerate that, that other stuff is thrown into it. Uh, but I think there's also potential for, for developing, not using the same unit. I think we should be multi-system. But uh, what would be... Case plugs onto the surface, maybe other elements and furnishings plugging on, and and you talked about storage units and so on. So I think there's a lot of potential, but uh, I really want, think it's very very compelling. Uh, I need to congratulate with the work. I think it's amazing for the complexity as well of things you're putting forward and you're managing to combine them together in design proposal. For me, the kind of challenge that I think is still open for you to address is the of questioning much more what is the surface. Because in a way, if we look at the Maison Domino, it's the idea as well of the removal of the wall. Now, so we, so we don't have uh, the vertical wall. What I like about your surface is that you're using the surface not to, not to create wall, but to much more to create programmatic complexity and different type of hierarchy. So I think what is still open is the, the black bit. You know, like basically, like when you feel you need enclosure, now you're just putting glass. And I think the questioning of what is actually the glass, what is actually the boundary or the vertical element, I think is still open. Um, I think the work is great. And the, the only thing that I'm missing is, and I guess that's a step further, is how these units combine, actually. Because I, I see a great potential for these to be one unit, and then you come and build another one on top. So how do they combine in the same way that you're combining uh, building blocks? How do they combine into multi-house buildings? Horizontally, vertical, uh, how that's going to affect the structure? Because once you put uh, 10 of these on top of each other, then the blocks are going to be different. So that's, I guess that you can do that in a further step. 
the uh, the advantage of using this unit itself was because uh, it completely fills a space. So completely. So what we thought is that wherever there's a connection, they can be potential for another connection to happen at that space. So between two points, this unit can cover completely. So yeah. yeah just um, I mean I think I share I think a lot of the excitement about the project because I think your three-dimensional tiling is an interesting one to sort of address that because it has a kind of space packing logic you can sort of adjust and sort of work on that as as you need for sort of structuring and all of these things I think the part just picking up on Monia's point about enclosure in some way transparency translucency you you actually do have almost like this stone setting kind of logic with your tiling strategies that you do these kind of truncated insets. And I feel like maybe where I feel you've been a bit conservative is in your kind of approach of just taking things that appear to be kind of quite standard, sheet glass and so forth, but the truth is every boundary condition would be so difficult to kind of negotiate and so custom but I think at some moment, I, I don't feel that its kind of authenticity is as authentic as possible. I would go into using these kind of crystalline strategies as, you know, transparent and translucent aggregates. And then you just open up a completely different world about actually what is a window, what is a threshold, the depth of these things and the actual experiential aspects of what it is to mean to be in something like this. I, I think those aspects of the project are very understated. But I actually feel like that's where the radicality is. I mean, you've designed a new brick. It has all the problems of masonry, but it has a capacity to fuse together to become something else. So that I think you should be highly commended on. But I think where the project actually opens up a very, very interesting new territory is what we actually see as systems of windows and doors and what a door handle is or any of those kind of details are problematized in this. And I think it's in that problematic problematizing, I think that just opens up a really interesting territory. And, and I think it's not here at the moment, but it's, it doesn't take a leap of faith to actually do that. Cast a couple of, of these components in resin and see how that effect actually works. And, and I think it is like a piece of jewelry in that sense. And I think you, you, you should explore that. I, I don't think the project finishes in some sense in a presentation, but the document that you're going to put together for the next two weeks I think should really start to open up and speculate a lot more. You versioned one house, which is a compact state, and I think you could version hundreds of them. The genetic logic of that, I think, has to be kind of also stated much more articulately. So there's a lot of things, I think, and there's a richness to it. So congratulations for that. Thank you. I share a lot of the... Uh, applause for the project at various levels. Like, there's a lot of number of layers to the project, as Marcus said before. Um, one thing I kind of perceive the project as always is, in some sense, as an abstract 3D printing project. And uh, of course, you have a, a block, and one could consider it an assembly. it's fabricated on site or off site, whether it's prefabricated in parts, uh, it's essentially a, a, a 3D printing project in my mind um, that operates at quite a, a low resolution, but then it has all these in, interesting other layers like the addition of these kind of sliced cells and things. Um, but seeing it as a 3D printing project, uh, you can see that uh, the design is conceived of as a 3D model that is then voxelized uh, into a uh, uh, quite a polyhedra, like I can't remember which one it is, but it's a polyhedra voxel. Uh, and, then, and then that's where you get uh, kind of the, the abstraction into the low resolution model. And so if you see it this way, I would say the two things are, um, I would be very interested to see, you know, like how you could progress that further would be one is can the conception of the design itself somehow be strategized at the moment, your, your kind of technical development allow you to design anything you like. I, I mean, you've done some really interesting things like fusing stairs with vertical structure that are quite successful. 
and show a kind of nuance of design there, like there's a lot of intrigue. But the question would be, when we get to these renders here, is there some other way to approach the design that maybe exploits the or embodies some of the principles within the construction system or the production logic that would be quite interesting? Uh, and then the other would be the, the furniture uh, that's been mentioned before. And the furniture, I think, would be an opportunity sometimes to stick rigidly to the cell and other times to completely break free from it. I mean, you know, you had people like Adolf Loos there, and uh, I was also thinking about, you know, uh, the relationship of architects to furniture. So you have, for instance, when you think of the Barcelona Pavilion, you always also think of the Barcelona chair in that space. You know, or if you think of Frank Lloyd Wright, something like the Roby House, there's always the kind of stained glass windows, uh, there's the furniture, Rene McIntosh, the same. There's all these kind of fine grain, almost architectural projects in the furniture. And in this case, I think um, the furniture could have broken the rule, like, but maybe sometimes had a polyhedra interface. So you could have designed the furniture to be something completely different, but it still plugs in and fuses. So something like a handrail uh, that you wouldn't want a polyhedra handrail unless it scaled down so the voxel was fractal. Um, but you could have any kind of bespoke handrail that then melted into the rest of the thing. So when, if you look at this stair image, you go from kind of uh, planar surface to a stepped one to different resolutions of articulation just because of the changes in the, the curvature. Um, but what would happen if you had introduced a handrail there or, or a lampshade or something? I think those things would be at another layer of intrigue and richness to the project. Could I add something to that? Um, I think the point made about uh, perfection to perfection, resolution, issues of roughness, and now this multi-layered material that is partly soft and in other parts hard, I think is actually the potential solution for this, which is that if the soft part is not only a glue, but the soft part is actually potentially becoming furniture, means it's hard enough to become something else, means that in certain areas you might have only the hard part on the, at the face, um, or on the face seen as, as what, what is the surface of the ceiling or the, the wall. In other areas, you might have parts of staircases where handrails or shelves happen, where the soft part itself becomes the surface and becomes so molded that it has other functional potentials. Means that, in other words, what you're looking at there is that model, the black one there or the last one, is just looking in a way at the principles of the hard part. But the soft one hasn't yet been explored, and that's extremely interesting. Yeah. Because when you say it's soft, well, it's soft for what? It's too soft maybe as a structural element, and it works well as a glue, but it's hard enough for many other things. And that, there is a relationship, and that could be a seriously interesting, have, in fact, quite new system um, that would actually challenge in a funny way you know, your proposal there, which is where this, these two layers on a smaller scale and a larger scale sometimes are independent, sometimes are working together. Really interesting. Oh, just one one thing about that. Uh, we've we've actually tried uh, with with a whole unit heating them, and actually it becomes a surface, a continuous surface when you actually heat the. So that's we've. We, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, just to pick up on the various things. Um, like firstly, like I think I should congratulate you for the first time in the 16 months. Uh, uh, you have really surprised uh, a lot of us, I think, like in how coherently you pulled all of it together as, as uh, over, the, over the years it, um, it has been only like segment, segmented, uh, like there are very, very many aspects and uh, on that, uh, the fact that you could like bring it all together like uh, deserves to be commended, I think. And a uh, few things that I would now think like especially to do on the book like for example how do you correlate uh, things that i hope you do more of is right now the activity and the surface um, is correlated like you're using curvature to your advantage uh, i would have hoped that like you also correlate like where you put these um, cut units and other things also with the activity so it becomes something that enables uh, navigation or it enables like 
additional purpose other than just filling up a hole or providing um, treads so that there is uh, how these special units are distributed like adds that uh, layer of articulation which I think like would uh, also um, refer to what Ciro was saying about like actually not problem solving but problematizing and using the properties uh, to to like you know detail like at various levels like and so but congratulations again Uh, we are team Aerial Symbiosis. We are in Robots Towards Mid Studio, assisted by Tyson Hosper and Mel Ham Sefer. And I'm Sujita. This is Zing Jing, Wing Xing, and Yuan. So uh, we explain uh, what a studio is doing. Like uh, our studio focuses on additive manufacturing with UAVs, 3D printing, uh, compressing design and construction into one single process. So uh, we have been participating in the uh, research can of SPARC, uh, which combines with the Imperial College London, UCL, the AA, and the Bath, which is like experimenting on the UAV's printing. One second, sorry. Yeah, so unmanned UAVs are available in wide range of sizes with various payloads, uh, which can be used in the construction scale activity. So uh, moving on from this, this is a time-lapse video of showing like the depletion of endangered species of various vegetations over time. And over 10 years, this has been approximately 80% of the vital species, which has been de depleted. So we have taken this as a problem to solve our distributed robotics research. So here we can see that the uh, vegetation is like shrinking, mainly in China. So uh, considering this, we have chosen a site in China where the rare species are like completely endangered. And uh, this is the view of the site showing constantly changing environment where people have been like conducting ongoing research on the site and they have been developing a method of preserving the species and keeping it accessible to the people. So uh, we see a great opportunity of like using these UAVs to survive the site because they are able to like scan in five axes of rotation and work together as a distributed swarm systems in the site. So uh, here we are concentrating more on the rare species which has been found in the size site, which can be uh, which can be bought by the UAVs. And also we use some of the computer vision techniques to make this happen of scanning the UAVs, preserving them, and also to research about them. So here are some of the uh, species that are really rarely found in this location. And we are thinking of how UAVs could help this. And these are some of the spaces that has been like we are looking on. The research space, research space the sample storage, and how the UAVs could help in this. And this is the UAVs spaces we are thinking about, like the solar recharging and uh, the shelter for the UAVs and also the uh, shelter for the human habitation where the humans would go there and conduct research. So the uh, fully open thing will be for the UAV space and for the semi-closed will be for the UAVs like to shelter in them in this particular location and the fully closed will be for the human habitat space which all collaborate and form a research unit. So next, we come to our thesis statement. So our uh, thesis focuses on tube-to-surface design strategies using the proxy material of polyurethane foam. The construction process involves site scanning, monitoring, as shown as before video, and environment as a derived from the previous slides. The design focuses on self-supporting structures which goes over time. So here is why we use tubes. We want to slightly touch the ground so that we don't like uh, deploy the species over there. So uh, we started our material research with a polyurethane foam. 
uh, which is printed layer by layer on a spray can. And uh, we use cooling spray to cool, put down the time of the drying of this polyurethane foam. So it's best suited for like layer by layer printing. And we started experimenting as, in the form of a tube. So here are some uh, previous uh, experiments on like how we go about with the tube cantilevering against the gravity. And also on the right side, we see, see the vertical tube deposition. Uh, for the agent uh, uh, circle behavior, we have the two types of agent. The red one is the get agent, and the white one is the print agent. So the printing agent can print the tube autonomously in relation to the get agent. Uh, no, we are using this circle behavior. And when the later agent move together, a separation will affect the shape of the printing agent. This will not let, let the printing agent just print circle, and the print agent will change. So the shape will also change. Uh, this is the beginning test of tube merge in the menu model. We have two tube merge together and multiple tube together. Uh, after that, we began test it with many machine. And and uh, in this test, we know the distance of offsetting each layer is very important. Usually, it will be up to the one second of the width of the bottom layer. This is our prototype you see in the last video. It's a big foam can. So it has three parts, components attaching to robotic arm, foam can, and, uh, and actuator, which continues extruding the foam. This is one of the successful tests with robotic arm. We get exact radius tube with our prototype, and the radius is around 15 centimeter. When it comes to the tube, tube bending strategy, we have two ideas. The first one is adding half layers in between. The second one is the hour changing speed. In this picture, we can see that when, when the machine has different speed, the width of print, uh, printed material is also different. So when drones flying with different speed, we can get the tube bending. Uh, in flying experiment, we use Vicon camera to create the environment that can recognize the position of the drone and use markers to make the drone visible on the Vicon camera so that we can give drone position in code and make it fly to fly to the right position. Uh, in the previous research, we gave simulation of tube merging, processing simulation, and the material test and test the algorithm code uh, behavior. Uh, we use Vicon system and create a flight to simulate the uh, basic geometry tube merge. Uh, the left one is the simulation one, and the middle one is the flying video. Uh, we control six crazy fly together to simulate the multiple agents behavior. Uh, here we simulate uh, the printing, print agent, and the center agent relationship. Uh, in the beginning, two crazy fly do two behavior. Uh, print agent rotates the center agent, then two, two tubes merge together. Here, the UAVs are deployed by the helicopter. The UAV charges from the helicopter and continues to scan. Uh, they are in 110 meters range and has a 16 minutes uh, flight time of Pelican, uh, from which it scans and comes to the site. UAV did scan behaviors and it will get the information of site and use leader to get 3D model of the site. So thereby we demonstrate the experiment on how UAVs could scan the site and get the model of the uh, terrain of the for few, uh, further analysis. This is the view of the UAV scanning from the herbs. Uh, the specific orientations of the UAV help it to scan the site, and the UAV will then to find the herb species. Uh, 
The thereby drones can identify the specific kind of the herb in the location. We demonstrate it <coughs> with the virus flight experiments. Here, we ask a UAV to learn the specific species, and then it will attract the same species uh, in the site. We use OpenTLD package to do this flying behavior, and we, do, we can see drone will fly to the species which we ask a drone to recognize. Uh, furthermore, we use art uh, artificial intelligence called TensorFlow to identify which space, uh, specific species it is. We can see that the drone grabs the picture of the herbs and then we can decide which kind of species we want to analyze. We use computer vision to simulate uh, some real conditions. First, the drone used the Bolton camera to detect the color and do the line behavior. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, this is, we use computer vision to simulate some real conditions. This is a use button camera. Do uh, line behavior. And this is because uh, there are grass on the ground uh, in the site, so we use bottom camera to avoid the green color to protect the environment when drone detect the green color. It will fly higher and avoid this color. Also, drone can use front camera to track the stuff which is in the front of the drone. Drone can detect which color we decide in Python code and drone will track the moving stuff. According to the basic geometry, we use Bolton camera to detect the color and do circle behavior. Drone will autonomously detect the color and track the loop. Drone can also use front camera to detect color and autonomously do circle behavior when it recognizes this color. Drone will change your and row to do circle behavior. Furthermore, uh, drone can do different behaviors according to different colors. When drone detects the blue color, drone will avoid, avoid this color, and when it recognizes the red color, it will follow this color and go straight to the position. Here we talk about vanish ink. Because of the computer vision, we use the ink color tracker, so we can uh, use vanish ink to help us print uh, foam. Um, because we make the ink vanishing time equals foam drying time so that we can know the specific time when foam is already dry and we can add the next foam layer. Here is the prototype which we use to add ink. This is a simulation which vanishing ink works. John will autonomously detect the color and uh, decide and decide whether to print or not. And when John detects the pink color, it means foam doesn't uh, dry and dry enough so that uh, John will continuously fly and search for white color. When it detects a white color, John will print a new foam layer. This is a flying experiment with vanishing ink. When the drone detects the pink color, it means uh, foam didn't dry and uh, it will continuously fly to fly the circle. When drone detects the white color, it will stop to print for a while. When one layer finished, drone will continuously fly the circle behavior and didn't stop to print. When ink vanished, it will stop and continue printing behavior. So. Yeah, order to form the space for the UAV and people living space. And the space in the tube is extremely narrow. So we are thinking like the tube can be changed to surface. The distance between the tube and uh, the printing agents and the guiding agent can be gradually changed and make, making the tube change to the surface. Also, the shape for the surface will also relate to the guiding agents in velocity. So the different velocity for the guiding agents, the printing result would be different. So from the eight, uh, uh, eight types of the shaping 
of, of the shape according to a different velocity and thought, uh, and we saw the structure analysis choo choosing the four types as the means types for the uh, form for the space. And here are the simulation for the printing agent and the guiding agent that uh, automatically uh, 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 derives the landscape. Uh, this is another experiment to form the shell. Uh, after that, we are using robotic arm to do the same, the exact shell. Uh, we just uh, have the same, the similar, the, uh, the similar principles as the tube before, so we can get it from the tube to surface. This is a material test. Uh, as you can see from that corner, uh, we have three different uh, kind of shell, and this is our final model. Uh, it, uh, when people can sit on it, so it, it means this kind of structure is really stable. And also, the guiding agent parts will affect shape. So the, di so the different agent movement will affect of the space that, that formed by the printing agent. If the, guiding, if the guiding agent go together, it will form the closed space. And if there is moving separation, it will form the open space. Therefore, there are the three types of space, open, semi-closed, and closed space. This is our basic unit. We add, we add some looping patterns between each leaves because it can make structure more stable and also seem like window. We also get the ideas from nature. Add the lily patterns as a supporting structure to the part where to become surface. And above that, the floors can be transparent, so the tr support strategies can also be a part of our decoration. For the For the structure, the small tube reinforces the surface. Some tube keep doing the looping behaviors to reinforce structures. And then it also has the potential to form the surface. So if keep doing this, it can form the stairs for the people's living or for the drones landing. So here is the UAV storage space where the tubes are gradually form to a surface and then the, again the tubes like reinforce to form a surface again. So it forms a kind of a shelter where the UAVs could come rest and sleep on it. And they can also store the species in this kind of space because of the structural reinforcement of the tube. And uh, here is the UAV solar recharging space, which orients according to the uh, solar direction. So the surface orients um, from day to midday to night in the specific location, and the UAVs could come rest on it, recharge, and go to print. So here is a small prototype we have developed, which is 350 grams and can be attached to the pelican. Uh, and it has a linear actuator to actuate the polyurethane foam. And we also developed a spray kind of mechanism which could spray the cooling spray along with the foam so that the foam could dry faster. So using these techniques, we got an opportunity uh, with the SPAC grant to uh, conduct these flying ex experiments at the uh, Imperial College. So we got to print with the UAVs um, for following our same layer by layer printing technique. We have managed to get a half circle. And then uh, with all this research, we carry on to a project scenario where the UAVs are deployed at the site with a helicopter, as you can see, because it is a remote inaccessible site. So we use the same uh, helicopter for solar recharging for the UAVs, and they could recharge, print the solar recharging stations and could come back again to the helicopter to recharge. And here uh, we scan the site 
uh, as shown in our previous videos, we scan the site and we get the points of high solar radi radiation and we build the solar recharging stations on this site. As you can see in one solar recharging station, the way UVs fly, recharge, on the solar panels on the top of the station, and then goes away to fly the rest of the parts. And uh, on this huge site, we designed on like three particular types of spaces. First, the UAVs goes print the uh, UAV solar stations as we've seen before. And the UAVs focus on printing the UAVs drone shelter so that they recharge, come back to the shelter. So this we can see the UAVs printing the shelter on a specific peak. And this is the solar recharging station on that specific peak where the species are found more. So they, uh, they find the place where the species they find more. And then they print the solar recharging station. And then you can see they print this to drone storage. And they print the solar recharge again. And they print the human habitation. So here are the UAVs scanning the site finding the specific location where the species are found more to study and research on it. So based on that location, they just uh, expand. They just start forming their tubular strategies to print the solar recharging station. And then they print the human habitation. Okay. As we can see, they scan the site. They search for the herbs. And then they make sure they do not touch the herbs. And they start building on the side. So the solar recharging station is being built as an open space with our tube to surface design strategies. And they recharge in there and print the human stations. Mm. But, the, but the only, only one trust have the limitation of the length of surface. So you will have the limitation of for the space. In order to have more space and also more stable structures, we add multiple trust from the different beginnings and uh, you can form a larger space. So this is the final simulation for the human habitation. And then first, the drone scan sites, and then they mark the position of the trees and herb. And later, before the building the human habitation, the drones first build the solar charge station. After that, the drones are building the human habitation for the humans. For this sequence, first, it's build the main structures. And then, basically on the main structures, some accommodations will be built, and also the small tube on the surface will keep strength, the um, reinforced structures, and also will be have a connection to the other um, accommodation as the stairs. There are, there, there are three different kinds of function in our design. The landing areas, accommodation, and research lab. Now, as you can see, people can have lots of different activities inside the rooms, such as meeting, working, doing research about the herb. We're also using the overlapping space as the shelf for display, displaying herb. And the pattern on the surface can not only be used as support structure, but also be the well of electricity and the water goes inside. And this is some renderings for the human habitation. And this is top view for the human living space. 
Thank you. is formed of the uh, robotic arm. This has come approximately about 40 layers. And here is a manual model experiment of where we uh, transform the tube to the surface by vertical and horizontal expansion of the surface. And here again are some milling model experiments. And here we thought about how will we, we merge the tubes and also separate and also merge together again. And so this is a final model which has like surface intersections in between them, and they connect and they are pretty much strong and stable surface, so one person could like sit, even this like structurally stable. So it can span up to like 2.5 2 meter. But this portion would be like less structured surface, so we would support uh, another tube from the bottom to top. So this is a one to one model of like our UAV solar recharging station. Um, what I what I think maybe didn't work that well was sort of when you got too much into the modeling bit of rendering part. I found that sort of finally unrelated, and, and I, I understand that you wanted to sort of to finalize your project to say, look, I want to explain you how the overall idea of the program works. Um, but clearly, I think you have other moments that are seriously interesting and much more interesting like the models that we are looking at here 
the idea of the sensing um, uh, that you have. And I just wanted to add another thing, which is the idea of having these different producers or constructors. And you would imagine having not only the ones that project this foam, but the ones that stiffening other areas or, or will or stiffen or will use other materials in the future means that there might be different types of UAVs that have different programmatic agendas and the coordination between them. Now, obviously, this would be beyond what you can achieve here, um, but clearly that, that would be of huge potential because that means that then when you look at some of the complexities that are emerging here, emerging here they will be achieved not only with the same UAVs, they would have to have other UAVs that would be either bigger, more bulky, carry more material or less material. Um, but I, I'm, I feel inspired by quite a few moments you have here because they're, they're, they're powerful, they're really interesting. Yet that relationship I found slightly less convincing. I think you should finalize really with those, right? And explain how that takes the project further. I get quite mixed feelings about this project. I think there's some, I think the concept's fantastic. I think the setting and the idea, the brief that you've developed for yourself is very interesting. I think some of the technical studies uh, are very good, uh, particularly the response to color and how it uh, uh, uses that as part of its deployment technique and, and establishing the, the conditions. I think where it lacks is perhaps the, perhaps what you were saying is the final architecture, that we get this render that comes out of, uh, without the, perhaps the explanation of the space behind it, the use behind it, wh why these forms are, are doing what they're doing. Uh, what you've got with this very lightweight material is something that can actually be used to create quite big spans and quite expansive spaces. Um, but perhaps that's not gone into enough into why you've created the spaces you have created. Uh, the landing pods uh, w was perhaps the only bit where you could see that there was an explanation for it, that they were going for the places with the high solar gain and that they were building from that and angling themselves around it. But the rest of it lacked a little in the, in the architecture, I think, and could have really been developed into something uh, much more convincing as a, as a final render and the final showpiece that you've got there. Um, part of that comes from, I think, seeing the building process and I think uh, there needs to be a little bit more work on how these fly around the spaces that they're creating themselves because they, they look to be building themselves into a corner a lot of time and then suddenly these extra layers come through and stiffen it all up afterwards which uh, they've created spaces which you can't actually access that easily and fly around. So I think there needs to be a bit more thought on how they actually build around themselves and how they develop that structure. But as I say, some very positive bits as well. I find it extremely fascinating for the, uh, both the use of the technology and then the, the possibility of the spaces that might come from, uh, uh, from the system. I mean, I don't mind too much the render because I know the render sometimes they're done, like just the last second, just to show uh, a visualization of an idea, but they're not actually too much about the project. Uh, but I think actually what we see here, I think it, it does give an idea of what you're trying to investigate as a space. Um, I like quite a lot of the use of technology to find the site or to find the context. I will question much more as well what is, the, let's say, the appropriate site from the point of view of lighting, uh, of energy, uh, you know, so if, it's, if it's more like a low-tech type of uh, uh, habitation, but still done with a highly technological system. So I think even questioning like where is the level of technology from buildings versus inhabiting, I think it's an open question. I think it's very challenging and it can be pushed forward much more. But I think it's great, great work. I think the, the multiplicity of skills that you've used to develop this project is quite amazing. The flying drones and uh, computer vision and uh, 3D printing and all of that. So congratulations. Uh, the, the one thing that you haven't talked about is the, the tons of material that need to be shipped uh, to the site. And I think it's a shame because for, for once on this project, I'm missing the... Um, the reference of the termite mounds and, and the corals who can who achieve to do structures similar to these ones using local materials. So how could you enhance this project with um, a way to build them 
without shipping tons of stuff into a site that it, you know, with protected species and all of that. And you could imagine uh, doing it with modified organisms or uh, robots that can source local materials to the site. Or I guess that's a, uh, something for your development of the project. Um, just reflecting why I'm not as excited. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate, of course, the, the complexities of uh, getting the drones to fly, to have, uh, as you said, um, machine vision and color recognition. And the effort of getting um, the drones to fly and the effort of getting the printing going and all the It's useful to, you've moved from the, from the hand printing to the uh, re refitting of the milling machine. It is smart, and I think the forms have something, clearly, the, the tube to surface. Then there is, in the rendering, suddenly you appear additional reticulations and, and, and ribbing pattern. I don't know if they have ever exp been explored and how they fit with the, uh, with the process. And what, what I find uh, problematic is, and that's maybe with, with the whole drone printing project, there is, of course, the, 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 the distance from, from realization and the... Um, to me particularly uh, when it comes to human habitation as a phrase and a series of forms which, uh, which land in that space which have not been worked on, not been explained and uh, not been problematized with suspect morphologies. So I think compared to the previous project we saw this morning, there's, I, I just, it becomes so intangible for me and that, that, that maybe, and I don't expect that uh, at that pace of that kind of open-endedness to come to fruition during my lifetime, so I'm getting very, I'm switching off nearly. So, so that's I think your the way I feel uh, the, the the instrumentalization and bring it into the discipline and and structuring aspects which you can understand as architecture or I, I, with respect to human habitation because I don't respect I don't uh, uh, I don't uh, accept. A, a machinic process out there somewhere solving, um, um, uh, let's say, biodiversity problems where drone build for themselves and inhabit another space, part of our discipline, frankly speaking. So that's why you, I think you sense that and you throw in this phrase human habitation, but I think uh, you don't give us enough. Although I find there's a suggestiveness in these structures here. Uh, which, which I find interesting. And I add the question, I mean, that was a challenge and maybe a downer. <laughs> and you had a number of, of, of spurted uh, endorsements, but what's the proxy material a proxy for? Maybe any other material that has the same properties, which could be like more stronger and can be used, because for now the foam can be used only as a temporary structure. Yeah. Um. No, I was wondering also about that. I, I agree with both comments, but actually both comments. Uh, I think that the core of the project is in the development of a, of a behavior that responds to, uh, to the position of color. Of the surfaces we build, uh, and how uh, 
how the, the regime of, of behavior of the, of the growth uh, change, also specifically, not only in terms of speed, uh, but also in terms of the, type of the types of maneuverings that, that they produce. Uh, is that kind of center of the project where were more, um, more developed? I, mean, I know that, that I must, in a way, far too much in relation to something that is already interesting. But if that was more developed, let's say, even as, a, as, a, as, an, as, a, as an imaginary project, uh, not necessarily as, a, as an actual project, uh, I think that then one could start talking about the way in which the construction of the surfaces or of the tubular surfaces uh, would enable for the, what I think should be the, the, the focus of the project in terms of, of its program, which is what it does to the landscape. Uh, right now, the idea of program is, is uh, sort of detached from the landscape and its form. Uh, so th there is a scanning device that activates uh, behavior, and then there is a self-fueling uh, self behavior, right? Uh, and then there is a programming strategy that is quite weak, let's say. Uh, instead, I think that it would be interesting to find, let's say, the particularities of coloring already in the landscape, or that, that the two aspects, let's say, the, the scanning and the behavior of the machine are integrated in one. And that then the, then the project would be about constructing or let's say over developing a certain landscape uh, in terms of, it, of increasing its fertility or increasing its, its capability of vegetation handling. I don't think that's enough uh, because I actually think looking at this thing that you wouldn't even build it with a drone. You would drop it in by that helicopter that you flew onto the site and some big chunks and you'd just glue it together. So, so um, I, just, I would just ask you guys to, um, to really think about the relationship between processes of design, processes of construction, and architecture. And I would argue that architecture is, um, uh, is and should be autonomous from those other elements at the end of the day. It's not that you can break it off from its processes of construction or of, or of design, but at the end of the day, if it doesn't itself as a kind of autonomous thing contribute to the discourse and the, and the sort of arc of the discourse of architecture, I think it's never, it's, um, it's never justifiable nor, uh, only through its, its means and its machines. So, um, so like I would, looking at the image on the wall, the, the only thing that I'm thinking is that one, if, if you're gonna show that image, one, you'd need to talk about the history of the, um, of the kind of exposed rib or the vein on a surface, tie it back through, I don't know, Greg Lynn, uh, back to Victor Horta doing Art Nouveau, and way further back than that, maybe. And, um, and uh, maybe all the way back to the Baroque, I don't know. And, and talk about it in, the, in that context. I think it would be really important for you guys to be able to do that. And then also I see some green stuff on there and I wonder 
what its relationship is to nature. It looks kind of like a biological form, but then it also gets some plants on it. And I'm not sure what the plants are doing for you in, in terms of the architecture. It's not clear. It seems like a kind of decorative thing right now. Um, so it, it sends signals that you, what you want to do. It sends the signal that you want to relate to nature, but I'm not sure that putting plants on it is making your case any better. Or even that putting veining on surface is, um, is, uh, has been made as an architectural argument. That's what I want to say. Can I, can I clarify? Yeah. Uh, we are not like putting herbs on, the, on our like, location. It's just like we are finding the location where there is more species so that uh, the, it's, it's a proposal for a research lab. So the pe people in the research lab sh uh, can get the species through the drones. The drone f would fly it to them and they would research on these species. So they, uh, and they can also store these species and also uh, the drones can throw the seeds and make it like grow much first. Like it can expand onto the research. Yeah, so we are using a species as to study them and or to like protect them, that's it. All, all I'm saying is, I think these things are amazing, and they have an aesthetic, it's a kind of an aesthetic category here that, that needs to be, I think that one of the main things that architects do is create aesthetics, frankly. Um, uh, um, and I think that you have an aesthetic here that is possibly not unpacked by you guys. And it seems like you'd need a whole secondary process looking at these. Like, I don't know, you'd need a milling machine on another robot to come in and then shave these down into the smooth forms with the veins that you want to have at the end. So I don't know what that secondary process is that gets you from this to that, but maybe there is one, maybe there isn't, or maybe this is the, the architecture, I don't know. But it would need, it would need a, a kind of intellectual framework, I think, to support it, so. I would, I would suggest, um, like the studio's been trying to look at compressing design and construction within one creative process. And I, I agree with everyone's comments so far. I think, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think you've got a very astute jury. Uh, Tom's comments included, I think, are fantastic. <laughs> um, what, I, what I would say is that I think you're in, like what, something that you don't communicate much, but I would say that uh, process here should not be separate from the aesthetic we're discussing. Uh, if it is, then, you could just kind of dismiss a lot quite quickly. So, and I think your answer to part of that question of Tom's is, is in the computer vision, in the, in the invisible ink, and the tracing of the, the expansion, this really unpredictable, messy material, and the fact that you're trying to build a construction process that is self-referential, uh, that is autonomous, that you, you have you're, you are touching on a site, but you're trying to do something that is specific to what you've just done. And you're constantly feeding back. So for me, it, the last two models you did, this really wafer thin one here and the one at the end, I think they're fantastic models. And it's in their roughness and their delicacy and in their variation. The fact that they're not perfect, I think if we were to sand them down, it would be to undermine all that work. It would be more a, a matter of uh, playing into those qualities, and it is through these feedback mechanisms that you have been working on that we could imagine that that's actually possible. So I think, I think there is an aesthetic agenda there that's directly tied to a, a messiness related to um, reacting constantly to what has just been made. And that's embracing the unpredictability of this material. Uh, the material is actually a, a material that all the three teams of the studio are working on in parallel to scientists who are, who are working on the research aspect of, of the project, um, that then there will be higher performance materials developed. So it's a proxy material, uh, but we have had in the past students working with extracting materials from a local site and so forth and, and considering more environmentally suitable materials, but that hasn't been part of the question. Um, but, uh, Proxy for, as in it's an initial material that has been used by researchers as they develop new materials that are trying to negotiate uh, payload weights relative to structural performance. Um, so it's a, a nice, easy material to start working with when you're carrying it in the air, basically. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the architectural outcome, I also agree with the jury that this is where uh, you could have done more, and this is something that you could try to clarify more in your thesis document. 
uh, as you produce that over the next few weeks, is as into what is the actual criteria for the, the inhabitation and also what is the architectural discourse that it is touching on and developing. And, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we looked at, uh, and we'll have Philip coming over with the concrete printing, and uh, there is this ineliminability of, of the, the traces of production, and you can then go in, or, well, you could add, have put a lot of additional work in to eliminate this. That hasn't been typically the spirit of, of, of our field. So when, when remember, um, so we actually cherish this. There's a certain granularity to a certain texture to it. And it, it, it accentuates, it works together with uh, the transformation, the thicker at the bottom, and then, and then it becomes thinner and more transparent at the, at the top. There's this kind of fineness shift and so on. And so we, we treasure this because and that's called factura in, in the history of architectural discourse. And Greg was liking it when we had the tool pass of milling maintained in the, in, the, in the system and when you have bricklaying courses and these are heightened into, into ornaments. So that's, that's, that's all appreciated. And I feel that um, the, uh, maybe the project has, has too many aspects and ambition, that fantastic landscape. The, the drones themselves are independent from that because you haven't done this with a drone. You've done it with another kind of printing material. And I just throw this in. There's, of course, there's a challenge in this and difficult in this project with, with the, the leap of imagination with the drones, the landscape. This kind of self-referentiality element is interesting. That's why it's very hard to, to maintain our, the, that tangibility and not lose the sense and discussing what we're aiming for. And I think what, what Tom was saying in terms of the history of architecture, and the, uh, the, vein, the veining, the surface, the ribbing, there's other examples of this from the Gothic up through, throughout the war. And, and, and today, together with the factura element, which is in these at the same time as well, I mean, you start with the Gothic and the Gothic walls, the stones and the stone geometries are, remain present. And No, it's not a chair, it's just like a shell. So <laughs> Okay. 
Yeah, no, I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to keep drawing this out, but I, but I, I, um, I think if you think about Le Corbusier and reinforced concrete and the relationship between that material and that architect, and really what we don't, I mean, we know how important that innovation was in terms of bringing reinforced concrete back from its early uses um, all the way back in the Roman Empire into, this, into its contemporary form, where it can cantilever certain amounts and it can create a distance between the envelope and the pilotis such that you can have a free facade. I think that's much more important, that innovation in terms of architecture to allow a material innovation to create a whole new regime of, of facade designs for modernism. Like that's that's what we that's the important part of that innovation. Not just the not not the sort of the back the, the back of house uh, capabilities or uh, of of the reinforced concrete itself. So this is you guys actually saying that the material itself makes a new architecture. If you're in fact saying that, and I, I mean I would be interested to to see you just develop it further. You know, I mean I it's I think it's beautiful. I'd like to see it in leather, too. I don't know if we're passing this now. Could I? Yeah. I mean, I mean, oh, yeah we can add. I mean, maybe I, I make a last comment from a, from a more um, sort of an interest of, in, in the biological. This offers huge potential. And if I understand, sort of on the one hand, I, I'm with Patrick, which is that it's partly removed from the idea that this is an architectural proposition that we could inhabit, and you use the word inhabitation, and it's sort of partly premature in this project. From a biological point of view, it's actually really fascinating, because the idea of the porosity of foams, and rather than these foams, um, you know, bioplastics and other types of foams, which could become this interface between an artificially created bioscaffold for this vegetation, and I think your answer could be very different to Tom's question, which is to say, in fact, we didn't develop it too much because it was a maybe last thought, but that nature will in, engage with this and use this porosity as a bioscaffold to develop something that, in fact, this landscape doesn't have. Might be the species from there, but they will be starting growing in a different way. And then the, the aesthetic conversation is not only purely about what is produced through your drones and your, your 3D prints, but it's actually something where nature engage with it, engages with this. And this is only a first chapter of a much more complex story to tell. And I, I see them as, as sort of um, much more sort of contraptions that are attached to the landscape that create this interface between the natural evolution of, of the site and what is a human in, 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 in habitation, but not so much on a functional level of having laboratories inside. I don't care actually what is inside. There is something else here which, which is really interesting. And you just need to change the form into other types of forms that are more um, biodegradable, uh, degradable, for example. And you immediately have a different story. Um, so bioreceptivity, which is a big topic, you know, would be super interesting with what you're doing here. Um, but again, maybe that's the last story that you brought in. And I think these projects are often like that. You spend a year and a half working on them, and then you, you finish it by saying, there's some aspects that really are worth taking further. Others, which are sort of closed chapters in their own right, where you say, well, could have been done differently, or maybe the illustrations were not great. But it's worth the aspects of the aesthetics and the, the, the sort of bio-integrated side of, of the thing. Good. Thanks. Uh, hello. We are Team The Loop. We are with Superopolis Lab. Uh, I am Yiğit Ushik from Turkey, and my friends Anders Leronitis from Lithuania, and Chen Hu from uh, China. In our presentation, we will be discussing self-regulated, self-structuring uh, mobile systems that aims to achieve new possibilities of interaction in between the inhabitant, the environment, and the system itself. The research is influenced by the argument that the revolutionary changes in contemporary society brought about by new communications media and new technological developments drive paradigm shifts in all fields of design practice. We observe these in the means of a demand of, a, of the society for mass customization, quality, and efficiency from the most products it consumes. 
We aim to respond to these issues with a system that adopts an ever-transforming, dynamically adaptive machinic ecology. Interplay of autonomous behavioral units leads to the emergence of a dynamic landscape through goal-oriented communication patterns. The responsive and dynamic interaction may yield new possibilities of interaction in between the inhabitant and its environment. One of the main driving references for our research has been the evolutionary developmental biology, EvoDevo for short. We have investigated the evolution of complex systems that are to perform differentiated functions. Such differentiation comes through cellular communication and the interaction between the individual cells and their environment in time. We have adopted a similar approach to generate an overall organization of a system as a result of the communication and intrinsic abilities of dynamically interacting individual units. Such self-organization principles can be observed in the behavior of ferrous materials in electromagnetic fields. We have experimented with the magnetism and examined the organizational principles of the patterns emerged. In consequence, the abstraction of the self-organizing nature of ferrous materials within magnetic fields acts as a key to investigate strategies that of assembly, packing, and organization. In the following series, we have investigated how does the replacement of magnets may create various patterns and moments of self-configurations. It is noted that the introduction of new objects to the system disturbs the magnetic field and causes new interactions to occur. Rotational joints enable more possibilities of configuration in which the formation is not solely fixed on the magnet's configuration, since the magnets have potential to adjust their angles of connections. Also, the magnetic field Also, the magnetic field that causes the self-configurations might not be only as nodes on the surface, but also exhibit the field throughout itself. The system works when a magnet is placed in a position that may always encourage the magnet to jump to a stronger node on the surface. The continuous magnetic field can be placed along curves, arcs, and circles, and or spheres that mimics the behavior of natural magnets. This can create possibilities that not only interactions based on nodes on the surface, but also create an overall magnetic field that can lead to complex magnetic field interferences that influence multiple units simultaneously. As a result, there is basically two ways of abstracting the connection of a natural magnet. First, the magnetic poles may act as a node, which creates a dense but short range uh, magnetic field, the other is acting as magnetic body, where multiple magnets position themselves so that there is a pull towards poles of the object. Although magnetic body creates an overall field around the object, due to its dense nature, it is very challenging to actuate or manipulate its nature as opposed to the latter. The units can communicate with each other via the transmission of their rule states as color codes with the help of LED and mounted color sensor. Individual colors can be coded with a specific rule set to transmit data from one unit to another so that they can influence each other's states. Following the communication, we have developed strategies regarding the mobility of the units, and through prototyping, we put several mobility strategies into experimentation. Despite the difficulties in precision, having a center of mass shifting strategy can potentially enable the unit to move any direction due to the isotropic geometry of the sphere. The mobility is enabled when two wheels are pushing the inner mechanism towards the curved inner surface of the sphere. This causes a shift in the center of mass and initialize rolling. Each individual unit is embedded with basic behaviors, which we simulate via generative algorithms. The interactions occur within a closed homogeneous system, utilizing only the embedded information. We have observed simulations which may yield emergent patterns as a result, and continue to iterate as we make assumptions and improvements. In parallel, we have continued to experiment with the magnetic balls by setting fixed magnets un underneath, in order to understand their organization principles that can be applied into our system. 
These are the patterns we generated from the setting uh, fixed polarities into the system with different density of units. Through changing the strength of force and position of polarities, we get 2D patterns with different void making and grouping, which can be used for footprints, boundaries, or outline of formations. The behavior of the single intelligent units is projected onto large populations in order to simulate the emerging formations. Such equilibrium consists of states of non-fixed polarities of individual units, informed by the states of temporary densities. The ability of each individual to change their states of attraction to repulsion based on the density led three states of each unit. Attraction when scarce, repulsion when dense, and stable states result a system that is always trying to reach the dynamic equilibrium. Based on the observations on how each magnet moves according to the surrounding magnetic field, each unit needs to negotiate its own terrain with the population. We have utilized the density as a parameter that can be controlled. This catalog of formations generated through controlling the density in 3D space so that each unit will be flipping from different states. Our space generation is based on the controlling the state of units by controlling the density of its neighborhood. There are various possibilities of formations that can be generated through changing the polarities of each unit by controlling the density in a different position in the space. Similar methodology was pursued to generate 3D formations. This parameter enables each unit to flip into different states, produce different particle forces, and create stability conditions according to its neighborhood. To be able to control such high population, there needs to be a set of resolution layers of small-scale interacting clusters to create small sets of groups to achieve specific tasks and through interaction of such groups, there may be an overall formation that is able to perform specific functions. These clusters can be categorized into different sets based on their functionality and properties of each cluster. Accordingly, we progressed the logic of formation into three stages, stacking, transforming, and reconfiguration. In the stacking stage, the unit in the core of the space will become a group. Each group will have a central controller unit. Through the controlling of the behavior of these controller units, we can get various 3D formations. The formations are separated from each other in terms of the properties they exhibit. One of the properties of these aggregations is the energy efficiency. The energy consumption is taken into consideration for the behavior of the controller units. As a, un as a unit moves higher and further, they would spend more energy. If the energy is lower than a certain amount, they will leave their position to get charged. Another property might be elimination of individual units based on height and surrounding density parameters. During the aggregation, units will also calculate the distance between themselves to the ground. If the height of one unit is equal to a certain height, it would sense the density above itself. If the neighbor number above is too less, this unit will light up, eliminating what is above. This may lead to certain elimination or lighting conditions. Similarly, when the unit reaches to a height of drop light, it will calculate the neighbor number underneath. If the neighbor number is lower than a certain amount, it will light up. This is similar to the conditions of a sailing lighting. The aggregations can have various lighting conditions that is based on calculations on various parameters. The system also concerned about the material efficiency, which means that each unit will evaluate whether itself is necessary to support the main structure. When one formation is stacking to a certain height, the system will estimate each unit. If the unit is unnecessary for the structure, it will collapse and search for other place to build up again. Similar to the latter, the system will calculate the surface density depending on various different uh, functionalities. For example, the suitable density for a chair is around 75% when it fills the gaps on the surface sufficiently so that there is no unattached clusters. 
If the density is too much, unnecessary units will go back to the seeding points or for another use. Um, furthermore, as a result of parallel experimentation with magnetic balls, we have observed that some certain plant configurations, magnets tend to exhibit by stable properties under some certain configurations where they form loops. The configurations tend to resist the manipulation of force until it shifts into another stable configuration. Series of magnets tend to create a linear formation. If there is no force acting upon them, spherical magnets resist if force is to break the linearity until they reach equilibrium through creating a loop. When all magnets are in a loop, the magnetic force vectors are equalized in uh, all directions, hence there is uh, equilibrium. Observing how the buckyballs are self-regulated -re through their characteristics, it is noted that this certain plant characteristics of loop may unlock further abilities that is achieved through our collaborative interaction between the units. In the light of our findings, we revealed that it's important to maintain free rotation at least in one direction. The orthodome or certain circle of the sphere has magnets that can rotate freely so that it can maintain connection to the neighboring unit as they can change configurations. In order to achieve a connection strategy for such a system, multiple configurations of possible number of connections per unit is investigated. The actuation of a single unit as it's able to connect in multiple units simultaneously illustrates how the units in a loop will connect to its peers. Also, this connection makes it possible to rotate individual magnets independently from one another, utilizing a gear mechanism actuated through three different servos. The actuation of a single unit as it is able to connect multiple units simultaneously. As the, as the units come together, their magnets get aligned with the help of magnetic force. On the other hand, in order to lift another unit, the lift needs to be stabilized through a third one. Otherwise, the unit will rotate in position rather than rotating another unit. Therefore, the collaboration of multiple units is essential to achieve this structuring mechanism. Several stable and mobile configurations are possible. And if the connection point is rotation enabled, the units may change directionally and create dense packing conditions. 16 of the units come together to form an enhanced configuration, which is a double loop of eight, which, and which is 16 units in total. The most important abilities that may be achieved through this formation of loop includes the transformation of horizontal configurations into vertical ones, Introduction formations of varying prosperity conditions enables applying formation of units and lastly a group locomotion as an enhanced variation of mobility strategy. Polarizing is essential to the system. When the pressure is applied to the formation resists the deformation, hence may unlock Possibilities of occupancy conditions based on the combinations of the plant configurations of the unit. Also, through group locomotion, the loop is able to tackle obstacles on its path, otherwise impossible as individuals. One of the formation logic that is not predefined is to control the distance of in-between controlling units. 
the controllers also cause the rest of population to follow them in a way that shapes overall uh, morphology. This is evaluation catalog that we use to find out how the force and number of controllers in between controllers have effect on the overall formation. Based on the previous catalog findings on applying different force and the maximum distance limitation between controllers, it is possible to generate different types of basic formations. For example, when repulsion force at the bottom level and attraction force at the top level are added, the system can generate arc. Accordingly, to the limitation of the maximum distance we set into the system and the population, the shape of arc are changeable. Similarly, we can generate double arc by adding force in the same way. Different scales of shape can be created by adding distance limitation, change the radiance and the growth of population. Through adding the arc in one formation, we can generate domes with different density and heights. We uh, we, when the attraction force in the middle level is increased, there will be connection between the arcs to fill the gap in between of them. The system is also able to generate more complex formations with different scales. For example, when we add repulsion force onto top level and fix the controller in other levels, different umbrella shape cantilevers are generated. And when we fix controllers on the top and add certain equally repulsion force underneath, a kind of house structure can be also created. We can get regularly partitions with different patterns with fixing the controllers on the edge and add a change force in between of the controller in the middle. These are the examples of surface and shelters are generated by adding number of controllers on each level, fixing several of them on the ground and set certain rules to make them move. All of the, form, uh, the simulations up until this point constitute goal formations for our system. The cluster and the loop configurations try to approximate such formations through their characters, structuring methodology. It is important to note that the units within the simulations are always acting the groups, which is interpreted as group of units in the loop. In the way, this is how the simulations and the building sequence work coherently in order to achieve the structuring. We are applying the assembly sequence of the units by setting specific rules within the particle system and magnetic field as the goal that our loops need to achieve. We use the same building sequence in stacking stage of loop as the aggregation logic of formation in magnetic field. As for now, um, the discussed properties and behaviors were relevant to the system itself, but only having the context for dynamic landscape enables its symbiotic relationship to happen. Other parts, two parts of the system, is the house and the human, both drivers for the decisions of the system to happen. The behaviors and qualities of each alters the behavior, alters the results and ensures the, rela the relationship. Um, house as a context for the system is taken for a case study initiative marked as a collective approach to material efficiency and design as it was important for it to give a good solution for each problem. This collective strategy of a problem solving and design implementation expanded the means of merger and quality emphasizing the duplication and mass manufacturing. By that means that our system provides reconfiguration and adaptation from the initiative the Stahlhaus was chosen because of its intricate relationship of the interior and exterior and the possibility for the dynamic relationship to become dynamic landscape to become part of the surrounding landscape. Sorry. Within the context and surrounding environment, the dynamic landscape immediately becomes a tool towards creation of space, adding meaning to the transformations as goes through time from floor, from floor to wall and ceiling interaction, yet always starting from simple behaviors and adding it up to the landscape. User in, is the active participant in the dynamic landscape. 
user is the active User is the active participant in the dynamic landscape. Anthropometrical qualities uh, and embedded reactive actions, that is motion, light, and touch sensors, enables the system to respond and provide functionality. I'm terribly sorry, I don't know why it's not playing. Oh, functionality, let me just explain that briefly, um, since it's not playing. The, the configuration, disaggregation of the loops uh, is based, um, the point of it is that unit, uh, the loop has the ability to create, to expand and create space within. And the, while having this fl flat packed surface, uh, the uh, disaggregation senses that a human is lying there, there and um, a, in, uh, in, uh, almost inflates accordingly and provides a, landscape for, for the human silhouette to lie on. As the light is important part of any living condition, the system provides three types of light conditions, ambient, functional, and navigational. The nature of functional and navigational light is a mean for human comfort. Functional, naturally, is a light condition meant for specific tasks such as reading, work, or, or collective activities. The behaviors of the inhabitant are detected and a cluster of units is being formed around or above the occurring activity and therefore fixating on this specific location. Um, navigational light is meant to guide the human within darkness when the footprint of this ever-changing, uh, when the ever-changing footprint is not visible. The, the lowest, in this case, the lowest level particles of formation engage and emit light underlying the outline. Ambient light, however, is the key, uh, is, is a way of the communication within the system in between units, providing lifelike feeling of cohabitant for the inhabitant. As the reconfiguration is one of the main qualities of the system, together with the sensing abilities, the decision of behaving in a certain way can be achieved as in this case, under a set of condition, uh, deformation of seating landscape for a number of people can be achieved. However, of the condition change, that is the number of people in this case, reconfigura reco reconfiguration takes place, providing necessary landscape for the inhabitant activities. The system repositions part of the previous reconfiguration at the same time calling for, 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 the, unit, for the other units from the other place. The reconfiguration can also be a part of flight control system, taking advantage of the ability of loop to transform, therefore creating a space within morphology and enabling the transformation while altering the density and translucency of the aggregation, therefore allowing light to pass through. In a way, system behavior changes the living conditions with the house for the comfort of the inhabitant. Over time, system learns the features and, and needs of the environment. However, the ability of, of on-demand formation is equally important. Immediate help and formation of the system happens when the inhabitant directly interacts with the system. That is, picking one of the units from the formation. When picked, sensorial system of the unit enables communication. Voice commands would be translated into core behaviors. Then unit is placed in an intended location, behaving, behaving as a controller, and the required formation starts and it's going to remain in the collective memory of the system as a part of learning curve. We have experimented with the magnetic behaviors, collective organization, and derived with the cluster configuration that creates control mechanism for the behavior of, of large aggregations. When the system is introduced to the context with the human in the house, the control mechanism, mechanism of the loop enables the transfer, transformation not only from the morphological point of view, but also becomes a catalyst for the translucency, density, and other variables. It becomes dynamic, adaptive, self-assembly strategy, which creates interaction possibilities while increasing the space and experience quality. Thank you very much.
some of our, of our aggregations that they don't take uh, nodes on the surface as well as the uh, magnetic body. Uh, and th this is some of the uh, formations generated through the simulation uh, and uh, a bit based on the uh, intercommunication between the individual particles. Uh, this is uh, how our morphologies might uh, resemble within, uh, when placed within the, uh, uh, one of the case houses. And uh, since uh, uh, it has like uh, overall uh, views and all the glasses around it, uh, I think it's very uh, interesting to uh, the effect the uh, translucency around it. And here are some of our actuated, uh, server actuated uh, models, and some of our previous aggregation models, and some of our previous uh, aggregations based on uh, magnetic behavior. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, the presentation. Um, I might have some comments, just perhaps you could clarify for me. Um, there's many levels here that are interesting. I mean, th the main concept that you have is the loop, because obviously you, you describe the behavior um, of, the, of the little kind of semi-intelligent, because there's two levels of intelligence here. One level is the magnetic physical intelligence, and then you, you have those machines where you have the code embedded within the color system, so that they, the, the kind of same level of behavior is almost a replicate on the physical and, uh, and the kind of code level. So that's interesting, there's these two, that's also another level of looping where you can show that the behavior of the physical behavior of the magnets is kind of, uh, one, one doesn't want to say reflected, or doesn't want to say uh, kind of mirrored, but um, in fact, that's something interesting to explore, the kind of uh, the symmetry between the coded uh, rule behavior and the actual physical behavior that you have experimented with the, the, the magnet. So that's, that's interesting. Another level of... of um, of interest is the, um, the, the kind of the idea of the interaction. So there's an interaction amongst particles that from small units create complex behavior, but there's also the interaction with the sensing of the environment, the senses of light, of movement in space, of human kind of behavior, some kind of ergonomics as well, a kind of another level of ergonomic uh, um, adaptation. Um, but um, I, I'm not sure whether you could clarify for me whether you think that these two levels of coded embedded behavior and physical behavior, you think is, is the same or is parallel or what is it doing uh, to this kind of architecture, whether um, you see, it seems that this is, you say, it's a domestic rendering, it's a domestic understanding, or not, so not main architectural level um, element, it's more within the domestic space, and I wonder why why is that? Why is this adaptation just domestic and there's an understanding of space as domestic? Uh, why can it be extended or scaled up or down? Um, at the moment, that's what I have to say. There's someone else? If you like. Uh, regarding to the question of uh, having two different intelligence uh, and two different resolution layers, uh, one is physical, one is simulation, and how they are working coherently. Uh, the, uh, our approach is that uh, the simulation world uh, f formations are uh, goal forms for our uh, building. Uh, the uh, loop is trying to approximate. Uh, so uh, via following group-based simulation, uh, which is similar to the uh, being intact as like a loop. Uh, the simulation constitutes what forms the uh, gold forms, and uh, th through uh, the interaction between the uh, loops, uh, they are trying to approximate those gold forms. Uh, 
Hey, you guys, that, that was really rigorous and amazing, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, uh, I guess the first thing I want to say is these, I find it, it's, you guys, have, the way that you presented it was so deadpan, it was like we were in an engineering conference or something. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if that was, if, because some of the stuff here is quite comical, and I don't know if you see it that way at all, but, but when I sat down right here, to see these playful little Gumby-like um, creatures with their fuzziness is just, uh, they're, they're, I find them hilarious and, and cute and scary at the same time, and I think there's something there. There's something there that's worth considering as being part of the project, not in excess of the project as an engineering project, but that it also is the project. And I, I really, I don't know, I really enjoy it, and I think it's, it's great and playful. So that's one thing um, that you didn't mention about it. Um, I, like what I, I like that you are dragging in the case study houses to play this thing against. I think that's a smart move um, to do that. Uh, I, but it seems like what you, uh, what your hypothesis was, was that you could, that that the that the balls wouldn't ever get to the point where they would be able to create enclosure or a kind of a new case study house, but that they're much better at creating furniture and window um, shading and other kinds of things that. You would that you would consider maybe more prosthetics to architecture. I'm, I'm not sure if that's what if that's if if you ended up that way because it seemed to work the best or because that's that was your hypothesis. But I guess I would just add that it's like I just I would want you to take it like the next step and say like how do you you know this when you put a bunch of balls next to each other you have an, you have an essential problem that it's difficult to create enclosure right you're always going to have a kind of permeable. A mass. No matter how many balls you add to the mass, you're never going to have something that makes enclosure like that piece of glass right there. So it's going to be difficult to do things like create envelopes for architecture or roofs or slabs or other kinds of things. But not, maybe not impossible. Maybe, again, it's like a two-step process. There's an organization of these things, but then there's another, there's another layer that is required in order to, to, to start to create, let's say, an impermeable surface, for instance. Um, but so I just I think you guys stopped a little short because I think the furniture thing is like it's a it's a no-brainer I think it's a great idea. I think you guys should patent it tomorrow and have furniture that can reorganize itself for different kinds of You know entertaining at your house. I mean, there's just like it's a no-brainer like like you win but in terms of its application as a as a new kind of case study house as a new architecture I don't it's just not clear in my head yet how it can fulfill some of those roles that architecture needs to do like keeping the rain out and those other kinds of things. So it's like one step too short, it seems like. Actually, maybe just to counterbalance the, um, the, this comment, I think maybe the potential of the project is the fact that because you have an envelope, like a glass envelope, you don't have to worry about too much about tectonic and weather. And uh, you can actually try to think what else this system could create, and I think you, you did it, but I, I mean, I understand that I think it's important that you can challenge it even more. I think if you have, uh, uh, if you don't have the problem of gravity, for example, this ball, instead of always been uh, going from bottom up, can be the opposite, they can come down from the ceiling. So as well, our, our use of space is different because the density then is always higher. Uh, so I think you can question <coughs> much more, what are the potential now that you don't have to worry about weather and the tectonic? Yeah, I want to second that. That's very, very important. I think we had versions of this project where they were more ambitious to creating the whole architecture, exterior conditions, and and that was always a stretch of the imagination. And I think this is very, very smart and very mature and, and, and maybe the best version of the project I've seen. Maybe there's two more to look at. So I suspend judgment in terms of that. But I really congratulate you. It's really, really sophisticated. And for me, it brings it home that, uh, for me, interior design and furniture design is as much valued and important and critical um, a part of our discipline as uh, larger structures. And when it comes to, to keeping the elements out, that's initially, first of all, an engineering issue as well. I accept that. And this is also solvable with additional elements. And I think that at the moment we have a mono system and I think it could start to uh, allow other 
particles to come in which have additional surface generation, a bit like uh, Shajay's first project. I think that's very, very smart there, and this could easily apply here. But I think the new ingredients with getting into context, which take the burden off, um, I mean, the, these panels are fantastic. I mean, you've been homing in on this before, but what you've done with the magnetic and the self-organizing capacity is just wonderful. And it's, I fall in love with it. It's beautiful. And then to micro-engineer the, 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 the magnetic patterning and what you're onto, the variety of how these things have multiple equilibria of formation, I think, is on that level of the, um, let's say, uh, atomic molecular capacity of a new repertoire, again, very, very striking and very convincing. These are fantastic. And I think there's a number of claims you're making about sensing and inter-awareness, or you have to explicate this. For instance, is there pressure sensing, but is that enough to understand whether you are a critical component in overall structure? Wouldn't that mean an, an, an outside computation, force, central computation of, for instance, finite element analyzing this? So there are some claims there. I guess tempers temperature sensor are easy. And I think that you have expanded the use that vehicle. You know, I like the, the screening, the, the, the relationships to, to, the, to the environment, the, the introduction of light, which I think is a, is a super important architectural um, medium we should be much more pushing and a treasure because it, may, it is also so disburdened and homes in on, on interaction, communication, navigation creating atmosphere, inviting people, and to bring in the human figure, finally, very, very important. You have ergonomics, you have interaction. And I think what, what Tom's saying about the creatures, about the, the, we had that always in the mix here. The cuteness, the, 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 the behavioral, the characters, the demeanors, the, the, how these communicate and invite. And I think we can look at these, but the way how to bring that home without talking, 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 is again by bringing the interaction, the life process into the model, then you realize what this might mean, how this invites. Whether it's scary or, or cute, you'll see that in the reaction of the, of the, of, of the, the human figures gathering around this. So that's that will be my pitch for, for the next stage. But I'm, I'm really so satisfied and, and happy that, this, that this, this, this really delivers something very, very tangible, very, very, as, as Tom said, I mean, he said this, you know, you patented it. I mean, I think uh, that's not ready, but, but I think it's, I'm very, very happy, very, very happy. Could I, could I just follow up on it with a couple of points? And I'm going to try and get, it, get observations to the form of a question for, for the team. The first one would be at the level of, of um, what we might think of as your sort of general field of research and your expertise, and it's really impressive lying at an understanding of magnetic force and how that force is playing out in these funny objects in the aggregate whole. I think the question would be, in looking at your wonderful billboard on the project, are those four or eight lines enough to describe magnetic force in your world? This sort of old school diagram where magnetic force is eight magic vectors explaining a generalizable principle about how force is distributed in space. The question would be, could we be representing your knowledge and understanding of that reality in a way that would not only visualize that to people like ourselves who frankly have no idea how it really operates, but that you clearly do in order for you to do some of the amazing things you demonstrate in the videos, and if so, could you in this last stage of work that you've got to do to tie this together in the form of a thesis document, describe those forces with the kind of determination and depth that I would say all of your objects have already on the paper. The force literally disappears. The consequences of the force is shown in either an animation or a drawing, but of course you're working with a modeling environment in which the modeling of force is as everyday as the modeling of the objects. And you could model those forces many ways. You could use it as sort of vector diagrams in the kind of classical structural sense. You could also apply luminosity so that we would see where force is by the brightness or the darkness in the images. It's sort of up to you to decide. That would be, that would be the sort of the general question. The, the more specific one is probably your lovely leap into a 60-year-old house to now start to test the project and in an architecture that, if I understand it right, is built of the very same materials that you're using. A bit of glass, a bit of steel, and lots of wiring. Which, in a weird way, is a kind of primitive environment for the sort of thing that you're saying a half a century later can now 
roll into it literally and start to animate it or continue that project in some way. In that way, what I would suggest is, is that the right, the question would be, is that the right kind of model to make of the stall house? This very peculiar Pierre Koenig house in 1959. A classical architect like you guys would want to give us its form and shape and appearance. Your objects, I would think, would be extremely interested in seeing where the wiring is, where the glass is, where the steel is, and that becomes, in a way, the first iteration and in fact, the first instantiation of what this project is. I think it would start to place more of a demand on you all to start to model the world and even a case study house on your terms rather than the other way around, where you're trying to describe your project in relation to a bunch of dead architecture. This stuff is now historical preservation. It's not a, it's not a DRL project in the sense of what you guys are interested in, which is to bring force into the world. It seems like one of the first tests of the thesis would be, how do I convert existing models and ideas of what architecture is into something that's giving us literally the field that we now operate in? And then I think all of the comments that are being made about how this stuff does work, that that first stage of life in this pavilion couldn't do, like block the sun and the windows, et cetera, et cetera, starts to take on a real life of its own. Super interesting. I, I think to narrow it down even more, because it looks like a couple of the jobs are fairly loosely defined. I mean, I don't know if gathering balls on the edge of the bar is really a job. You know, it's got a nice decorative effect, but if the job were even narrower to say, actually, the one thing that a glass house never solved was the problem of controlling light going in and out, for you all to become 21st century drapery experts would be super, super narrow, but give you a kind of criteria to actually say whether the thing is working or not. It's gonna be really hard to ever claim that about the end of the bar and these little balls sort of tacked on the side of the counter. But the fact that the glass house, when it's introduced, never found a way to solve the drapery problem, for example, it was either in denial and simply like Koenig did, ignored it, or as Mies did in the 1920s, hired his partner to do all of the drapery out of fuzzy velvet, I think it was, in the 1920s, that we know wasn't quite what Mies' architecture was up to, that you, you bring in those two worlds together in the most specific terms is a really helpful leap. And I, I absolutely applaud the comments that were made earlier about give it a job and now defend whether it's doing that job right or wrong. And I think that's the really nice leap you make sort of at the end of the stage here. The question is, have I, I guess for you all to be thinking through, is have I defined that job clearly enough that we can actually say whether we're making progress on it or not? Um, I have kind of a similar comment. Uh, I think that the project, in a way, would benefit from mediating the what, what you think of as environment um, and, and what acts as a force or as a, or as a driving mechanism for your system. Um, mediating that with the architecture itself of the house um, and having the, 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 your, your own project be a sort of form of uh, exaggeration or form of uh, um, augmentation or um, manifestation of existing conditions in the house that actually do perform environmentally. Um, so for example, being more sensitive to the, to the different kind of features inside or the, or the partitions of the, of the facades or the structure, um, as, as mediators between the environment and the organization of the project. Uh, so that, that's one side. And the other side of, the, of what I would comment on is, is density and quantity. I think that the project, in a way, takes for granted a certain density and, uh, and quantity of material that, in a way, is still too normative. I mean, in a way, that, that's, what, that's the first, um, let's say, the first um, path in the route towards furniture, let's say, or what you can criticize as mere furniture. Um, and I think that if the project, the, mo the most interesting moments of the project is, is when, when the project, aside those, no? Is when the project becomes really packed with material. When, when you, or, or those areas, no? When, when the project, in a way, is, is so, um, is so uh, 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 excessive that it transforms the reality of the space of the house uh, out of its own excess. Uh, so I, I think in that sense, uh, it works too, too mildly, 
it's too domesticated right now. Uh, and in a way, what could make the project much more uh, transformative of, of, its, of its environment would be just dealing with more quantity. Um, uh, for me, I keep thinking when I'm looking at this model that there's really two things cohabitating this house. And it's something you don't really touch much on in the presentation, but uh, I think it's kind of a decentering of the human within the context of living. Like, as in you're saying that it's no longer a, a simply a human-focused building. It's a building that has these two entities or these two almost species cohabitating. And then the question would be that decentering, <coughs> is it there primarily to, to um, facilitate the human, so the human's still at the top of the chain in a humanistic way, and very anthropocentric, or is it post-human, where these two things are not, I'm not saying that they are against the human in a sense, like it's still trying to respect uh, and, and provide a good living environment for the human, but the human is no longer the only thing of concern, and that there is something else maybe at equal level in the hierarchy, a flat hierarchy, um, that is participating in what is the house. And, and if it were to be like that, I think it would become more interesting if you actually said, because at the moment I think they're maybe a bit too tame, you know, like they're, they're playing friendly and they're providing a certain uh, differentiation of space. Yes, they're regula regulating light and providing furniture and things, but these things are very subservient to the human. What if there were other aspects of the house that just needed to, for its own reason, to um, participate in something other than relating to the person. And I think, you know, even um, uh, um, Cedric Price and Gordon Pass <laughs> touched on that with the idea that the house could be bored and want to play. You know, so what would this house do when no one's at home? Like, first of all, I can see that half the space is occupied. You know, so there's already a kind of competition for space going on. Mm -hmm. I imagine, um, you know, when no one's home, like the whole floor is covered, you know, and something else is going on that maybe even the owner of the house doesn't even know. Mm -hmm. And then when the person comes home, there's maybe a bit of a struggle about who's occupying what space and for what reasons. I mean, there could be some really interesting things. So I, so I guess for me, um, the thing I would love to see in the thesis book is maybe a time lapse of a day and uh, some of these actors and what their intentions are. I mean, uh, those comments, like all the comments, I think are motivated in the right direction, which is it's, it's not about post-human or totally anthropocentric. It's about this kind of participatory co-living of almost two species, right? The, the claim is that there is a kind of new ecology, which is this relationship between humans and machines, and to move it into the world of behavior is to acknowledge, I think, all of these features, that it could be cute, it could be scary, it could challenge the relationship that we actually have with domesticity. We use the house as a playpen because in the beginning we did start with a kind of build our own house with these self bricks. But to shift the emphasis, I think, in terms of how people could actually engage these, what is the rules of engagement? Could I come home and every day my house actually offers a different way of thinking or living? If I want to actually completely dissolve my house, could all of these particles disappear? I mean, Ciro's point of excess, I think, becomes very interesting, not of its qualities of excess, but because the normative relationships that we have with the things themselves change. If it looks like a chair, it is a chair. Well, what if it's more of a landscape and it's formation oriented and it's changing while I'm occupying it? It changes the status of how I see or we see or how we interact. And I think that that actually opens up a, a moment of discovery that isn't part of the conversation, but should be. Because for example, each one of these particles has to have its own life cycle. In the 24 hours, it has to charge. It's going to move from areas. The ones that work a lot in labor will have a very different kind of time factor. And so to acknowledge all of these things cohabitating together, I think is also to take Brett's point to challenge actually the forms of representation that you're looking at. So we do have simplistic diagrams. They do work for a certain level. 
but how do you bring in the moment of time, the medium of change, and what actually motivates that? The particles have their own motivation, the humans will have their own. It will never be a one-to-one -one on demand correlation because to be honest with you, that's not interesting to begin with. But it's also impossible to do when you have a population of a million particles. So it's not advantageous and we can explore it in a different way and we should. I'm going to intercept him before it gets to Patrick. <laughs> it's always the most dangerous place to sit is between Patrick and a microphone. <laughs> but I'm going to go for it I for wait, a minute. Because if, if Theo is right, in fact, that this is work that's trying to forward our thinking about how we as human or organic entities in this environment are going to interact with all the inorganic stuff, my question would be, why do you all obsess in this studio and this program as much as you do on the technical considerations and not on the visionary speculation of what life is like in a house like this where the architecture doesn't just rearrange itself to block a bit of sun, but if I understand it right, it walks over and whacks me on the head to wake me up in the morning exactly. and to start the day. I think the idea that you so undervalue in this program speculation on the consequences to life itself to the point that it's really reduced to a couple of gray shadow figures standing around and posing next to a chair is to miss entirely where I think your levels of imagination can intersect and direct that future technical work. I have no doubt we could go out and hire the people that will rewire these balls ten times better next week if we want to. What we can't do, because no one yet has done it, is try and imagine, well, if we're building out of glass and steel, but a half a century letter with magnetic force built into it and electricity and charging, an interactive environment that will have consequences on how we live, why aren't we trying to visualize and speculate on that? Uh, no, you're not. I would argue that you absolutely aren't in a 16-month program that will spend almost all of its time wiring together prototypes for a ball moving in space, it's simply leaving not enough hours in the day to say, how do we live differently in an interior environment like this? I would say foreground it. I don't think it requires reinventing techniques of representation. You could do a graphic novel of life in this house and it would be a freak show. It could be the most ordinary graphic description, but it would be of a life that hasn't yet emerged that needs to be given form as much as the material itself. I would say go for it. I mean, you can't get it wrong, frankly, and Hollywood already has got 20 versions of this, we know, with different forms of budget, allowing us to visualize what that life is like. What would be interesting is from your discipline and from your perspective, what does it really do to the life of a mid-century modernist lifestyle that in my view looks like right now it's just got a different category of furniture and curtains around it. And that's really interesting work. I mean, it's a really interesting problem. And I do think it suggests... It's the, for the only work we should be working, doing on. And I think you're wonderful. Holy cow. And, and <laughs> you've just... No, I'm not, giving him, the, I, I'm not giving him the microphone. That's the manifesto All of right, parametrism. That's oh, the, no, it's not. Parametrism no, 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 no. 2.0. No. <laughs> no. 2.0 is precisely... This. I mean, I've, I've a thousand times endorsed what Brett was just saying. I didn't, I didn't see this coming. But we need to we need to make it explicit. We need to working on it. We need to develop the medium to explore it, to to, to, to home in on it. And, and, and iterated, that's my idea of life process modeling, and we are, we are starting. And we, it's true what Brad is saying. We have been focusing, over-focusing on the technical engineering aspect. This is for, for a long, long time we were gearing up. And I think that's precisely the important in the problem. Uh -huh. And I want to pick up the philosophical point about... All right, I'm giving you the no, microphone. No, 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 uh, about <laughs> this idea of post-humanism, <laughs> anti-humanism, and so on, and that we have now these two species in the space and so on. And I find it interesting, and I, I, I think there is an element where you, where, but also suggesting that a more dynamic, a more spontaneous, a more interactive and active uh, set of creatures, we have AI coming along, and that will shift a little bit our sensibility, how we treat these furnitures. They're, they're creatures we engage with, but also they might be learning, they might be, become unique creatures with their own history and experience and interaction uh, because we had that for 
while in the discourse, actually. And then we do have a different ethics relative to each other. But I don't think we can, I still the end game is human society with its, with its new players and, 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 the, and the life process enhancement. That's why we also respect each other. That's why we also respect heritage buildings. They become architectural actors. Me becomes more, more tangible. And for me, it's not the post-humanism. The, the anti-humanism thesis is precisely that who we are is up for grasps and will be pushed forward and will be developed. It's a Nietzschean thing of Superman, of ever-evolving man, which, which puts humanism into its place, which thinks of an eternal, essential set of criteria, which is still pervading architecture, and that we're pushing outside of. But it's, in the end, these machines will not be, have their own purposes. They will always be part of a symbiotic ecology of man, machine, and future man. And I think that's the way one we could discuss this forever, but I think what Brett just said is absolutely critical if we're trying to say these things. And it's not only here, but, but the discipline has to engage with and instrumentalize and bring these things forward. Very, very, very important. And, and I think this project, more than any others, is, is starting to do that and invites these kind of extrapolations. I agree with everything that was said. My only point is it's not a divorce between the technical and the speculative, that without the technical, there is no understanding. I mean, like, we could willfully visualize everything in the world, but at the same time, have no deep understanding of how that world would operate and how it would challenge us. Of course, this is in the world. It has to be in parallel. It has to be in parallel. And I say that because I know we, I know that there is this portrayal that we sit and play with wires and servos, and we do. And in doing that, I think that also sort of gives a proof of concept. These aren't the balls that are going to be wired that's going to change the world. And I agree. I think that also... I get, I, I get the desire for that. <laughs> and the then, desire, the necessity. Yeah, but totally, I get that. <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, without the sort of assumed uh, preoccupancy with the idea of space that we know, right? If these things will exhibit their own will and behavior, they will have to learn, and through interaction is the claim that I'm making, it does that. So it's through the relationship between these things and people in a container that's going to evolve over time that those behaviors are going to be exhibited. So they're not going to be... I, I, I really am, and I think everybody senses this. I'm, I'm just talking about this question of calibrating and balancing. On the one hand, the, the deep and super interesting technical speculation with a parallel course of speculation simply on what life will become like in these. And, the only difficulty I would have with your, with your um, expectation that we have to drive it through the technical is that it would be, in a way, reliving exactly 100 years ago in Mises' argument that it was only through working with glass and steel that we could figure out what modern architecture would become that would then allow these questions of modern lifestyle to go forward. He's countered that very soon after he starts doing these prototype pavilions is to say, actually, just knocking together very rough versions, and some of his were done out of plywood, not foam core, but the 1920s equivalent of it, simply so that we could have a space and then watch how people move around in it, was his attempt to try and rush along that problem of designing the lifestyle itself. And I would say, just in this kind of question of how you balance it in the studio, are there workshops, <coughs> are there sort of side excursions teams like this could do in which all of the technical focus can be balanced over towards that other kind of activity, which will probably be quite mundane and ordinary by comparison to magnetic wizardry, mm. but which I would argue you will bring an imagination to that will in turn become a driver for what that technical set of expectations might be. Uh, yeah, you know, but there are... That's all, it's a kind Sorry, of, and, and it just feels to me like that technical stuff, and uh, you know, look, I'm not gonna underestimate the you know, there weren't enough hours in the day for you guys to figure out how these magnets went together, and it's amazing. Absolutely amazing, but in most of your models, they're simply spheres being packed together. And that's fine, but, but to then speculate on what happens around all of that stuff would be super interesting. Uh, I think that, I mean, in a way, the, the technicality of the work has two, at least two levels. And I think one of the levels needs to be... Um, congratulated about, and the other one needs to be problematized. Uh, the level in which what you do is, is to control the behavior of the, of the relationship between the, the, the spheres, I think it's the one that, 
the, the, where, where the technicalities are amazing and, and it's one to be congratulated about. The, one, the, the level of technicality, which what you say is that those are um, arcs or domes or, and so on, I think it's a, the problematic level because uh, at that level, first of all, those are not those don't behave structurally well. Uh, second, they are much more than structural uh, organizations. Uh, and, and in a way, assessing more specifically what those uh, characters that you are building up could be, uh, and being quite technical about that as well, and constructing a language that goes beyond categories like cuteness or scariness or comicality, because those are also cliches. Uh, and we have also been saying those for, for quite a long time now. Uh, I, I think that, to me, what is, what is in a way challenging and also I'm, curious, I'm very curious about the project is what are the different paradigms of lifestyle that the project is trying to, to uh, construct and propose. And those would be the tools to, to, to say what those are uh, as different to, uh, or, or alternative to paradigms of elegance or spe spectacularity and so on that were embedded in this house to start with. So what are the, these new paradigms of lifestyle that require a certain management of, of excess, which is what you're doing, but now not, not in the forms of voids or, or emptiness or, or excess of space, but in the forms of excess of stuff. No? Uh, so what is the excess of stuff uh, directed towards in terms of um, forms of living, but in, in the sense of character, not in the sense of structural behavior? You know? Good afternoon. Uh, we are Patrick Schumacher Studio. Our name is Transpose. I'm Mariana. On my left side, I have Nico from Chile. On my right side, I have Juan from Colombia. This studio brief is developed with the high dense urban as the panoramic and the problematic uh, current scenario that architecture faces nowadays when dealing with a city that is densely growing in the center and with the tendency to grow in height and simultaneously the tendency to isolate different urban realities in these higher living spheres. With these high isolated clusters, urban navigation is compromised since parallel, uh, parallel realities run independently and they are alienated from the infrastructure on the urban side, obstructing urban dynamics or with urban panoramas that, that end up piling uh, buildings, claiming their own space and their own identities with uncorrelated uh, characters and clustering a denser area, obstructing the urban grounds. Current communications and dynamics demand a city that allows permeability and variety on the urban ground, and specifically flexibility and intercommunication inside the building themselves. For that reason, in this thesis, we are focused on the core of the skyscraper as an element that has the responsibility to deliver the building's navigation, the structural stability, and what we propose as a space that should allow the visual porosity and communication between the building's floor, the building's cluster, and the city itself. For that reason, we propose to explode the core of the outside of the building, allowing inner voids and unblocking the building navigation that travels around its own body, hybridizing program and introducing spa uh, spatial variety configuration. The city of London is the urban scenario. Oh, sorry. The city of London is the urban scenario for our design proposal, and this city. In this city, we are taking into consideration the predicted isolated skyscrapers that are isolated from the urban fabric and the current clusters of skyscrapers that have been developed on the east side of, of the city. On this note, this image shows what is now the city of London, representing the gherkin to the cheese crater and the range of heights that reach 300 meters high and show isolated elements and isolated entities in this, in this monoblock uh, system, mono-programmatic system. Our site is directly connected to this 
uh, cluster on the urban level and the city east skyline, giving us the possibility to connect them visually and with the urban ground. The site is framed by this variety of forces that we intend to connect, introducing variety and rule in horizontal urban interface and on a higher vertical interface, what we propose as an hybrid high-rise cluster. To deal with the need of variancy, we understand that to allow variancy, we also need to introduce rule. And for that reason, in our design proposal, in our design research, our main drivers are going to be focused on variety and rule in topology generation, in void research, introducing porosity that frames the city and frames the cluster itself, allowing for permeability, and uh, the end process, which is the topology, the topology dissection, extrapolating what is the structure inside of these topological outputs uh, with the voids inside. All right, to begin, we're going to talk about our first driver, which is topology optimization. The way we used it was essentially using it as a vector, as a vector field of forces, which allowed us to understand how they flow through a container. By placing supports and loads at different points of, um, of the container at different coordinates, you could understand how those forces flow through space. We did various catalogs which could potentially give us a variety in spatial conditions and from there understand the potential where this could lead. To do that, we went back to understand current skyscrapers and how they behave. Uh, we studied the Shanghai Tower as a, radi as a radial arrangement, the Burj Khalifa as a tripartite ar arrangement, and the Sears Tower as a linear distribution. And from there, we decided to basically take it out, explode it, explode the core to see what opportunities it could give us. These are um, various iterations of how the, that core could be taken out, and from there, we went into a catalog of supports that range from linear to radial, from radial to tripartite, and so on. So essentially, uh, this generates different conditions with very different spatial conditions that create um, specific geometric relations between them. After this, uh, as this was just like the basic, the basic starting conditions, we decided to introduce our second driver, which is the void. Uh, the void is essentially a negative space that is added to, to, our, to our studies and that allows the massing to change and the spatial conditions to get altered. What this also gives us is very different visual and physical connectivity throughout the building. We went and studied the ratios, the size, the way they were placed through the building, from porosity to mega atrium to top voids, from the John Portman Hyatt Hotel to the Sahadi City of Dreams. And with this, we started to introduce them into other studies of how that negative space dealt with the forces and how that branching, K condition, Y condition started to make the building change and shift along the vertical plane. Finally, we added a structural analysis and a topology dissection which gave us, as a third driver, uh, the level of complexity that we were looking for. It, the, this essentially gave us detail, and by iterations, it gave us an automatic bracing through, through which, we, which we worked with throughout the, the studies. What is interesting here is that you can start to see the dialogue between different types of voids, different types of either point or distributed loads through the building and how that makes from horizontal to vertical loads kind of like this dancing, coherent dialogue between different structures. We added this to pre-existing conditions in order to understand how to place the voids, where to place them, the ratios, what opportunities this led in a, um, in a practical way and how that, those could be abstracted into a building. So going back to our urban strategy, as we said, the site is framed by uh, these main roads, the Short East High Street and the Great Eastern Street, uh, opposed to um, more residential and 
weaker roads uh, as the Brick Lane or the Bethnal Road that, are, that seem to be uh, slightly disconnected from the west sides of, of East London. And the Shoreditch High Street station in the centre of the site was a main point for us to try and bridge north with south. For that reason, we uh, allocated the, the main nodes with an hierarchy. We used the same strategy of uh, attributing loads and an hierarchy for uh, points around the site. Uh, the red ones representing what we find as a possibility to introduce the bridging, the bridging strategy that disrupts these sites. And then uh, in this final output, we understood this hierarchy of uh, intermediate um, axis or radial that follows the train station on the north side. And some very um, softer uh, forces that connect what we have as uh, pre-existence on the on the right on the right side with arches with the rhythm that connect to the south with the bridging system also we rationalize these forces to the main axis and we use these main lines to generate what we call a magnetic field uh, introducing some convergency to the side some fluidity on one side and on the other side a more rigid rule that connects the arches to the south area uh, for volumetric uh, dispositions, we use we introduced four different options that were displaced according to heights, and they are they came from abstractions of our topology outputs. And an urban site was developed simultaneously to connect the north with the south and bring the um, the paths that we generated uh, before with uh, with with flows and forces. We decided for the option. Uh, four, that is the option that balances the heights between the buildings on the right and the buildings on the left and creates a very low uh, in height uh, level of buildings that frames the city um, that is on the back. On the floor, on the master plan, we decided to open up very public area to the main roads, the shortest high street, and the public area for the, for the train station that is in the middle and a semi-public that bridges with Brick Lane, a more residential and from market area, and the bridging system from uh, north area and south area. Um, these are the topological configurations that we selected for each tower, and they were selected on, uh, based on the fact that certain topologies allows us to create different densities of mass, but especially what kind of porosity these topologies gives us to frame the city and to define this cluster and the porosity between the cluster. So now these topologies are going through a process of dissection method, like Juan said, um, in this case, the, what we call the X-ray dissection, uh, structural analysis, the void generation, introducing the void in this dissection method and see how it behaves. And finally, the generation of a skeleton that comes as an output of the two, the two first put together. This is Tower 1. And Tower 1 comes from, as a starting point, the topology that deals with a uh, different geometric configuration from bottom and top. Uh, a bottom that is very linear and circular, and a top that has a double Y, and how the material flows uh, vertical from top and bottom will be dissected in a, um, a series of arrays. From these arrays, we run the, the, an X-ray system that is basically a feedback loop between um, running the first loop of top loads and bottom and bottom supports first iteration. A second iteration, we introduce what we call the turns to slabs, what will be a mechanical floors in the building, and we see the structure starting starting to branch, and trying to support these loads. The third iteration is a low resolution uh, of the tower, which will be the the, the flowing convergency and uh, between turns to slabs and, and what we can see as showing uh, the initial voids in the middle of this structure. And the last iteration, uh, with no voids inside still, uh, is the fourth feed-up loop between transfer, sl uh, transfer slabs and the software that uh, runs this uh, bottom-up system of gravity forces. This being uh, the main axial, uh, um, axial array of the tower, of the topology, we started putting uh, different catalogs of voids, but from the, catalog, the previous catalog, we introduced the bottom void for mega atriums, we introduced the medium void for porosity, and the top void to, to introduce a, a communication to the sky. 
And as the final one, we see a branching structure that um, rises up and opens a top uh, floor uh, wider than the bottom floor and frames the, the, the voids with this uh, branching system and, stru and structural identities. Uh, these are the, others, the other sections. This is how we dissect them with the same void condition. Next dissections. Every dissection runs the same feedback loop as the first dissection. And in the end of the day, we have a series of sections of skeletons that will be stitched by the main axial point, axial um, skeleton, with the same transfer, slur, uh, transfer slabs. And this is the final output of this tower. So for the next tower, uh, basically the process starts with a generic boundary and static condition that allocate the loads, which are the elements in red, uh, and the supports, which are the blue elements, according to a symmetrical convex and concave distribution. So basically, the, the result will be the base for the force line flows that we use the same. They can basically use the, the same uh, at the same location condition, but in the case instead of supports and loads condition, they turn themselves into repelling and attraction forces. So basically, these are the two elements that model the filling grind structure that came from the initial topology. So basically, the vertical force system is used to generate structure and space. Repellers and attraction forces design the skeleton, give it to, give it to it different spe special conditions, and like, depending on the charge, like positive or negative charge, will create a, a different type of void and a different orientation and how the internal structure kind of change according to these forces. So from this point, I mean, basically from the initial filigrane structure, uh, we basically apply different axes of symmetry for each skeleton negative and positive axis on X and Y uh, were applied in order to generate a, a range of structure with different axial variations. And the seed axis is, not, is, 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 is actually not affected in this process. Um, it's only affected by the previous attraction and repeller forces due to the top-bottom variations that shouldn't respond to symmetry according to uh, gravity conditions and like horizontal loads. So from that point, we generate an iteration catalog that basically it's composed of several iterations according to different heights, curvatures, uh, different internal spatial conditions and also concave and convection arrangement that evaluates what kind of skeleton have a higher degree of structural coherence, and also the bracing system, how it's influencing uh, the general structure and how the system is linked to the main structural nodes, which are the ones who is actually allowed the, the structure to have a structural coherence in the horizontal forces. So this is the, the, the skeleton that actually was selected, and the skeleton this is basically, the skeleton is uh, composed by a multi-layer system that generates generate a fast and direct link, links from bottom to top in the inside, which is basically the system, <clears throat> and a multi-directionality multi outer layer that links the tower according to a program vertically and a more complex branching lines that runs along the tower, then also respond to the program, that which we're going to explain later on. So the next tower has a similar process to the ones that Mariana present, which is basically a dissection of the different main axes. So basically, the study of conditions of the towers is like a, it's like from a wide arrangement in the top to a square arrangement in the bottom. And these are the main uh, axes that define the geometry. So each of these axes were running the same uh, feedback loop iterations of three times. So here you can compare like depends on how many iterations and how, many, uh, how high is the resolution, is the level of detail that you obtain from the structure detail. Uh, these are the different axes that we run in the geometry, and these axes later on are combined in uh, uh, link the, linking, linking the, structure, the main structure nodes according to the different densities that you can actually see in the, in the previous axis that I was showing before. So this is a final outcome with all the axes combined. 
uh, this is the final tower. It's actually also respond like the, the arrangement for a heavy thick bottom to a light filigree on the top, and also how the, the, the structure is arranged in, no, uh, in the central void, which is the element that structure the main building, and also like the they create the connections between the different axes, in this case, the winds of the building. And then Tower 4 have a different approach, which is basically a more geometrical approach, which is based, in this case, the voice was direct, directly generated by the result of the topological analysis. And the process to dissect the topology was to create a structure that framed the interior porosity um, void and the urban atrium void, which is basically we don't needed to do a second process because the, the voids were already generated. And we basically extrapolate the main nodes within the force field and the link to the position to, to the transfer slab, which is the elements that always link in the, the, the blue elements. Basically, those are the, the, the structural nodes which link this, uh, the, the bracing of the overall structure. And uh, basically from that point and go on, we rationalize the geometry of the component to generate the structure of the building. All right. Um, for Tower 5, we added forces at different levels. Uh, what we decided to do was share the same, uh, the same supports, but change the... Um, the petal arrangement in order to, co to create a binary relation from top to bottom. Uh, the heights change, but they all relate between each other to be able to create kind of like this cluster idea with, where they all have a share, like a, the same starting conditions, but at the top they, they have a diversity in heights. They also produce kind of like this node convergence of forces, so that can programmatically be used either as sky gardens, uh, sky lobbies, or just transfer slabs for circulation. Uh, here you see a node convergence of how local elevators can reach that point, while express elevators just go directly to the top. Um, this, at ground level, allows us to shift and change how uh, the elevators come up, where they stop, and how they branch. This is the simplest one. And from there, you see uh, an internal void of how it is created between the three different buildings. This leads us to our catalog of five towers where, you, where what we decided to do was to create transfer slabs of the same height to, to allow visual connectivity. Uh, at some points you can see that the, the top is larger than the bottom, which would allow, for example, a huge developer advantage for office spaces. Or, or more homogeneous to the right for residential spaces. This is all then added to the plan, which ranges from a very public west to a very private east. The idea is that commercial road um, has a much larger range of programs that can be added towards, while to the, uh, to the right or to the east, you can see that it's much more private, much more quiet. The idea here is to have us, uh, the overground track as the main driver to place the buildings. As they all have an interior void, we want the public to engage with them as they walk through the site. So as you are in the train station or walking across it, there is always that relationship between the building and the user experience. It's not just a statue on, the, on, on your side, but instead how do you engage with it and have a, a visual connectivity with it. Here you can see uh, at, in the east, which is at the left of this image, a very light and simple structure, while at the west, it introduces that complexity that I was talking about in order to make that shift, that programmatic shift, and that change in curvilinear structure that reflects uh, the changing program. In these elevations, you're able to see how we decided to make everything, make the tallest tower 330 meters. Um, so they basically close up the site while everything in the center is kind of more lively and framed by, the, by them too. Uh, you see that the transfer slabs and all the sky gardens are equally placed in the same point. So there is not a jungle 
of different species, but instead it's an ecology of towers that has an overall coherence from very from similar starting points, but then they lead into a very different type of product and product. The idea here is then you focus in the in the main public space, which is this one, the urban plaza, and how they relate to the rest of the city. The next step was to turn these skeletons into buildings, and for that we decided to bring our thesis of navigation and circulatory system transposed to the outside of the building, introducing the programmatic variants uh, that re is a result as this um, as an hybridization, the structure, the voice, and the floor plate radio ratios, and the facade resonances from these procedures. So now we are going to the navigation and programmatic variants. So as said, we decided that because circulation is run as codependent with the structure, uh, we mapped out a circulatory system inside of these skeletons and color map as double elevators in green or single elevators in purple. And these, um, these navigation system branches at the same time as the structure branches. So you can start with a battery of two elevators and end up with single elevators that reach a higher level at the top. So as we said, this is the tower one, the composition of, of structure, layer structure. So in this case, the, regal, um, the, the linear uh, element on the right side is opposed to the articulation of the layer three that is more complex and more fluid. And they are, live, they are dealing with different level of constraints. Uh, so the lifts travel in a different way from one layer to the other. In the more linear way, you have uh, bottom-up uh, elevators uh, that connect the urban ground to the top uh, programmatic area. And on the layer three, you have a more fluid um, structure uh, network. So the, these elevators basically travel around the building and they give the hybridization of the program inside of these buildings. This system goes from outside to the inside. So these elevators are not only traveling on the outside, but they are also shifting to the inside of this building always framing what we have as a center void. And as I said, programmatic variance is introduced by the level of complexity of this structure outside. From the transfer slabs that we um, dissect from the, the main inter uh, interstitial nodes, we could divide this tower into zones that are in a range between 90 meters high and 50 meters high. And from that point on, we have the, what we have, the sky lobby floor plates uh, that are on the transfer slabs. This is the main void. The circulation is run uh, framing this void of tower one. And this is tower two, also uh, divided into zones according to transfer slabs. This is how the floor plate runs. It's very constrained with the structure. So we decided to understand what kind of voids this topology gives us in the center. So for that reason, we introduced a strategy that attributes to the structure a charge, a specific charge. They, are, they converge to the inside, to the medium point of this floor plate. We introduce another element that is the void element that has a negative charge and repulses these lines. And they start making openings in the, in the slabs with different ratios. So uh, the void has the possibility to run different dimensions in height. Because the, um, because the inside is so constrained, we decide to run the circulation again on the sides of this tower. and opposing the section of the tower one and tower two. Uh, we introduced a slab system that was developed having in consideration the skeleton condition, the circulation, and the allocation of the voids, the size and, and allocation of the transfer slabs. So in, the, so in section one, the tower one, we introduced a different type of structural configuration that allows to introduce more variation between heights with what we call as a mushroom column and in section two, we decide to keep the main transfer slabs 
as a, as a, as the the main uh, elements that hang slabs between them. And the magnetic lights used as navigation uh, tools inside of these floor plates. So this is an overall uh, section of the, the arrangement. You can see that the transfer slabs are aligned and you can see that the voids run lively inside of these buildings, engaging with the city cluster creating a different reality inside of, the, of each tower and trying to reconnect these voids with the city. Between Tower 1 and Tower 3, we decided to allocate what we call the train station and this structure is codependent between them too. Yeah, so the train station is basically like an intermediate space between the two towers. And it's like a hybrid between what is like the urban development of the floor plan and also like the two towers. So he's basically, the train station is like the element that articulates the atrium, all the buildings, the void in the towers, the middle space between the, the urban space and the train station, and also like the, all the main atriums in the buildings that are allocated in the, um, in the axis uh, that runs over the train lines. So this is the, that was, was the central void of the, central, of the mid tower. For city interrelation and cluster interrelation, we decide to use an interplay of a plain white surface <coughs> and a very light structure that you can see through and introduce porosity between slabs and city. And in the end, we, we end up with a cluster that introduces variety for uh, potential growth of, of London and rule for them to relate and communicate under the same levels. That's all, thank you. Where's the... There's a microphone. Someone take the microphone? The... So now I'm gonna... I'm gonna... I'm gonna walk you through our models. This is our first models we did for a wiring network between structures. We decided to pinch little nodes to see what happens. And how these complex, complex situations start to arise when you put the transfer slots or, or pitching structural nodes. These are our initial topology optimization outputs. This is the overall arrangement of the towers on, uh, in site. These are our different towers from the filigram tower to the most geometric cluster tower. And this is the simulation of a behavior that could be um, that was done with the introduction of the of horizontal forces in a codependent structure between three towers, reading. These are is an arrangement uh, an arrangement of the two axes of the concrete towers, showing the branching system and the level of detail and thickness between the higher part and the bottom thicker part. These are topologies uh, based on the typolo typologies from the, the Y to an upper Y to see how regular is the height. This is a small uh, rough detail of what could be the void eating up the floor plates and what could be the structure framing this void and running elevators inside and what's the level of curvature to make this possible. This is a detail for what could be a canopy for the urban um, using the same branching system, the same pinching system. This was another detail for urban space and urban canopies. And this is uh, another scale for the detail of the circulatory system of branching elevators. And there's so. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Grüß dich. Tio. No, Tio. Pache. Um, thank you guys, that was great. Um, very thorough and professional. Um, so here's what I'd say. Um, I, I think this is a really interesting next step for uh, trying to figure out how to do parametricism at an urban scale without, turning it to, with, without creating a new homogeneity by accident. Um, so I understand what's going on, what you guys are working on, it makes sense to me. And it's kind of surprising, it's funny, that I, I like sitting next to, in front of this model in particular, which isn't so much about the structural stuff, but it's seeing the massing in the city um, and the, the radical differentiation you're getting in terms of the mass. I find to be um, the most powerful part of the project, actually. Um, how close you can put together radically different morphologies um, uh, that still have enough in common that you don't see them as a collage, uh, but different enough that you don't see them as being somehow repetitive. And it's, it's funny, I'm, I, uh, I kept wishing you guys would, and I thought you were going to go there at the very end, you were just wrapping up, but I kept wishing you would, you would contextualize this in terms of the, of the longer debate over the 20th century about, about, about these issues, density and homogeneity and, and uh, multifunctionality versus uh, uh, single functionality, like let's say in Le Corbusier's City for Three Million, right, where he, he lays out what the, what the future of the, of the city should look like. It should be buildings hovering above a green surface, all the same height and, and uh, lifting, lifting living off the ground to create a public space down below. Then you have, fast forward 50 years to 1979, you have Colin Rowe talking about the collage city, the exact opposite, which probably makes Patrick cringe, I could imagine. Um, but the, the collage city where it's like anything goes, um, uh, it, a city is basically a collection, a kind of private collector's collection of buildings. Similar to, I'd say Dubai would be a good model of a collage city. Um, or even, even parts of London. And um, this is somehow trying to, trying to split the difference, it seems like. It's trying to have just enough, just enough coherence that they seem connected visually. Um, and you're getting that through all of your studies with structure and infill between. Um, and then just enough difference that it, that it still has a tension to it between the towers. And I just, I, I, the only reason I'm laying that out is because I know you guys know all of this, but in terms of your rhetoric and the way that you talk about it, if you could like, you know, begin and end with the bigger ideas here, the, the really big ideas that are being dealt with, I think it would just, it would really behoove you. Because we got into the weeds there a little bit with talking about all the, the transfer slabs and all the stuff. Th that's not really the significance of your project, I don't think. I think anyway... Yeah. You get it without mentioning a single word. The, the kind of things we're saying is we're saying all semesters. So the, the yeah. creation of that. Yes, no, it's here. <laughs> it's so it, it's, it's here, it's here. But, but, but my critique, though, is to you guys about the way you talk about your work. Because I don't believe that the transfer slabs are going to be there, the engineer's going to put them somewhere else. Like, all that stuff's going to change, even, and all your, your curvy elevators following the strands, I think there's still going to be maybe a core. I don't know. A lot of stuff will change, but, but the basic idea is, where this, is, is the strength of the thing. So, um, so I guess, even in terms of, and I'll, I'll be stopping in a minute, but even in terms of what you represent and how you do, like, I don't know if I needed, like, 50... Um, images of exoskeletons, but to see a little bit, like, I'd like to see more about the plans, and you guys did touch on that. You started talking about how um, the developer model of having all of these different um, types of plan shapes and how it would relate to different kinds of functionality and offer a variety there in terms of, like, a, you know, a leasing model or whatever, because this is a fun, this, this significant, significantly changes the way that you can lease, lease buildings, and it offers, I mean, it offers to a city, I mean, uh, on all other levels than just formal and structural, it offers a way forward. So, so, but you did talk about that, which was great. Um, so I would have, I don't know, and I, I, I want to jam one more thing in there too that it's, it seemed like really important for this, is this is definitely resonating with uh, Greg's, Greg Lynn's work on families um, and, and um, uh, Darcy Thompson, going all the way back to Darcy Thompson, which I know you guys have looked at. So uh, um, in, in the sense that there's radical difference, like if we were to cut a plan through all of those at once, there's radical difference, but you can still tell that there, that there are variations of something and that they're not all just, just completely different. So 
Um, my final comment is to just Patrick. Um, I, I, I still, I, I'm not sure that, um, I still feel like there's, there's too much homogeneity. Absolutely. Actually, there's both too much homogeneity and too much heterogeneity. Sounds like a paradox. No, 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 I know what you mean. It's yeah. a double zooming up. And yeah. That's been the discourse and the struggle. And of course, the, um, the various processes of delivering the complexity we had to also work with. Right. Because that's where you get coherency also within a tower and its internal variations. And I think there's so many discourses missing that, and, and as you go wrap around, you would want to have variation which come out of facade that have been developed. Um, but yeah, you put your finger on that discourse of having a unity cr cross difference of a complex variegated order which, which lives off heterogeneity and this kind of multi-species ecology paradigm. I think it's a, it's a tough one and you go by first going diverse and then having various mechanism and overlays and transformations which unify across this diversity. And I agree with you that there's too much homogeneity in the overall here. And we've discussed that. So where's color, for instance? Where is that not, uh, where is it all white? Why is it all glossy? Because yeah, exactly. in, in each iteration, you, would, you, would, you could bring in new ideas of and a different characterizing, for instance, tectonics out of the materialization, which because they're already homogeneous, you could further differentiate within and across towers, et cetera. I think yeah, one, you, one other way you could differentiate, I agree about the but facades, it, but you could also differentiate them by beginning to uh, completely obfuscate the structure. That I don't yeah. think that, I think the structure is too, it's, it's, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, and it it's too present in all of them when we equally. we discussed out of all the studies, when I finally said, bring the six candidates out, we discussed them in terms of the most diverse characters out of all the research up to there were just selected. There wasn't another rational at play, for me anyway. So I think a vision in terms of presentation that one would have understood or, or grasped that we can directly, explicitly talk about these formal, compositional, articulatory uh, um, uh, problematics. These are the problems which I've worked with through. Of course, at the same time, using structural logics, using environmental differentiation, that's where we differ. I'm saying we have that, where, where I want to um, use what I call tectonic articulation. So I'll take all these systems, all these engineering logics for granted, and, and we, we are proud that we can have deliver and, and deliver the most sophisticated structures. And the differentiation works for us because structure inherently optimization wants differentiation. But then to say that's ultimately hand, we hand it over to engineers and they're in charge and confirming. And now we are working with this as, a, as a something which we use to, to create that sense of visual intensity, but also a sense of navigable uh, complexity, understood complexity. And precisely in the terms you're talking about is a degree of uh, unity across difference. And I think this is, there are many, many mechanisms. One simple is this aligning of primary strata across all that diversity. That's a very, very simple one. Mm -hmm. And we also looked at making diverse because there's a cluster which looks, uh, nearly fuses into one block from one angle. It pulls into two blocks from another. It creates a kind of C-shaped frame for another. So we also kept looking for, uh, again, diversity of silhouette, diversity of alignment, of re-affiliation. And what you haven't done enough, and I think, is blend that into the context of the skyline. So the skyline discourse was a little bit under elaborate in this case. But I mean, we can talk forever about this. <laughs> Maybe see what I, somebody else has to say. I think sometimes the, com the confusion maybe on the aesthetic quality of the project is because we look at animation that they are all white. I think sometimes we really get mislead. So they, they, sometimes the confusion between homogeneity of differences is actually we're not really seeing the design. I mean, we are, you know, I think it's important to uh, try maybe to see what will be the material, what will be the color, uh, what are the quality of the spaces. So then we understand much more how each tower is different. Then another point for me, I think it's important to challenge much more the, uh, the circulation. I think now is a bit straightforward. Uh, if I read this, the project more as a part of a city, I don't understand why I need to arrive from underground and going up. You know, I think we can question much more how this, uh, 
this project is completely autonomous from the city. Maybe I just arrive by helicopter, arrive in one tower, I live in one tower, and I work in another tower, and then I don't really need to go into the city. I might go one time every month. So I think we need as well to go some time to really question, do we constantly need the old city when we do a project in the city? And I think that for me is still an, an open question. I will question much more as well, what are the connections between the towers and horizontal circulation, not only constant vertical? And uh, to carry on the conversation from where, where it's been taken already, I think there's, there's factors that you're m missing out which would already differentiate. So the next level of filigree that you get when you add in the uses, when you add in uh, when something's a hotel room and that uh, layering that you'll get behind the structure. I agree that the structure is too prevalent in, in all of these and you could alter that a bit. But I think when you add that next layer, it will also add a level of differentiation. I think also... Uh, uh, a bit more of a reflection of the context at ground level will create... Uh, a lot of these are symmetrical at the base, and I think actually when you have a real site, you have variation around what you're trying to interact with, whether that's obstructions like the railway or whether that's circulation routes, and you could use that to generate some differentiation at that base and differentiation of form which would follow up through the structure once you put those into your models. Uh, and also with, at a higher level with the skyline around, looking at contextualizing that and whether the, where you put mass in there, which won't necessarily relate to where you put density at the base. But I think uh, it's a, a great piece of work. Other than that, it's, it shows a really interesting, uh, diverse arrangement of uh, configurations from, from very similar, uh, different principles, but giving a, a real uh, identity to the area. Thanks for uh, your project. It's really, um, really just. I really, uh, I can tell you have spent um, a lot of time, a lot of thinking in terms of, especially, why do we need such a superimposed um, height onto the city, um, and also in terms of the structure. So, so uh, whether there is this transcendence, which has uh, a sense of uh, hollowness and void, the lightness. Um, that is completely anti-substantial um, um, and, and solid. It's light, it uh, aspires to the skylight, uh, but also aspires to, as uh, you were saying, you can reach it, you don't need the city. It's completely, it's almost uh, imposed upon. And for me, I would like you to talk more about what kind of spectacularity uh, maybe reflect a bit what kind, uh, more about the spectacular quality of these transparencies that are no glass, that are no steel, uh, but have some kind of um, transparency. Uh, and what does that mean in terms of uh, uh, expression, aesthetic expression of uh, a kind of post, post neoliberal mode of power where um, the, you know, uh, structures are not just um, an invention, are, are culturally embedded in some kind of um, ideology as well. Yeah. I mean, just uh, to add a couple of comments. I think for me where the project works most is when you treat the conditions really prototypically. So for example, when you treat the horizontal datum between the structure and the slab, you invent a kind of way of negotiating that with these kind of structuring lines that somehow need to deal with the expansion of the cantilever, how it's actually connecting to all of those things. At that scale, I think you start to develop some language, but I would almost think that you have to conceptualize the same thing, let's say, to the ground. When I look at from the top of the towers, looking down the top roof plan of the landscape, there are some qualities to that. When I'm sitting in front of the section, I wish to see some of those multi-scalar kind of transitions to actually happen. So you have some moments of bridging, but it's not about making a bridge. It's about that category that you can somehow parametricize in a way that really starts to stitch together these discrete objects within the city and in the skyline and start to make it kind of operate because I think the ground is really where this thing really tries to negotiate with the city. The skyline, I think it's part of a vocabulary of a skyline as we know, but I think in terms of how it becomes an interface and how a lot of this other kind of communicative aspects, that aspect was very much present in your phase one 
in your phase two and the way that you've been setting up the argument, it's more about these kind of multi-authored distinctions between towers instead of the thing that gives us really strong synthesis. So I, I would just encourage you to continue that kind of vocabulary and to try to imagine what that actually means on the street level, because you don't really have a traditional ground like street enters the building. You actually have three, four stories, if not five or six, that actually all become these kind of transition zones. And if it is to be a kind of an autonomous island within the city, then the rules of the game could be so radically different. So I think that that also is a way of, you know, because beyond the prototype, it actually now is becoming an applied moment within the fabric. And I think that you should really talk about this. I think if the previous, let's say, presentation, the conversation became about the thematics, the possibilities, the potential, the, the kind of creative friction that these kind of projects have, I think your project would benefit actually to really interrogate it next to now all of those things that you basically were referencing, like how is this sort of attacking Vignoli? And if not, it should. Because fundamentally, you're from a different generation. You're obviously working within a certain topology, but at the same time, you have to fundamentally eradicate it as that being the only solution to basically give some legitimacy to the need for actually exploring this, right? The vitality of this thing, I think, is present, but it remains, I think, something that is a little bit distant. So it, maybe it's because it's white, maybe it's a lot of these things, but actually it's fundamentally just you guys giving us those moments of discovery. So I see it more into the transitional elements than the ones that you explicitly state. And for your document, I would really expect you to, now going through this and seeing it, give us a window into those curiosities that maybe are assumed on our part, we don't discover it, or the scales are so different, we don't have that heightened sensitivity to it. I think these are the things that you should really try to give us uh, more legibility on. Yeah. I just want to come back. I mean, I think the book is an important vehicle to maybe to tell the story once more, more in the terms of you introduce enough and kind of we actually made decisions together. Uh, but And I haven't seen it for the last three, four weeks. Uh, but for instance, when there was a moment where we had what on many levels could be interesting, the connections across. They asymmetrize the structure. They, uh, they also make sense in terms of networking and, and migrating of users. But w there was a stage in the project where all of these towers were stitched together. And why I intervened at that point and said no, because then we, we just assuming to be one building, one mass, one homogeneous entity. And I wanted to, that's why I cut through and say, hey, then we don't longer le see the characters. And that there's a tenuous assemblage from one view of things coming together from others falling apart, but I thought one could still have had at least one layer or some bridges coming in and coming off, so you do can, the, the, the act of seeing unity across differences and different types of unities from different perspectives, this was a discourse. So we actually need, and I realize, you know, more headlines, I can't guarantee that these decision criteria are picked up, why we took, why, why the bridges were kind of, criticized and what we were actually aiming for uh, in terms of giving personality and identity back to these towers and there are still differences here. Why was the color asked to come in uh, where you can now draw, uh, you know, always even said a certain horizontal line change radically materially on a horizontal line. Suddenly that unifies radically across and dissects the tower. These are the kind of thing, what belongs together? Where are the unities and subunities? They're not collage city. And I think what, what, what um, Tom said is very, very critical and important in terms of the history, where we're we coming from. Uh, the way Corp uh, established the city, actually radically different districts, but within them totally repetitive and homogenous, they weren't confronting each other. And then in the, in the, in the kind of college of freeing all this and having indiscriminate agglomerations and we're criticizing this. I mean, the project is fantastic. There's a lot of these things ongoing and a lot of suggestions I've mentioned would have with the theme, with the headline, and um, that's, I have to I have to criticize myself that it isn't enough and, to, and one has to maybe uh, uh, work more uh, sharply in terms of making these themes come through and I think they're all there and it's, 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 it's very sophisticated on many levels and, 
and somehow the, the utilization of engineering logics, which are interesting because they're differentiating logics now, always. At the same time, there are principles which you cohere, they differentiate according to rules, so they also unify. So at the same time, as I said, the dialectic of development is differentiating and maybe have also new ontologies radically juxtaposed, so you peak, pull apart and then you correlate or unify enough means, and in the end you get something which is, is very, very sophisticated. And that a lot of these steps have been taken. It would be nice to retrace them, and the problematics are primarily formal articulatory, but of course when behind that is a subtext of, of making phenomenologically palpable the complexity and then when at that point program comes together comes in you know if, if this tower works programmatically somehow together then you see there's a unity if and where it, and if a cross tower programmatic synthesis happening place then you show the affiliation because the hotel <clears throat> next to that office building is the business hotel for that office building etc i think when it comes to one point on the voids and I, haven't, uh, I was not expecting that they're all exteriors. I'm quite curious. They're becoming, they're, I was expecting them to be interiors and be more um, uh, com uh, communicative and, 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 and have that porosity as, as spaces. And I think for, in terms of the visuals, to have more views, uh, eye-level views from uh, in these sky double and triple height spaces across towers would be interesting. Maybe not with, the, with, with certain, and you can play also with the, with the, with the lens condition where these things fuse and you have horizontal spaces across towers with or with bridges. So I think, there's, I think is, this is for me the essence of the project, what we're trying to achieve, what we're trying to struggle at. And I think there's, it's, it's, I mean, this is great. Yeah, I think, yeah, we need one, the voice over as well. Yeah, but I, I think that there's probably one thing for you, actually not for the students. Because you don't want this to be total design, builded by one author, but they, yes, this is the intention. I think the rules, I mean, these are almost like chess pieces, but the game has to be played over time. And then the real transition is actually you make a move, how is that negotiated? I just mean it more like you play the game and try to understand actually what the rules of the game are every time you introduce a new character, because at the moment, if it falls within a kind of traditional master planning and we all overly burden, let's say, the differentiation between tower or tower, we're identifying distinctions of the piece itself, but not of the game. And I think if you see the city as something that is so time-based, contingent, economical, social, all of these different things, by nature of it, the seed of the character differentiation is there. But how that materializes and when the next piece actually moves and how that's negotiated, I think that that's one aspect of the studio that should emerge because it's the time dependency of that that basically then offers you, let's say, more strategic things, right? So you may have certain techniques, and that maybe that's what I'm asking for. You have certain techniques that have potentially different scales and relationships to negotiate, but what they would mean is not necessarily just full bridging or not bridging, full one building or not. It's just actually how do you negotiate a variety of different characters, like he's stating, when it's a theater? And you know, how does the story really evolve every time you introduce a new villain into this story? I think this is something that you should consider. Because otherwise it's traditional master planning, no matter how, how we try it, unless we really can talk about that it becomes on, on, on the aspect of like time-based design or like as a strategy, I think perhaps it would be useful to look at other disciplines that create uh, variation and uh, but yet not being homogenous from the point of view of like game design, for example, you don't want people to be bored. Uh, some game like uh, No Man's Sky or something that like you know they produce quintillion planets. And how do they produce that? Like it's not all designed at one go. Like it's based on the player, and like as the player plays, uh, the planets are being designed somehow. Like so, in some sense, like time might be a very useful uh, design driver to create uh, the the kind of uh, unity across uh, heterogeneous um, um, fabric. Let's say. Maybe that's where it should go. Okay. Shall we? Yeah. Last closing comment. 
Okay, well, this isn't going to be a good closing <laughs> comment. I think I already gave my closing comment, but um, I was just thinking that I was just trying to re revise your presentation in my head and like what it could, you know, if you were going to present it to different kinds of stakeholders in a project like this. And I was thinking that I, I agree completely about the, you, you need the strategy sheet, you know, and that's got to have to do with like the, pro, the developer pro forma and the plan layout and all of that stuff. I was earlier asking, and, and Patrick reiterated again, like I'm, I think it's important to have the relevance sheet and the relevance establishes this in terms of the arc of the discipline of architecture, the relevance sheet. And then, then I think um, also just to talk about zoning regulations and how they might also be um, implicated here because I think like in terms of even, I think the, the, the nearness, we haven't really talked about this, but the nearness of the towers seems very, very important for it to work. For them to be on this little island that you called it, Theo, I think it's super important that they're near. And if you have a degree of, of variability and if the building code is able to also be tuned to what's going on programmatically or whatever on each of these towers, it may allow you to not have these universal zoning regulations in terms of daylighting or whatever it is that, that are part of the reason why we have so many, so, so much homogeneity in cities because you have equal setbacks or equal sun requirements, daylight, daylighting requirements or whatever else. So I just think that to really flesh this thing out, because you guys do have a chance now, like if there could just be a little bit more material on that whole side of it. Um, it would be it would be really convincing and very powerful um, in terms of you know imagining you know the, the the world now being developed as these little city states and then even once they're built um, do, is this a municipality is this a governmental is this some kind of entity is it does it have some kind of independence you know it it it, ha it brings up all kinds of other issues you know in terms of being a city state or a city within a city so uh, this is where I think the project is really is really flying right now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're Team Slinkybot uh, in the Spiropolis Design Lab. Um, I'd like to first start by describing... <laughs> Sorry? Okay. Okay. <laughs> good afternoon again. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to first start by explaining that our system, the Slinky Bot, is a behavioral, autonomous, self-assembly and self-aware design system. It aims to provide an alternative approach for living that extends, that extends on the ideas of materially and geometrically elastic and endless ever-evolving architecture. It is specifically important to our team that the Slinky Bots are companions in the house and are emotive and have the independent life cycle that are intertwined with the human, uh, creating an environment that grows and adapts with its user. We're also experimenting within dwelling because we believe it's like the most private and the most thing that can be like adaptable. Uh, we are just describing basis of what is self-assembly. It's a unit-based system, which is also time-based. Uh, made of autonomous units that are mobile and can communicate and can self-organize. Uh, we were specifically uh, inspired by uh, like the uh, ant behavior and um, uh, the, the idea of having local rules that uh, provide complexity and also uh, self-awareness and self uh, and self, uh, the struggle, how the chair can assemble by communication. The Raphael or the Andrea. Uh, also, we were inspired by the emotive aspect uh, uh, of the idea of a self-assembly system that can respond to human behavior, uh, the petting zoo. 
And since we were uh, uh, like researching within the context of housing, uh, we looked into uh, the endless house. We were basically we were specifically inspired by the idea of elastic space, continuity, and uh, the idea of ever evolving uh, spaces. We were also inspired by the lightness and the adaptable features of um, of the uh, house Rooker example uh, and how they were lightweight and pneumatic. And since we're, uh, as part of the human machine ecologies brief, the case study houses were analyzed based on their ideas of technological advancements, uh, specifically in context and materiality. So uh, we are trying to um, uh, re reinterpret these original values within our self-assembly system. Uh, so we were, uh, we believe that our system is time-based and that as time passes, the complexity of the system increases, leading to an endless, uh, uh, to an ever-evolving process. And that, because we believe that, the human and the, the unit are co codependent entities. And this is why we present it as, um, we present the system complexity that, uh, that increases with time. As, uh, with, along with the human life cycle. Um, so to be more specific, like we have short term, we have short term time and long term time, and we analyze how when first the unit is born, it, it, it first starts to experience its capabilities and then uh, becomes adaptable to human with time and then becomes responsive to the environment and overall become reconfigurable. So to sum up, uh, our system is a polyscalar uh, system, which has it, which initiates from the lowest level, uh, which of organization, which is the unit scale, and then uh, they become more complex and they create taxonomies which respond to the human, and finally they create more uh, liv livable and reconfigurable spaces. Okay, when a unit is deployed in a space, the first thing it does is try to explore uh, its basic capabilities. Uh, one of the main capabilities of any self-assembly system is the capability of mobility. The Slinky Bot is able to move with a mono wheel that allows it to roll. Basically, the mono wheel is a two-part wheel uh, that is um, uh, moved by servo motors. And we try to uh, take this into uh, a physical manifestation and see how uh, these wheel, this wheel can give different um, mobility to the unit. So when the two parts of the wheel are moving in the same direction, it allows the unit to move forward. And when they have different speeds, they, it allows it to change orientation. Another important aspect for us was the uh, ability of the unit to transform from a, a compact state to an extended one. Uh, because every state gives different qualities to the unit. So basically, um, okay, so also another important aspect of the unit is its ability to communicate with other units uh, to kind of demonstrate some behavior such as a leader and the following units and to also perform some collective behavior such as collective mobility. But in order for a unit to perform any collective uh, behavior, it needs to have the ability to connect to other units. Therefore, some connection points were developed and some sensors were used for the units to be able to signal to each other its readiness to connect to another one. So why does the unit need to communicate? As I said, one of the aspects is for the unit to know when it's ready to connect to another one. Another one is to know when it's ready to climb and also to share energy or have some kind of collective uh, behaviors. Another important aspect of communication is that the unit needs to understand its context and be able to analyze it to kind of perform uh, some uh, tasks and like take potential of the space it's in. With SlinkyBot, it's able to analyze uh, some um, metallic structures and kind of use them to its advantage and start climbing on it. Another form of climbing is a unit-based one, where the units depend on each other and work collectively to have strategies to go up. 
We tried to test some of those uh, strategies, basically using some electromagnets that is capable of attaching to metallic structures and using some choreography of the extendable part and the sequence of the electromagnets of when to release and when to attach. Another important aspect of uh, climbing or going up is the capability of a unit to pick up another unit. Since this strategy using the extended form kind of makes the assembly more time efficient and also energy saving. It's important for us to understand the limitations of our unit and its bending capabilities. So we also took that into consideration when we per perform our organizational strategies. Uh, one of our uh, basic organizational strategies is the ability of the unit to stack. Uh, in this organization, the unit uh, uses its, both its compact state and its uh, extended state to work in hybridity. So after the unit understands its basic capabilities and establishes a communication with other units and its environment, it needs to understand uh, and recognize the human and to be able to respond to its functional and comfort requirements. So therefore, some basic clustering and uh, can be formed, and some basic uh, extensions, vertical extensions, can start creating different seating landscapes with ver various levels of elasticity for the human. Basically, we see this idea as, as something that responds to the human ergonomics and kind of respond to its contouring and to offer it comfort. The system is also capable of uh, accommodating different numbers of occupancies and uh, offer them individual personalized preferences for their interior landscapes. But in order to do that, we need to understand that a single unit needs to have two important aspects, the ability to be soft and also a certain extension mechanism that is uh, responds to our concept. Softness is uh, very important within our system. Uh, we need the unit to be able to transform from something that is rigid and structural to something that is soft and kind of more human sensitive. So we used a range of inflatable pockets to kind of uh, test that. Um, another important aspect is the extension. First, we tried to have some initial tests using uh, mechanical strategies of how we can control these extensions and how we can contract it and fully extend it. How, <clears throat> sorry. Um, we tried to put that into a prototype where it had uh, the extendable piece had three control points controlled by servo motors. And it, this basically the control points are strings that are being pulled by the motors to perform contraction. And when they are released and by the help of some springs, the unit is able to uh, extend again. However, this mechanical approach did not give us the fluidity that our system requires. Therefore, we started looking into more inflatables and pneumatic systems where they offer more softness and freedom of bending. So we developed a muscle segment, which is made of different muscles. Uh, certain muscles are responsible for the extensions, while other ones are responsible for the bending. Here, the core muscle that is responsible for the extension is inflating and deflating. While in those tests, we tested the, bend, the directional muscles using different materials. We first tried with silicon. However, it did not give us the kind of control that we needed. Therefore, another uh, material such as uh, latex were uh, experimented with in terms of the directional muscles. This gave us a bit more control and rigidity over those muscles. However, in the end, we decided to go for polyurethane for the directional muscles and silicone for the core muscles. Since, since this combination gave us the softness in the interior and still gave us some control over directionality. We applied this in a, a new prototype where we merged those uh, muscle segments uh, uh, with in between them some rigid frames and we, um, uh, we basically put it in its uh, skin and its soft skin. 
The unit uh, was capable of performing uh, basic extensions and also using the directional muscles, it was able to have every side like turn and be bend in different directions. Uh, it was time for us to kind of test this in a more collective uh, format. So we wanted to see how um, those popping up strategies can work collaboratively according to our simulations to accommodate the human in different uh, functional landscapes to create like fluid surfaces. Uh, it's important to also notice that our unit can uh, I can recognize when it's dark and when the when it's nighttime. So the units start migrating from the ground to the ceiling to create some functional lights for the users inside the house. There are different functional lighting uh, strategies uh, that our unit can uh, uh, deploy, uh, and meanwhile they can also uh, sense the human uh, as the human is passing. Another important aspect is that uh, our units should be able to recognize where they are not needed anymore and be deployed in areas where, uh, for example, certain daily sleeping patterns are known and to provide the certain functional landscapes that the human might need in that space. Okay, so um, beyond the basic configurations, we're using the particle spring system in order to, as a communicational model for our, uh, for our uh, self-assembly system, uh, where basically the particle is our unit and uh, the springs are our uh, connections and possible communications. We explore uh, various uh, central uh, central connections versus the radial connections, uh, which give different uh, uh, approaches in uh, assembly. We also uh, explore a hybrid of both these systems. Um, we have so finally we have identified the three main rules rule sets which bring out the meaningful connections, uh, which vary from the the linear and the radial rule, which creates various patterns. So by varying the density and the, and the simple topologies and the state of the unit, we, we started creating different, um, we started creating different catalogs of interesting configurations. We have identified that the system works, uh, can work, can, has more potential as a body plan. And we started experimenting with different uh, uh, different closed state versus open state to utilize the potential of the of the dual state, and we have uh, uh, compared this uh, with uh, different uh, densities uh, and uh, and also different states. And then we we've tried to utilize the idea that the unit can go uh, uh, works best with gravity. So we started uh, applying the gravity to the system in order to identify the different uh, taxonomies that we could achieve. We also started varying the different boundaries and, and we've, we've had like a d different uh, conditions and taxonomies. And so like these were what some of our, this was a catalog of the different uh, taxonomies which we're working with gravity. And then we, this, we, we looked into taxonomies that can work against gravity where the units would pop up uh, similar to the uh, simple behavior. Finally, to uh, translating it into the daily scenario of the human, we took one of the taxonomies and uh, we started creating different uh, functional space and lighting. Uh, they create the taxonomies and the taxonomies start conveying different material complexity. They start twisting and also um, a twisting to provide different ambience, to provide uh, different uh, lighting. They, they can also have the peristalsis, which provides like a different setup around the, the human. And, and it also communicates a different language to the user. They also can light up to provide different ambience within the, along with the human. We have done some different uh, softness studies to the singular taxonomy in order to identify potentials of, of different spaces within the house. 
we have also uh, uh, explored uh, how choreograph choreographed bending can be like um, something which is interesting and uh, user engaging. And we have uh, tested it in a physical world. And then we have to, we started going into higher population with the radial taxonomies the, that created various behaviors in different enclosures. Um, and it is important to to note that as time passes, the slinky bot gain more knowledge that they collect from the human and the context, and they become more sensitive to different requirements, and they become more interactive. So it was very important that they start to interact with the human and they start lighting up. They start realizing that uh, there are different user groups within the house, and these were... Uh, and they also start, uh, yeah, they start creating different ground taxonomies which are more user engaging. And also, uh, they, with all the different materiality, they can start to create uh, different configurations which can also interact with the... <laughs> and um, these, these uh, ground taxonomies were created by very simple ideas of either stacking or or by just different uh, uh, expandable, uh, different elongated units connecting together to create these simple taxonomies. Uh, we've cr also created like a catalog of these different taxonomies which can be user engaging within the house. It is also important to know that like with time they start caring for the human and like start protecting the baby from like uh, if, the, if they'll hit a chair and they start to become more like emotive. Uh, sorry. They also, um, they also can start, uh, sorry. Okay, yeah, they start detecting that uh, they can start also not only engaging with the structure or only with the, but they can also start um, using the existing structure and shuffling it for the human, uh, if for the human needs. They can have like synchronized, uh, extend, uh, synchronized bending in order to be able to move furniture around. Um, finally, like w beyond the beyond just the com physical communication, the they can communicate with the human uh, through uh, the the human's telephone, where they can recognize the sleeping pattern, the heart rate, and uh, where the where the human is, the location in order to assemble, and the uh, the light and the what time of day it is. And therefore, when leading units sense the human as target, they can come towards people while attracting other units to form clusters, except for popping up to create seating area. By performing as groups, they are able to connect and build spatial configuration. As cluster, it also uh, uses neighbor number as the criteria for its taxonomy type. The density setting for cluster decide what type of a cluster it will be, and different type of cluster will result in different configurations. The setting would come Sorry. The setting with compact on the edge will lead to a dome, and the setting with compact in the middle will lead to a cantilever structure, and the setting with compact in the both the edge and the middle will lead to a double arch uh, structure. And the radio cluster will provide a clear grade for the overall configuration, while the linear cluster will provide a more fluid configuration. Also, when in large density of the configuration, the height of the spatial organization will be lower. And when clusters with different topology are combined together, uh, we, can create, uh, we can create more configurations. And the leading units on the ceiling will treat the furniture on the ground as their target point to create lighting for a human. And when more people, and when more people, 
gathered together, more clusters will come towards human to enlarge the enclosure space. And if a human changes position, the clusters are able to go back to the ground and in a compact state and migrate to where the human is and provide a produced enclosure again. Within the 24 hour time, our units are able to generate different kinds of configurations according to multiple conditions. Uh, in the morning, uh, they can create a small space for the host to rest. Or at dusk, they are able to provide a multiple party space if the host has a group uh, to, uh, of guests in the house. And in the night, they will climb, uh, the unit will climb onto the ceiling and uh, create lighting for the house. Uh, the units are also able to do the expand house by create canopies in the yard. Uh, according to different conditions, those clusters will generate a semi-outdoor space with different heights and sizes. It can provide an independent canopy in the yard, or it can be the extension of the house. Uh, it can be the extension of the house part of the IMSA. Uh, also, the units have the capability to collect energy from, uh, from the sun, but in summer, um, the energy collection is more efficient than that in winter. Unit, it needs less time to get maximum energy uh, related to the configurations in the house. In the enclosure in summer is higher span and less dense to allow for openness and uh, ventilation. So basically to conclude, we've seen how our system works along the hours of the day and also on, uh, on spans like monthly spans and seasonal changes with environment changes. But we also see our system along the years to be something that is in continuous reconfiguration and changing to uh, according to the surrounding and also most importantly adapting to the human and creating a more developed symbiotic relationship with them and becoming more lifelike and codependent with them thank you very much I talk through here, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, so here, our first model is basically one of our ground conditions, which is a collaborative behavior of vertical popping up to create more fun uh, functional uh, furniture landscapes. And over here, we have uh, uh, one of our developed prototypes uh, with the pneumatic system and the different segmentation of the muscles using silicone and polyurethane pockets. And these are our initial mechanical tests of uh, basic rolling and basic climbing. And over here we have our Eames house, which is our selected uh, case study house that we chose to intervene in. And our system is basically creating different ground, uh, ground configurations using the same pop-up uh, technique and also radial taxonomies uh, along the, ce uh, the ceiling to uh, create different lighting situations. Here are the initial tests of the different uh, muscle segments of the uh, composite muscles, the orientational ones and the core ones, uh, and the different materials such as the silicon and the latex and the polyurethane. These were more uh, extendable studies of uh, mechanical uh, approaches of how we can control an extendable using three control points and uh, a motor, three motors. And these are also some initial tests of extendable and how they can uh, kind of collapse completely and extend and using different kinds of hinging and things like that. And yeah, that's basically it. Thank you. <laughs> I think 
we just need to sign. Thank you very much for showing us this amazing project. Uh, it's very um, inspiring to see um, how much you thought in terms of uh, how these things can move. I mean, we saw before magnetic field, and now we're seeing pneumatics. Um, it's interesting how the idea of mobility of um, enters the, the, the kind of um, interaction. So we know that for, for cybernetics, and the, the application of cybernetics to, to space has always been about um, a, the ability of creating something that responds, that is responsive and that, um, uh, adaptive uh, and is not um, rule-based, but is actually adapted to, um, to, to the environment in terms of um, sensory motor actuator or sensory motor ac activity. So um, I'm thinking about um, how this, um, this kind of interaction and this kind of adap adaptability to, uh, to, to, to space, a bit like, as what we said before, and to the human or the circulation of, of activity in, in the house can, um, um, can be on one end understood, as you said, ergonomically, so they are forcing also the human to adapt. So I wonder in terms of agency, where is the agency here? Uh, is, is, you, you could argue that there is, um, um, there is an adaptability of the system to the human behavior, but you can also argue that um, the human, human behavior is conditioned by the capacity of uh, these agents to be adapted to them. So you could argue it's a symbio symbiotic relation, but you could also argue it's a codependence, but you could also argue that there is another set of uh, hierarchical intelligences that have to be spelled out. Um, and, and again, what is interesting is this kind of um, uh, changes completely the landscape, the, the imagination of a, of a room or an inter interior space having all these hanging uh, little machines that um, are intrusive, perhaps. They are not just, you know, their adaptation is also to say, we are here, we, we govern the space, uh, we make sure you don't hurt yourself, we make sure you wake up, we make sure that you don't have too much light. There is this kind of uh, capacity of technology to care for the human, and to what extent this is really um, going to happen and what kind of uh, implication it has. But in terms of um, spatiality, is, um, it, completely, it completely changes the, the volume inside, you know, so there is a kind of envelope continuously hovering over the human, which is a bit, uh, could be a bit, um, yeah, overwhelming, uh, intrusive, yes. Anyone else? You want to respond? No? Patrick? <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, congratulations, it's, 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 a, it's again a great project. And I think, um, let's say, in this, this round of experiments with this, in terms of the focus of hum interaction with the human figure and situations, and uh, yes, this dialectic of, 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 of inspiring human behavior, or following, that needs to be teased out. I mean, the particulars of the, the various ranges of, of investigations and the plausibility of them and the compellingness of them can be debated, of course. Uh, maybe it is, is, is overly obtrusive, maybe it isn't clear what, uh, how productive it is and what one is meant to do under these kind of shell-like conditions. So that, that, I guess, needs a bit of, needs some editing, clearly. And uh, there, were, there were those uh, situations which were, become much more natural and I find them, find them elegant and, and plausible. I wanted to also historicize. You started with historization that contrast between the, let's say, this case study house or the corp house and certain organic attachments. That's one historical lineage. But I think what is more important when I see this is the late 60s, early 70s soft furniture world, where suddenly these typologies break down and you have stuff, you have these kind of soft beanbag 
you have the super wave and reconfigurability not act self-actuating, but with valency and things snap into different configuration. A little bit like the magnetic studies was interesting when you played with your hands and you made these components. So I think there could be something, and we discussed a number of times, the excessiveness of having these sophisticated robots being at the same time the whole volume of, of uh, creating these scapes to challenge this and, and allow for really things to be pushed around. You have your leader follow, following distinction in the, uh, with labels, but not yet with respect to capacity really understood. Uh, the, the agency could be less and so on. I mean, that's something uh, uh, which we can't get right uh, and plausible in all respects with this. So just for me, inspiring to see that the problem is post much more succinctly and much more plausible and effectively, I think. Also in respect to what Brett was saying last time around, before lunch, that problem is now on the table and we're working on inventing these live processes, querying how architecture and these new capacities of architecture gain agency and spontaneity and what the response would be. We can just elaborate and work on it. We should work on it more. We need to turn the, the human figure into agents and rule-based agents, etc. So I think that's, that's, for me, the encouraging thing. Not the particulars. The particulars, are, it's nice that there are certain funny and charming things that the baby occurs and that, that's, that, that, that lighting is a big element, and I appreciate that. Uh, but, but, of course, each individual situation is highly, highly criticizable. And that, one, one last point is, uh, can, we, can we once more query... The, uh, the necessity of um, one and only one element to generate all this. Uh, you explore all this, for instance, maybe this one in the end, in the final analysis, is, is maybe just a lighting system, a mobile migratory lighting system, uh, because I don't believe, you know, maybe because it's not credible as carrying and lifting the human body, how nice this is. <laughs> As, so so that, that's for me the editing comes in uh, at a certain point. And, and then from project to project uh, to, to see, to see uh, a more focused, I think Bertha said earlier as well, when we talked about the shading and screening operations, um, I mean, there is something which is, let's say, perhaps in a don't like to use that phrase, naive to presume the universal element. It's a bit like the Waxman's universal joints, where we have so different capacities we're evolving. It's nice that, that there's degrees of reconfigurability and maybe also multiple capacities to some extent, but there's this kind of sense of maybe wanting to do too much, although I like the fact that it is already has disburdened itself from a lot of exterior enveloping and structuration. But can we experiment with even sharper focusing? That's just editing. Once you've done the browsing, which is absolutely necessary because we don't, we don't know ahead of um, the process what, what such systems will bring up. And I like the fact that, for instance, you have that in the interim, you have that whole panel here, which is pure um, configurational logics, repertoire building. We don't know what this it will deliver when you start, and then you come up with this, which is kind of semi-plausible, but, so I, I condone that as a process, but in the final project, uh, we need to maybe make a certain cut and say, this is process exploration, speculation, and this is an edited, mature offering. I think what is great about the project is that you show how the system can allow for different uh, possibility of different configuration. The problem is when we see them all together, it can become, it can be misinterpreted like we, that we have too much technology. You know, it's the same, in the same way like when you get a phone and you download too many applications, then you, you, know, you remove the application. So I think sometimes if when we see everything happening in one space, it can, see, it can look like overwhelming. I think you, are, you should uh, present it much more or, uh, uh, or show it as a separate possibility than uh, a user can choose to have only a specific type of unit that have a specific type of behavior. So I think that's one thing. 
uh, still, I think then you need to question what does it mean for the for the house, like. What is the consequences of the house? How do we how do we, we use the house? So in a way, like one way could be that the lighting become important. When you were when you were showing the uh, all the, the the scenario, I thought maybe the sound would be important. Like what does it mean if the house is used by 10, 15, 20 people? Does the system allow to create different type of buffer, for example? So I think you need to you need to question now what happened to the house. How do we inhabit it? And not to just leave it as a different scenarios. Hey, uh, I got so intrigued in your project when you started showing these things that I thought were city plans. And I think it's that sheet across from Patrick way down there. I can't, I can't see it from here. Um, I'm not sure if those, if those were intended to be these things extending extremely far or what those were exactly, but it, it, and, and then I don't know what happened here when it started to become kind of like spatial. But, but I guess um, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I get intrigued when I think of these things at different scales. Like I like them really small when they're lights. And then I, I like, I don't know, these ones across from me, I imagine it could even be larger. It could be something a lar like a larger robot that would help you move packages or move things around the house. And um, I, guess, I guess I kind of just want to agree with, with Patrick on the, the, the idea that you would have a universal um, robot or tool that would, that would do everything uh, sort of around the house. I think maybe that's not... That's not the era. Like maybe the era is in massive scale differences between bots and uh, assuming that we're living with bots. Like already making that assumption that you guys are asking us to 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 you know to go along with you on. But like just the idea that there would be a range of things with different capabilities, but limited capabilities, and not as you say continuous, endless, and ever evolving. But maybe semi evolving towards a certain like like. Not quite AIs, I forget what the term is called, but like a sort of, um, there's a term for something that's almost an AI, but not quite, like a verging on AI. Um, and then different scales of those things. And I think it would be more plausible because I just, I, I feel like th this thing is some, I don't know, it, it just seems, I, it just seems a little bit implausible to me right now, these guys. Like I don't know what they're doing there, for instance. Um, they're, they're charming and they're funny. But uh, but it's like when they start to become structure, or other things. I I just I don't I don't buy it as much. So, but I think that the um, some of the animation that you had of these early things, the early pneumatic structures, just awesome. This thing, the way it would start to spin and change and change directions, like tank treads. I think you have that you have like within many of these studies and the the black the black um, uh, uh, bladders. You have a, it's like you have pieces of, of technology, each of which could do a range of things really well and then not do everything very well. And, and I just wonder if there isn't, if there aren't maybe like three or four different projects within, within this thing that would have led to, a, 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 I don't know, a more, a more differentiated, scale differentiated and use, and use differentiated set of little bots that you live with, you know? I mean, um... With, with respect to, let's say, like the, let's call it like the issue of scale. I think the way that we've tried to approach this is that scale is probably not the criteria that we're evaluating, but we're trying to, let's say, not do like the universal thing because the thing itself changes. So the idea of taxonomy for us is that we would build complexities, but then those complexities have to be like explicitly clear. I think where the project is really strong is when it's very constrained and it has a certain kind of identification of actually what it is, its goal, and it gives you variations on achieving that. Where it doesn't, I think where it falls short is when it becomes this stuff, like the structuring of space, because in a way the organization doesn't necessarily coincide with actually the behavior that is being argued through that, where in the other ones, it's more plausible because more explicit in some way. It's simpler and you kind of get an understanding of population relative to actually what it's being asked to do. And I think it just gives a, a richness to it through the simplicity of that. And the attention of choreography then I think is also something where it actually becomes very added as value 
because it gives us a way of signaling how these things could actually be dynamic and changing and at the same time not necessarily just exhibit fear or these other kinds of, uh, let's say, emotive variables. I do think that also like the house, when it, when it comes to deploying these things in an interior, their migratory aspect I think is something that you guys should explore a little bit more. Like I think it is kind of interesting when they swarm together, but it's not interesting when they swarm together around the guy who just walked in the house. I think one of the things where you started to set up the diagram of the time scales, there's the daily scale, but then there's this thing evolving over time. So I could come home and every day I come home to a different house. Or every time I move from one room to another, these things actually could be reflexive and reactive and identify a certain economy of their distribution and magnify the ambience and the atmospheric aspect. This model in particular, the big one I think, has been like fully jungled out. While when you guys first started to put the stuff in, what was really interesting is that the atmosphere aspect of its illumination was much more a space-making device than the physicality of the actual glowworms. And I think that that's also something that you can discover. You make a model like this and you can treat it like a dollhouse and you could really start to use it as a tool to identify potentially actually what is the real medium. Is it the physicality of the thing itself or is it the atmosphere that's created around that where light could actually be a meaningful space-making tool? At least in its night scenario, it seems to be more convincing. Um, when Patrick says the thing comes down and it swallows up the person like a Venus flytrap, I mean... I actually thought that that was probably the one moment where space making in your world kind of was interesting. Not necessarily if it's plausible, but actually really radically created a suspension space like a Thomas Saraceno world, which I think could very much fit into this kind of, kind of strategy. So I, I think it's not fully resolved. I do think it's much more prototype specific and I do think that there's an editing that has to happen but I think what you choose to communicate I think is really important. What I commend you on is actually really taking a certain accountability of the human agency in it but I think it's just the beginning of this. I, I really do think that if these things evolve with us then of course we're going to have tendencies and behavioral attributes and every one of these things could potentially evolve their own personalities and characteristics. The question is actually, if we have that capacity, actually how does that really radically transform the way that we actually operate within that environment? If it is just like we do things, and it's coming to you, Brett, don't worry. Then I think it would be an interesting way to speculate about actually what that would be, because I'm not really sure what we know, but once we have it in front of us and we see it, we can actually play with that and then try to figure out how that would be different actually for each of us. I was gonna say to, to um, uh, on that front, and one of the things I'd really, really applaud in the project is that, um, and it seems quite, quite a deliberate move, and I'd like you to say something about it, but one of the most spectacular consequences to your architecture, this sort of strange, swarming, slinky stuff, is that it scares away everything else from the interior. Like it's gone. And I don't think that's, except for the world's last Eames chair, <laughs> literally the last remnant of what we used to think of as the interior. And I promise you, your worms or slinkies will eat that very quickly. And you've even got a video of, it, of them moving it around, like they're trying to get it out of the house. And I would say rather than treat that as a kind of time management issue that I haven't sort of put some of the rest of that architecture in, it seems in a way the instinct is also that, it, that this future lives that we're going to be living and that in fact many of us might already be living in your architecture is in part about the dispersal of all of that stuff from the 20th century that's now just clutter. Like the, Marie, the extreme Marie Kondo you know, de decluttering of our lives, man, you are there. You know, and I think that, and you could say, well, that's just, you know, that's not possible. Like, we still need a toilet or something, you know. We probably do, but you probably got a backyard and people will take care of themselves. And, you know, if I need to eat, Uber Eats will bring the food to me. That thing we used to call a kitchen, like, I would push it to the other extreme to give it a job to now do everything. And so, for example, all I've got to do to solve most of those other problems is make sure I've got really good 5G Wi-Fi inside one of these balls. 
That links me to the world in such a way that the interior is no longer this thing I depend upon in a 20th century model of it serving the world, becoming my inner world, but it's simply now the platform for me to try and figure out what I'm gonna do. You know, and in a way, it, it also then plugs into all kinds of social movements that are now questioning amongst a generation of DRL and other students today what it is we build around ourselves as our inner domestic lives. And you know, one of the compelling features, you could say, of the thesis of everyday life from the early 20th, 20th century forward is that that revolution starts at the scale of the domestic interior. It's where, it's where Lefebvre weirdly says his idea of the everyday life appears. The battle is fought with the media in our inner worlds. It's fought with our technologies. What's great is yours has just wiped it out. And, and, and that shouldn't be an accident by focusing on all of the attention on these weird little worms that are hanging from the ceiling, but rather an argument about what space really has become today, which is a kind of interface to all of that stuff outside the object. I mean, I don't think it's an accident that three of your animals are trying to escape. And you're the first one to show it that way. This poor guy right in front of me, those two, which are almost, you know, they're like the Shawshank Redemption version. They've found a way to, and you've even got a family here that are sneaking off the platform here. And I think in a way, what, that's, what it is recording is that if your thesis is right, that thing we used to call the distinction between the interior and the outer is completely gone. It's totally eradicated, you know? In the same sense that you've done a lot of this project by sitting in front of screens over in the studio and linking to various technologies that have given you all of the forms of expertise to do this project. And as you, I guess as you wrap the project up now as a sort of thesis statement, it should have a bigger argument behind it for what it can actually deliver despite all of the sort of functional questions we might ask about the objects. And I would say really go for it. And then it's not a speculation to come, it's a statement about where we might be right now, and then consider where that plays out in the immediate future. Be great. And I think they will escape, by the way. I think it seems insane in your world that I wouldn't put a couple of these in the car with me when I do go to work at some point. Because they'll then be able to talk to these guys and keep track of what's going on, and frankly, they don't care whether I'm at work or I'm at home, they're still doing whatever it is they're gonna do but that you can start to challenge all of these architectural habits that makes us think that our world has to happen only inside this glass box where they happen to be at this stage or at this moment in the day. Maybe. Uh, can I? No, I, I mean, in a way, I like the, the, the agenda of them being able to escape, but uh, at the same time, I felt that in the project there were two moments that were, in a way, conflicting with one another, and uh, one is the capability of these things to roll, and the other one is their capability to reach, and um, to me, the agenda of reaching, reaching is, is an interesting one in the project. Uh, it, wouldn't be, it would be interesting to... To, and in that context, it would be interesting to establish a platform that, from where uh, things are reached uh, and, and a purpose of reaching as well. Um, and, uh, and I think that kind of reducing the agenda of adaptability to mostly to reach or to remoteness in the control of space would be favorable for the project to have more, more of a qualitative stance. Um, Secondly, and in that context, I think that what is missing in the project is humor. And, um, and in a way, there is a lot of humor in the, in the objects and very little humor in your presentation or in the way you, you talk about the project. Um, and so I think that in, in the same way as we were talking about other projects, uh, as that, as behavior, uh, in a way, not only being able to achieve goals, but also to do, to do that with a certain uh, grace. Uh, I think that what, what to me is, uh, would be interesting to, to understand and to explore would be the, the, the different ways in which this thing behaves or, or contorts or, or reaches or curves uh, in terms of its capability to produce a humoristic situation.
Good evening. We are Yen, Gosselman, and Pallavi, and we're from the uh, Shaji Bushin studio, and we're going to present our project, Dark Matter. Um, the studio uh, expresses interest in the impact of human-machine symbiosis in the integration of design and construction technology with architecture. This is to be explored by revisiting the Mason Domino, a radical diagram of a system which has had a lasting impact on architecture. Spatial additive manufacturing, minimizing the need for external scaffolding systems using the robotic arm has been suggested. Architecture is deeply informed by existing social and cu cultural situations. Changes in architecture can be traced back to cultural shifts and technological advancement. The post-World War I housing crisis triggered the creation of Corbusier's Maison Domino, a popular diagram of a standardized housing system. The growing popularity of concrete-framed structures, as well as Ford's moving assembly line, influenced the architect's vision of an industrially standardized construction system. The model was a diagram which resolves structural conditions and also showcase its potential to open up into a wide range of architectural applications. The simplicity of the diagram along with the efficiency of concrete works is reflected in individual projects as well as major cityscapes all around the world. However, fabrication technology has advanced a great deal in the last century. The assembly line has evolved into a fully automated line in the manufacturing industry. Industrial automation is also being used in construction in Japan and other countries since the 1970s. In recent years, large-scale 3D printing is being explored, such as the 3D print canal house by uh, the US architects in Amsterdam. Besides technological advancement, the world is faced with an unprecedented population growth which shows no signs of slowing down. Urban centers around the world are faced with a high influx of population. This simultaneously impacts the built environment, and we can see urban centers around the world growing, showing a tremendous amount of change in a relatively short time span. Smaller cities have grown rapidly, and this is clear when we see the growing footprints of some of these cities. Therefore, in addition to the key aspects of mass production, automation, variation, and growth, which is all already portrayed by the Maison Domino, we have, identif uh, we have identified um, the need for adaptability, materiality, and fabrication technology in order for the system to evolve. The built environment can exhibit adaptability if it allows for the growth and change according to certain pretexts. This is to be explored through novel material studies as well as fabrication processes. Needs for homes and communities change over time and we would like to showcase this system through housing as a social context. We would like to focus on London in order to propose an urban housing scenario. As we can see, London has grown tremendously in the last century, which is when the domino diagram was conceived. The rise in population in London is much higher than the number of available households, and the housing supply is much lesser than the proje projected need for housing. Studies show that social renting, where individuals or a group of people rent rooms, is rather popular. This makes a good case for the creation of more co-living projects in London, where sizes of rooms are reduced, but more amenities and shared spaces are introduced, thus making the quality of lives in cities more convenient and fulfilling. Such projects are already being undertaken in the city, We've also studied a few projects which cater to co-living. This is Share House located in Tokyo. This building accommodates 11 individuals. The interesting feature of this project is the positioning of shared spaces between the private spaces. Also, the shared spaces grow vertically, thereby creating a social core within the building. The next project is a collective's new proposal in London. This project is entirely different in scale, but notice how the shared spaces are isolated to a few floors. The last project is a conceptual project called the Sharing Tower by Golart Architects. This project makes an interesting case for shared spaces on, uh, as each floor plate of the residential tower is customized to the user group. Along with the idea of shared spaces, we draw inspiration from the configurability and variation that can be offered by prefabricated systems, as in Habitat 67, which initially had 158 units but has reduced to 146 since some apartments joined and reconfigured to create large spaces. Keeping these ideas in mind, we are interested in packing strategies using intersections as a primary operation for planning and form finding.
The notion of intersection in spherical forms can be observed in, nat in many natural systems. Plant cells, bubbles, and foam formation all display this phenomenon. We'll start with the material system. Um, since the brief states the use of minimal supports, our initial ideas revolved around ways to temporarily suspend gravity, drawing inspiration from material processes by artist Jolan van der Weyl, where he employs the use of industrial scale magnets to create his artwork. We decided to investigate different types of compositions which led to the creation of a composite magnetic material. A composite magnetic material system also gives the added advantage of fiber orientation in a high resolution. The composite material consists of a binding agent and a metal additive. We experimented with plastic cement and clay for binders and iron powder, filings, and fiber. Initial material tests investigated drying time, sculpability, viscosity, and hardness, showing that cement and plastic with iron filings had the highest potential. Our first experiment, uh, experiments were with a mixture of iron filings and rapid drying cement. The first extrusion test was between a still and a moving magnet. This process resulted in a narrow cross-section in the middle of the extruded member due to the stretching of the extruded material. For the next experiment, we set a, a fixed distance to avoid stretching. This resulted in a better and more even cross-section throughout the extruded member. The next tests were to explore the possibility of scaling up. A first set of extrusions made between the fixed length and an upper magnet was moved up in order for the second extrusions to be made. The result was poor since there was not enough magnetic force between the two opposites in order to anchor this in place. And also, the cement came apart since it couldn't fuse. So we moved on to explore the ferroplastic mixture. We used a combination of two plastics, Coolmorph, which melts at 40 degrees, and Polymorph, which melts at 60 degrees Celsius. The two are used in a 1 is to 2 ratio with two-part iron filings. The plastic melts in hot water and gives a sticky mixture with the iron filings. The first test was to make sure that two separate extrusions can be used. The, the nodes on two members were heated and successfully fused together. Ferroplastic comes with a great advantage of a high degree of sculpability. This feature allows us to shape the extrusions and thus develop a high degree of detail elicited by magnetic forces due to the nature of the material. This is the resulting component. So we did a bunch of such tests. For the next test, we made physical contact with the material and pulled the extruded member. This resulted in the creation of a third node. We then moved on to double extrusions where we used two magnets to pull the material in opposite directions. This resulted in the creation of a surface-like member. The surface has some transparency and the orientation of fibers within the material is evident. Pulling with two magnets also results in the creation of two new nodes. This is the same process, but this was done at an angle which resulted in a minimal surface, um, which was quite interesting and which is something we've capitalized on after. Uh, this is a resultant component. We also tried um, triple extrusion tests just to see the capacity of um, the modules that we could create. This one was with done without any contact and it created a little hollow space between the three angle sticks. Then based on magnetic forces and our observations, we developed a code to simulate material behavior, which helped us predict the possible outcomes of different members of extrusions with varying arrangements of magnets. We then went on to develop a physical cat catalog of members based on this information. The next step was to see what happens when these charges are placed, stacked in order to see potential growth of the system. Based on this, we went on to develop a detailed physical prototype. This prototype spans 1.3 meters. It consists of four types of components. Two are made up of sticks while two are surfaces. The sticks and nodes form the base of the structure while the surfaces and nodes form the span. The prototype also informs us of the basic elements within the system, which are sticks, nodes, and surfaces. 
In order to improve and strengthen connecting nodes, we decided to create joints. The first type of joint we tried was a basic uh, male-female joint. The end plates were modified in order to accommodate the form of the joints. This proved to be successful uh, attempt, so the members can be joined in the single position. Next, taking from joint uh, in the human body, we attempt the ball in sake joint. This also proved to be successful with an ad, um, advantage of rotation, which gave the same members more degree of freedom in terms of positioning and fixing. Generative methods of uh, creating networks were studied via code, where intersecting volumes of half ellipsoids carry a charge and attract particles in order to form the point cloud and the resulting network. The distance between the points depends on the number of forces with the codes. Uh, these forces are uh, traction, repulsion, collision into particle, and gravitational forces. Furthermore, um, we introduce basic transformation operations in order to aid the form finding process. Rotation, mirroring, and scaling are used um, beside, the inter sorry, beside the intersection process. And uh, the resulting networks vary where, uh, when their operations are performed. This video shows the uh, generation of the network with a decreasing number of branches from each node, keeping the length at the constant 30 centimeter. And this video shows the generation of, sorry. This video shows the uh, generation of the network with an increase in the dense segment while the branches keep um, constant. This study result in the catalog, which demonstrate the density and transparency the network is capable of generating. And uh, these are a few reference images uh, for the surface strategies we are inter interested in exploring. The surface component tend to form curved and minimal surface, which gives them the scale-like quality. The first surface study involves the integration of the surface into the structural uh, system. This allows uh, for a rather seamless stick and skin system uh, where one is not separate from the other. The surface uh, is formed within the same nodal network, thus tying it together with the stick system. The stick and surface module bend away from each other and connect to adjacent stick or surface modules uh, respectively. Some nodes of the surface module are left free when uh, where they can uh, bifurcate. Uh, this triangulate spaces between the network is subdivided into three quads in order to develop uh, stick and surface components, which are then pulled in opposite directions. Um, this surface study explores the potential uh, of purely structural surface, where in no stick are uh, present. This study involves the interlocking of alternate um, modules into one another, which provides the structure with a high degree of rigidity and strength. This is uh, the network showing the fixed, uh, fixed and moving magnet at each node point. A resultant surface is created, which is then interlocked and fused. The next surface study is also based only on the surface module. Um, in this study, the modules were overlapped at varying uh, distances in different rows, thereby producing different arrangements as a uh, structural growth. The open spaces between the modules increase in size as the structure grows due to the decreasing overlap between modules. The network diagram shows the fixed and moving magnets at each uh, node point. This surface study consistent, uh, consists of three different size uh, surfaces which allow for overlapping in the low area and no to no connection as it displays. We also worked on the automation of the fabrication process. Our initial robotic studies were to identify the parameters affecting the extrusion and shaping process. These parameters consist of speed, cooling time, pauses during extrusion process, temperature, and the viscosity of the material. We used a KUKA 
which has a minimum of two meters reach. The automation was divided into two parts, the component fabrication and the assembly sequence. The component fabrication consists of an extruder mounted on the sixth axis and a mag magnetic jig which shapes the extru extrusions with the required components. The extrusion, extrusion process was automated with the use of an air compressor. The canister is filled with hot material and a piston push due to air pressure extrudes a material. The magnetic module fabricator is a device which helps the fabrication of different components. The first prototype of the fabricator consists of two fixed magnets and two switchable release magnets which are moved with the help of a linear actuator. Here, the magnet pulls a single extrusion to form a two-pronged component. Here, the magnet pulls a, a double extrusion to form the surface. This is an attempt at creating a standardized machine with multiple magnets. This machine would be able to produce multiple variations of the components depending upon the type of extrusion. This is an initial attempt at fabrication of a component. As mentioned earlier, the temperature plays an important role and in this case, the material was too hot, warm which resulted in sagging. The assembly part of the fabrication process uses a magnet end effector to pick up and place the components in the correct position. The bottom node of each component is heated first and then put in place in order to ensure that the nodes are fused together. The end effector in this case consists of an electromagnet. This magnet can be switched on when the component is being picked up and can be switched off once the component has been placed in position. The assembly shows the magnetic gripper picking and placing components after heating the bottom face in order to fuse the material. The accuracy of the heights of the components directly affects the process and we face problems when stacking the second layer due to the same. The overall setup would consist a bank of component fabricator with one robot extruding and the other picking and placing the components. The manufacturing of the prefab units is limited to the scale of the robotic reach. In, uh, in prototype part, uh, the form finding process for the prototype followed the logic of intersection of half ellipsoids to eventually form the double layer surface. A diagram was generated on both surfaces and corresponding nodes were joined. Upon dividing uh, these nodes, the network for the sticks and nodes was formed. Positions of um, fixed and moving magnets was assigned to the node on the diagram. In order for ease of fabrication, which was done manually in this case, a waffle diagram uh, was prepared which helped isolating the fabrication of each component within the diagram. We also explore possible surface strategies for the prototype. These studies cons uh, consist of uh, double and triple extrusion and pole surfaces. A smaller section of the gen generated uh, prototype has been translated into the physical world. This model is 1.7 meter wide and 1.6 meter tall. The fabrication of each component was done within the waffle structure for ease of accuracy. The extrusions between fixed magnets were pulled into correct positions with moving magnets. Once the components were fabricated, the nodes were heated and fused together. The joint helps strengthen the node and also uh, locks the component in the correct position. After the assembly of the sticks and nodes, the surface were created. This is a double extrusion, a pole 
uh, on two sides, while this is the three pole extrusion pole on three sides. And these are a few images of the prototype without and with the surfaces. So now that we have identified the various components and details of the system, we can take these aspects of the system and translate it into the architectural scale. In order to demonstrate how the system works, we can see the design process from user-based activities, which are then covered with, which are then packed with ellipsoids from where the, the network's generated. They're going to give the surface from the network. In plan, you can see how um, different activities happen in different spaces and the intersections form these spaces. And depending on the nature of the activity, we generate different um, porosities uh, for the network, which controls the degree of privacy of each space. So these are a few examples of the kind of spaces we were looking at where we could, min we could change um, the same space to provide different functions. These are initial studies for the same, and how uh, a space could be, uh, could be switched to uh, accommodate different um, uses over time. So in order to demonstrate um, our system, we chose a hypothetical site um, in central London. A typical condition of a terraced house unit has been selected in to be replaced with a new material fabrication system. In order to contextualize um, living and working, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So in order to contextualize this um, and show the form finding process, we first identify the site, um, and then we first uh, then we uh, assign activities to different spaces. Naturally, the ground floors are more public, and as you go up, you have dwelling spaces. Um, then we created um, the volumes that would be covering these spaces. Um, you'd have uh, double story heights covering more public spaces or circulation areas. And we perform a Boolean function in order to get the intersections and the result in volume. From there, we generate the network and the surface after. So this is the resultant design that we came up with. Um, So as you can see in the section, the ground floor consists of a co-working space, uh, which climbs up onto the street level uh, where there's a coffee shop, and higher up you have dwelling units as well as a terraced garden. Mm -hmm. um, the plans are formed with intersections, again, of ellipsoids, which we found um, interesting and come right from our investigation of bubbles. And these are um, visualizations of the space. Thank you. So um, first show you our initial, oh, okay. the initial um, fabrication studies were with different materials. Um, and we tried to play around with softer materials too. We tried rubber as well just to see what comes of it. Um, we finally, as you see, decided on plastics. So these are the, the first few components that we created. And this was our first large scale model of the same. Um, and from this, we took on the idea of separating sticks and surfaces or trying to integrate them. And um, we went on to create um, these, these guys here. And we also did this one recently where we tried to fuse the process together so you have the surfaces and sticks in the same. Um, and then taking from this in our networks, we also have um, these porosity studies, which we were showing in uh, the presentation as well. So you can see the difference in the amount of light passing through, um, which makes for an interesting scheme when it comes to design. 
And here is the exploded model we showed. Again, um, you have the ellipsoids, the network, and the surfaces. Um, and then this is the site model, um, which is, I think, more interesting in section, because that's when you can really see the entire building. And this is the, the jig we made. Um, the other one we showed is a hypothetical proposal. Um, and these are the end effectors, and this is the, the robotically assembled model, and this is the large scale model here. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it, it's some, some really interesting work. It, it does almost feel like you're not making quite enough of the potential of it. Um, the production process that you've got from one source material that can then be used as an, uh, perhaps a transportable fabrication system, because if you've only got two robots doing the work, then you, you can put that into a van, you can take it somewhere. It produces component parts that then get effectively fabricated into units up to, I think you said about two meters size, which are very lightweight and very transportable and very uh, flexible because you can configure them on site, you can adjust them, you can create new things with them as you're going along. Uh, it feels like you could actually do more with the systems that you've got and it could be applied in uh, perhaps uh, other locations or if you are looking at a London townhouse as an example, then look at perhaps why this has benefits in, those, in that space. Uh, I mean, it could be very quick to install, it could be very uh, flexible in terms of arrangement, uh, and could be also very um, uh, efficient in terms of material usages. So I think you can expand on that a little bit more. Um, also, uh, with the systematic approach that you've developed, uh, there's some redundancy in the structural system, so you don't actually need to optimize it as much as you have done. You don't really need to push that arch form and that dome form as much as you uh, unless there's other drivers to do so. So uh, I think there's more flexibility and arrangements that can be explored as well, particularly with something like this, where you can configure it in uh, multiple different ways and make bespoke pieces very easily to make those more unusual geometries. So I think I'd encourage a bit more flexibility in, into uh, good work. Oh, and study the surfaces more and how you can stretch that and make those more efficient. But good work, thanks. I need to congratulate you because I think it's absolutely amazing work. So I think well done. Um, I like not only the potential, but also the aesthetic of it. Uh, I think there is some time. I mean, of course, the project is never finished, no? And so, I mean, I'm just going to point out what maybe doesn't work. We're still open to question. Um, I think everything we have here, I think, is amazing. Uh, you need just to be a bit careful when you go into the digital world, it doesn't, doesn't become everything always highly controlled as a curvature and uh, as, a, as well composition, etc. So I think you know that, I think you are aware of it. So I would say just make sure that this thing don't become overwhelming. Um, and also I think the inhabitation, again, is a bit of a shortcut. I think now the way we inhabit the space is very conventional. I think you can again question much more what does it mean to inhabit these type of spaces. Uh, but I think well done, because I feel it is really, really, really nice. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I was, uh, to build on the, the, first of all, the aesthetics of it, I mean, just getting, sitting near this stuff, it's just, it's, it's creeping me out, I'll tell you. It's, um, it's like being in a natural history museum, you know, the brontosaurus, you know, vertebrae and all that stuff, but it's so, even when you get right up close to it, I don't know what, there was another piece that was nearby, it looks like a hammerhead, yeah. I mean, you cannot identify that as something produced by industry, and I like that very much as an aesthetic. It's a kind of fiction that it's, that it's actually organic, but it's made out of metal filings and some kind of polymers, or I don't know what exactly it is, but... But I think that's an amazing, just in itself, that's amazing, um, that we would come full circle from saying, you know, the interest in the, in the biological world can't look biological, whatever, all the way back around to actually industry producing something that, that, that is a kind of fictional bi biological. I think it's, I don't know, it's really interesting. 
um, just on that level. Uh, now, I don't know, I, now I'm really intrigued by this diagram. I want to know, uh, I, I love that you guys put uh, Maison Domino next to your project. And I'm trying to unpack what it is that you're saying like Corbusier did and what it is that you guys are saying you are doing with this. And I think, I think it's somewhere, I, I, I don't know if it's in the final project because this seems like a different, a different idea. This seems like a, a hybrid space frame with a skin on top of it. It's, and by pulling them apart, it seems like you're working on almost a different thing. But over, over here and here, um, what I'm getting is that you guys are saying it's not going to be it's not going to be sticks, it's not and slabs, but it's always going to be something in between or sticks and surfaces. It's going to be something always in between sticks and surfaces, always hybrids, always mutants. So everything you make and in the end seems to have a kind of sticky like but surfacey like quality to it. Um, but then I don't see that really in that diagram. It looks like it's broken down into finite elements again. So the, there's just something in the in the in the um, in this in this uh, in the polarity between the two, the argument that you're almost making, that's not quite convincing me yet. So I, I just I want to know what it is if that's if that's about providing world war, housing after World War One, which it was. It's about providing um, uh, precast elements and concrete so it can be built quickly, and also providing a free facade. And it was a total innovation at the time. Then this is a total innovation because. I, no, I just, I, it's like I want to I wanna be able to say it easily and quickly like I can with the other one. And, and, and I would like actually you guys to say that, if you don't mind. We were identifying, like, things we have identified in the system are more like what we felt the domino had for that, in a way. Um, so the reason we were looking, we were more interested in having the building or taking sort of sense of the space with your entry than just looking at it. So that's why it's more about communicative porosity of buildings. I mean, that is something that is so, um, it's so, it's, it's, it's instinct for us to like see a very like, you know, a glass building and building. Right? But how, like, you know, if you're trying to create something where it can go from something very public to something very private. Um, but I think, like, for example, I understand what you're coming to, like, when you see, like, the horizontality of the diagram that um, is sort of, um, breaking away from what we have done well, it's, it's here. Clear, it's clear that you're making a distributed structure out of what was a vector column. I understand that. You're replacing that. You're leaving the slab idea basically intact, except the slabs themselves are also made like this human skull, right? You're, I understand that you're doing that, but what I don't understand is it seems like this is your biggest innovation are these mutant surface structure pieces, and they're not in that. So I don't know... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, these were more controlled and like they were done by hand. Like, over there, we were trying to go for something more because like the, the robotic arm is capable of producing way more components or many variations, uh, whereas we were limited yeah. to what we could do. So this was more of like a proof of concept to say, okay, we can do these things, but well, maybe. Just, 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 yeah, totally. Yeah. So just, maybe just like a couple it is. Of ideas. I mean, a couple of ideas would be that what I think the thing's really good at doing is making. Um, uh, structure and envelope, that's an obvious one because you've got skin and you've got these, these tougher edges. Um, it's really good at accumulating material um, in a in non-homogeneous way, unlike concrete. Um, it's good at um, maybe even making enclosure. So maybe you're mixing up the, the, the terms of the Maison Domino by adding enclosure. Oh, sorry. No, no, for you. Oh, sorry. I, I, <laughs> mixing up the terms of the Maison Domino by leaving an envelope off, but leaving vertical structure and, and slab and circulation in, like that was, a, that was a decision. Maybe you're bringing it back in. You're saying that enclosure has to be part of it, and that's the new domino. Yeah, no. I'm, just, I'm just throwing out, I, you know. Actually, that is something we thought of because now we're going back to a generation, I mean, where people want their privacy. It's not about um, open spaces that much because people always want their own space to be, you know, online or like their world is more networked now. So it's different. The world is oh yeah, and one last thing, sorry, I want to say, it's just dark, the darkness is just nice to see today. <laughs> I'm happy that I'm a little bit creeped out. And, and, yeah, I, it's nice. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, uh, actually, actually you won't, you won't. I have a couple of uh, um, 
comments. So uh, I start with uh, technical. Um, on a technical level, what is a bit uh, of a pity in a sense is that there is a, a, a real segregation of materials. So I mean the metallic powder does not remain really uh, uh, continuous in a sense. I mean it, it's just an accumulation of metallic uh, particles, uh, grains, in a sense, but they don't create a continuity. The continuity is created by the plastic, not by the metal itself. And on a structural level, it's, I mean, you had, you had a super heavy material, which is uh, eight tons per cubic meter, which is a metallic powder. Um, just for let's say, driving the deformation of uh, the non too heavy, but most of all, extremely weak material, which is, which is the plastic in this case. So in a sense, even if I absolutely don't see any obvious solution for that, but it would have been interesting to, to have the system the other way around. I mean, you attract the plastic in order to deform a continuous uh, metallic, uh, I mean, continuous metallic, Con yeah, continuous metallic components. You see, you see what I mean, because because ultimately at the end you, you, I don't know, but uh, I mean it, it might be for next year project, but because in a sense here you add the dead weight of something which is extremely heavy and which does not play any truly interesting role on a structural level. So this, I mean, this is my, my view on, 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 on it, uh, uh, on that level. Uh, the second thing, which is, uh, let's say, a bit more conceptual regarding the Maison Domino. Um, for sure, and I believe there's nothing to discuss about that, the Maison Domino is the most, uh, important conceptual level, uh, conceptual model that was ever invented in architecture. Maybe if you consider this apart from the um, Roman vault. <laughs> I mean, for me, there's two crazy uh, uh, invention. It's like Euclid, you know, and uh, 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 David Hilbert or something like that. In architecture, you have the Roman vault and uh, the Maison Domino. So um, this, for I mean, and, and this uh, invention by Le Corbusier, which is uh, at the same time conceptual and technical, but most of all conceptual, because because we knew perfectly how to make this kind of concrete slabs and columns much before Le Corbusier. I mean, uh, uh, Perret was capable of doing it. Uh, uh, Enbic also invented this kind of uh, structure. So it's mostly a conceptual invention rather than a purely technical invention. But the most important aspect in this conceptual invention is its amazing simplicity. And without this amazing simplicity, it would never have been a success, a worldwide success like, I mean, what you have presented. I mean, we use the domino system just like everywhere. Uh, and uh, now with uh, advanced concrete, we even use it for all skyscrapers, which was not, not the case before because we did it in, in steel uh, and we just used concrete to, to protect the steel from fire, but now that we have more advanced uh, uh, construction techniques in, in concrete, we, we skip the steel in a sense. So, and here you don't introduce simplicity, you introduce an amazing complexity, which is both architectural, which is very beautiful, by the way, but in terms of a system, I believe that this complexity makes it a very bad candidate for the replacement of the Maison Domino. <laughs> so this, this is my, my, my second comment. And the last one is that ultimately, and uh, it's a bit of a pity according to the 
beautiful uh, uh, richness of the of the system of, of, of its complexity because again this complexity might be interesting on another uh, level uh, it's a bit of a pity that you just built domes uh, that we that we see in, an, in in a very obvious manner in this in this model in a sense I think the final uh, morphology could have been much much richer in a sense much more uh, wild you know much more aggressive or whatever but but it, it's it's a bit of a pity that you go back to 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 this vault because this system according to me does not contain in an intrin intrinsic manner any pre predisposition or any uh, orientation toward towards a vault. It can be anything. <laughs> but before Patrick's comment, I remind it's it's a very nice project. <laughs> I mean I mean the challenges are, are spot on. And in terms of the weight of the material and I think to some extent the uh, a, a pure viscous deformation without the fibers could already give you a form-finding condition. I think what the, what the metal adds is this kind of grain of fiber texture nearly on it. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. So, so there's a challenge here. But, but then you can also turn around and say, maybe you want thermal mass. Maybe you want this to become a kind of a radiator, etc., which works together with the porosity. So I think at the moment we're in a world of exploration and where, where properties are for grass to be seen as disadvantages or advantages. Where I think I, I disagree with you is that this is incredibly complex. I mean, think that the form is complex, but it comes for free with respect to the self-forming of these materials. And there is a simplicity in that plastic mass and, uh, and, 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 and the mix and the various degrees of vari uh, uh, parameters you have of this and then that, that simple generic machine which is now doing everything, the robot pulling this and you don't have a particular mold and each particular unique shape is automatically formed. I think there's, there's inverted commas, simplicity of manufacturing, an intricacy and complexity which we need to now understand of being performative um, because what is great about this, let's say, yes, you would have to come in, what's the advantages? This should be lighter. This is also uh, has the advantage of porosity and transparency. It might have other advantages, as I said, a kind of uh, thermal storage and radiating capacity. So that's why we would, we, that's the good challenge about what you've been talking about. It. And yes, you, there is a lot of incoherence, and I think you should be more self-critical that some of these elements uh, don't migrate into uh, the model, don't migrate into the final renderings. And you are, uh, so there's a still, there's, there's lots of, there's gaps in, in this condition where you have a lot of triangulation in, this, in these final models and here they're all quad-like conditions. This component is interesting, it's very uh, uh, soft and in bending as a space frame component is highly prob problematic. That's why these, these webs are very important to, to stiffen these. And these webs are mostly, we discussed last time, it's too thin, they're, they're buckling and so on, and you have additional processes of reinforcement and so on. So I think there is, there is um, my criticism would be that you know what, Philip has been pointing out, that you know what I'm pointing out, you know all this, and I think it would be more honest, and you're very smart people and, and, and eloquent people, uh, don't cover the cracks and hide the gaps and let us slip across something seamless, which it isn't, I think it would be more honest to, to, to problematize the conditions the, where you've made a, the next move and where you haven't carried forward issues, I, I think. I think. still think, the, yeah. I still think it's, not, it's just not clear what the stakes are here. I, I, feel like I agree with what you're saying, Patrick, but like, I don't understand what, if, if we're saying that this is an innovative form of construction, I, I would say, what are we reinventing? Because we're always reinventing something. We're not just making something completely new. We're always, we reinvent the column, we reinvent the slab, we reinvent the high rise, we reinvent how we analyze structure, how we make structure. I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know what this is a reinvention of. 
I don't know what it is yet. I mean, I, I agree you're, what you're saying. Like, you get some sheer capability out of them webbing, and, and it could be kind of a space frame, but then it starts to have single points again, so it's not really a space frame. So it's not, it's not clear. Honestly, it's not, just, it's not clear what the stakes are. Is this, if you guys are doing research, um, what is the hypothesis, and what have we found out in terms of research? And I don't think that if we, even if we solved all the technical issues of the piece, and I actually lay them all out really well, I, I don't know if we understand the, the relevance and the significance of the work yet. Well, and I, want, I just want to know what it is. We, don't, we usually don't know um, all the advantages which would occur. We don't have, we have a formal sure. program yeah. and formal performance nearly process here, and that's why we are teasing out. You said something, the advantage of these surfaces can be create envelope. This becomes a space that is at the same time shading in various orientations. The same right. that I was talking about uh, uh, thermal performance and radiator capacity and so on. So this is yeah. something which you know, which 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 uh, we don't have uh, written out, uh, but we are alert and hunting because the process generates. We're talking about this uh, because it is a new and un 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 uncertain process. But what the thesis underlying all this is that basically that we now in a world where we have that adaptive variability at our hands and we're working with uh, tool sets, both algorithmic in terms of design and folding in fabrication logic, which have that inherent pliability of the of the digital. Uh, and, and that element of no, but, but uh, complexity yeah. without mold, so the, 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 the morphogenesis capacity of materials, etc., has in the discourse been for quite a while. I think we not know everything at the outset, and yeah. that would be not good research if yeah. you did. But I think you've got to be able to identify it at the end, and just yeah. translate it back into the conceptual model that he was talking about. And that, so yeah, but exactly, what, the, on the sure, level of sure. abstraction, this idea of variability of material computation, <clears throat> uh, the deal of structural uh, uh, logics being folded in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is these are generic, uh, general headlines which uh, we can tick as advantageous. With a lot of uh, the search space we, we, we're exploring has a lot of advantages or a lot of plus signs already added. Yeah, but I think that there's a window into that world through your first question, which, when you try to pose the diagram. If you treat them as conceptual diagrams, and you are asking, well, what is that? If it's at the same terms, if, if it really is about the terms of reference between the Maison Domino, which Philippe is a, an admirer of, and that's great, and we qualify success by its deployability and its easiness and its accessibility, then yes, we fail. But if it is to the quality of actually the things that you were bringing up, which is actually looking at production processes and bringing this almost like digital craft and this kind of alien-like formations and all of the features that have such high resolution locally and then actually in its capacity to accumulate. The model at the end of the table for me is one of the standout models for me personally in, in the year. And part of it is because it, it really isn't a point in a line system that's being described digitally. And I think that if there is a failure, there's a failure for me in the way that it's being represented and discussed. Because when Patrick speaks about the webbing, also the qualification of webbing is not necessarily surface, it's surface strand or articulation to a degree which is actually quite unique. If it's performative in the same criteria as a space frame, I think it's, it's the wrong question to ask at this stage because I think it's not there yet. The qualification, if we actually do have to exploit CORB in the point that this is a universal system to go up multi-stories and so forth, I also think it's a challenge that maybe is not yet able to be addressed. So the question is, what can it do on one level? And then we can sort of talk about it because I think the final proposal is normalized to such a degree where it becomes, it's not that creepy and it's not that bat wing dinosaur historical stuff at the nature museum. You know, it loses the ability to do that because it actually rationalizes everything to such a degree where that pliancy, that soft body nature, if that surface starts to get larger, if it starts to cantilever, it's not that fixed and finite world anymore. It becomes a soft system and it becomes something that I think also then has curious features to it. Now, I think the terms that we try to engage it, I think is really important because I, I agree with Tom's research design research kind of mandate, but I don't think because we started with a domino house 
I mean, Corb's dead. And to be honest with you, it's good that he's dead. <laughs> and we should also look at that diagram and sort of state it as, yes, it was successful, <laughs> but it was also successful for actually putting a lot of shit in the world. Because it was so easy and because it was so deployable, it was also so uncritically managed where it becomes a problem or at least I'm going to state that this project kind of inverts it completely because it starts from something that actually has no explicit state. It's not even an aggregate, per se. And so the question of what the stakes is, of what we're actually looking at, is kind of interesting because it actually puts us in a little bit of a crisis, right? Are we really looking at a surface? Is that a representational model that's scaled one-to-one? -one? The iron aspect of everything says that everything that's being done here is one-to-one. -one. But I actually really like, even early on, the concrete stuff, the plastic stuff. If you see it as a range of a process, potentially if it is hybrid like this, maybe we could achieve a model process consistent but actually deployed in materially varied, differentiated ways. Maybe that's the only way we get the performance criteria. Otherwise, of course, we're going to we'll suffer for the complexity for free but actually we're achieving potentially, or they're achieving, I'm not achieving anything. Um, I think really interesting things, because they're so curious that you want to know more, but the discovery actually questions, what am I really looking at? And I think that that's a nice place to be once in a while. I think what, like, what Theo and Tom uh, pointed out, like, are uh, like particularly interesting uh, avenues to look at, like, by contrasting the diagram, uh, like at least attempting to replace it and revise it for contemporary living conditions and contemporary technologies. I think it's a, a valiant effort to, to attempt. Uh, and I agree that like some of these things should have been in the, in the diagram uh, or should have at least been um, kind of conceptually incorporated. Uh, but what, one thing I don't agree is that it needs to be simple to replicate uh, the success because um, what needs to be simple is like computationally simple, which it is. And, and, and the fact that any revision of the diagram should include some machinic aspects, it's not only human readable diagram, right? Like, and then it, so it, to that extent, I think like there is some things to incorporate from the invention of the machine and how that has been translated into the diagram in like those uh, pu pulling, uh, how to revisit uh, the entire house by a set of pulling points and like, uh, so that to me is like one aspect of the diagram. It's not the entire, uh, re 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 revision um, and also like I agree with the the, the kind of normalized aspect, but that was necessary in my view to to try and attempt it uh, with the known diagram so that we can tackle the housing aspects like against the yeah. so we we can't like simultaneously change attempt like uh, both uh, habitat and and also some uh, formal aspects which like. But I think the process, I don't think, needs to be questioned because it opens up, I think, more interesting and informed questions. I think what you have to potentially consider at this stage, I think after three years of exploring this, is is the conversation at the end of this day about these two diagrams or did something else emerge? It started from there, but maybe there is a discovery at the moment which is potentially more important. And maybe actually this is a sign of the times because I'm... I'm concerned, actually, when it goes multi-story so quickly and it's trying to achieve all these things. I think it's a great initial push because it opens up some problems and questions, but I think when you put this document together, how you do that, I think, could really actually just open up the next three or five years worth of work, which I would say is important to do. I don't think that's by optimizing this to a way where it actually becomes that diagram. I, it could be something radically different just to allow that possibility because I think the work is great and I think it's a good way to end the day which is that it isn't a resolved project. It has a lot of intrigue in one sense and a lot of like serious confrontation with, with itself which actually is, remains unresolved.
whichever way you want to look at it, that there's some direct engagement with the formation of something going on that's incredibly exciting. And Frodo is probably one of the few people I can think of, uh, plus anyone working on to any kind of tensile structure, where you get that formation at building scale. But almost always it's happening at a kind of much smaller scale. So uh, I would love to see the qualities and effects we get in the small part in the whole building. Uh, and I think... Uh, going to the multi-story building has been a, a difficult transition because, you know, like the strangest thing here is the floors or the fact that, you know, the kind of vaults are always at the scale of a single floor. Um, whereas actually all the interesting things in the material formation is about kind of blurred boundaries, thresholds, uh, in kind of embedment of the two materials and, ver and continuous variation of thickness and kind of anomalies like holes as well. So it's, I, I think for me, the project probably always should try to avoid being an assemblage. I would find, see if there was a way to scale up, like even if it had to be incrementally formed, kind of like protruded or something, if there was some way to actually engage with it at a larger scale. And I think that's a difficult problem, but it's touching on something that I don't think anyone's cracked yet. Like it's a, it's an interesting problem. Can you actually have a, something dynamically formed in production that is not a tensile structure, in a sense? But, like, with, with this, in, this little machine that is here, like, I think the assemblage aspect perhaps can benefit because it's a simple printer, kind of, like, for, specifically made for this. So you, like, I don't know, like if it was in the uh, videos, like you can have a bank of these as opposed to, and one robot like that, that can produce all the components and the assembly bits um, are only like, you know, just assembling. Um, so it can be parallelized. So that's something that like, I think uh, is another advantage to, to having spent time inventing this machine. Like, so, so 
I, I agree with like the uh, your comment about like the Frey Otto's aspect that it, it uh, perhaps like it is a good if we have to revise a hundred year old diagram pro we could at least like look at Frey Otto as a as a as a role model to to replace it with and I, I think that that might be something very credible to to look, um, think of in in the in the book. To when you formulate your thoughts uh, on, on the diagram aspect of, of the project. He's not up for substitution, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> He's full on with, I mean, we are for our time. <laughs> I think that, I mean, one of the aspects that was in a way left was he lives. The, the, transitions, He's not dead. <laughs> the transitions between the linear condition and the superficial condition are, uh, it's a place where not enough research has been done. And in a way, uh, we, we skip over that as a matter of expression, but actually I wonder how uh, that transition could be explored more in depth, basically by controlling density of the metal components or size of the metal components versus force of the magnets uh, or proximity of the magnets. If you, if you could kind of refine that experimentation uh, realm, uh, you could get to a place in which that transition is managed in a much more uh, fine way to the point in which then one can talk about really the relationship between surface and structure or, or, or envelope and structure in a much more continuous level. Uh, and because we, the work in a, way, um, in a way presents that but doesn't explore that space. And because of that, um, I think that it misses the, the, the possibility of actually, I think that's one of the m main challenges to the domino system, which is what you are actually splitting, you know, the, the, the slab surfaces versus the columns. Um, here what you are doing is you, you are introducing the continuity literally between the two. And, and I think that that's a, an area that I wonder more about. Um, I think one of the one of the really compelling qualities of the project is the um, uh, you know clearly that your your idea about architectural matter is the same as architectural space that both are going to be deeply cellular in some way right and in, and that's I guess what probably gives the quality its most striking contrast to the model a century ago in which space is undifferentiated open neutral. And things we think of like structure are simple elements to be arranged to hold that space. I think the, the thing about cellular structures is that they always, they, they always demand then forms of expertise around sequencing. Cells have to be arranged. They have to aggregate. It, it all can't happen at the same time. I don't know if these start at the floor and work up or if your robots will start at the ground and slowly end up on the third floor assembling the pieces. Looking at this skill in, in the results you've gotten to, I think there's probably a great deal more knowledge and expertise about the kinds of sequences that this sort of a system sets up that you might want to tease out a bit as you try and come to a conclusion at this stage. I think even, even how we would occupy and use the space because of this highly cellular interior, the, the life within it will be far more sequential than the sorts of multi-user parallel lives that we all know of in the sort of model that was in the previous project we were looking at in the room, right, where everything is sort of happening simultaneously. What's interesting here is, of course, a sort of 200-year-old model of Georgian-like interiors in which space is, is a series of quite highly subdivided, separated universes. And, of course, it's the very same model you use to talk about what structure itself is going to be. And I would find some way to start to really develop a language about that. Um, you know, in the, in the sort of Wolfram, the mathematics of complexity that emerge out of very simple cellular experiments, of course, there's only some sequences that start to develop the kind of complexity that he says become models for how we can organize our understanding of material itself. And I would just really try and nail that down a bit. I think it's, you can also probably challenge some of the ideas of sequencing and organizing that exist. I think you, your your assumption in the first set of these beautiful sort of bone models that the only way the elements sit together is at the very edges, the, the sort of four edges of each element touch, and you heat it up with a hair dryer and they magically fuse together. I mean, 
you've also got the possibility with those elements that they just stack a bit like uh, Pringles potato chips, you know, where they kind of, if they lay face to face, you end up with an element that's far more of a compression structure than the sort of tension model that Thea was talking about down at the end of the room. And I think, again, that would just be a different kind of sequencing of how those elements go together, but it's all there in the complexity of the system. Thanks, everybody.